Good morning, everyone. Time to take a seat, end those great conversations you're having, and let's get going. best educated production assistant in the in the room that's Brewster Kale the founder of the Internet Archive <laughs> attention to detail gotta love that welcome everyone to the very first decentralized web summit right here at the Internet Archive we are so excited to have all of you in the house welcome this has been a day that we have been dreaming about for quite a while my name is Wendy Hanamura, and I am going to be your guide through this day. I'm the Director of Partnerships of the Internet Archive, and the first thing I want to do is just kind of give a shout out to all of our friends who are watching the live stream. If you want to send this out, you can use the hashtag DWebSummit. We're live streaming this all over the world, and we're hearing through our Slack channel. All sorts of people are tuning in. Your social media is also streaming live on that live stream. A, a constant feed of your comments, your thoughts, your pictures. So please, keep it up. And for the people who are in this room, just a little housekeeping. We have great Wi-Fi in this place. No password, of course. That's thanks to Ralph, our engineer. You can use the Internet Archive Wi-Fi. Please don't use personal hotspots. We want to save that bandwidth for all the live demos. And you probably all have four or five personal devices that need to be charged at any one time. There are charging stations on the side. Oh. <laughs> but first, you're probably, how many people have never been to the Internet Archive before? Oh, wow. Well, welcome, welcome. You're probably wondering what this is. We think of it as our temple to knowledge. The Internet Archive is one of the largest digital libraries in the world. We have 26 petabytes of books, movies, films, that's movies, videos, software, so much that I can't even count. And you know, I think we have to ask ourselves, what does a library in 2016 really look like? Well. Today, it looks like this, where the books, the music, the films are all right there. Take a look. Can you guys in the video camera show them? Those back there are supercomputers. And as Brewster likes to say, what he loves about these is that every time a light goes on and off, it means that somebody on the planet is either uploading or downloading something from the Internet Archive. Each one of those stacks holds about two and a half petabytes of information. Now, I just want to give you a kind of a sense of scale. The largest library in this country is the Library of Congress. Is that right, David? Millions upon millions of books. If you took all the books and digitized them and made them available in many, many different formats and put them on our supercomputers, it would take about an inch and a half of one of those computers. That's the Library of Congress. That's the scale of information. 20 years ago, the guy you saw just turn on the lights, Brewster Kale, had this vision, a dream really, to provide universal access to all knowledge. He said, you know what? This internet that Vint has created, the great promise of the internet and the web, 
that Sir Tim Berners-Lee created, the great promise of that is access to information, the knowledge of our age. That's what this place is about. You're sitting in a place dedicated to the open sharing of information, knowledge, culture. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to work here. And we want to invite you into this house every day to read, to watch, to listen, to learn, all for free, forever. That's what you find when you go to archive.org. Why the decentralized web? You're probably asking that, right? What do you librarians at the Internet Archive have to do with the decentralized web? Well, it all dates back to this moment. Here you see Mitchell Baker of Mozilla, Brewster Kale of Internet Archive, and Sir Tim Berners-Lee meeting in New York. It was a gathering of five of the largest foundations in the world. MacArthur, Open Society, Knight, Mozilla, and Ford. And it was at the Ford Foundation. And all these powerful philanthropies said, what if we all came together and pooled our resources? What would the internet challenges be for this group? What would, they called it their moonshot challenge. For those of you not born in the 60s, the moonshot that I think of is when President Kennedy in 1962 said, we are going to take a man or woman to the moon and back. And suddenly, all sorts of experts, fuel experts, food experts, biologists, rocket scientists had to come together and do something tangible. Well, they asked my boss, Brewster, to give this little talk about the moonshot challenge of our age. And I'm pretty sure they thought that he was going to talk about building the next library of Alexandria. But Brewster is always a trickster. And he came up with this other talk. And he said, no, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about locking the web open for good. Locking the web open for good. Because the web is becoming less and less open over these last 20 years. And Brewster said, I think there's something that's being built right now in little bits and pieces all over the globe that we could pull together to create a decentralized web, a web that would be beyond the control of any central entity, a web that would have a time access, a web that was immune to privacy invasions, that was secure, censorship free. And he kind of painted this picture in his talk. Well, but this moment happened thanks to Mayor Bill de Blasio, because Bill de Blasio is famously late to every function, right? And he was supposed to open this moonshot challenge event, but he was 45 minutes late. And so we were all just sitting around, sitting around. And then Tim and Brewster and, Mose and um, Mitchell came together, and they started to debate heatedly what this decentralized web thing could be. It was kind of magical. And from that moment of heated discussion, discovery, iteration, there's a direct line to you sitting in these chairs today. Many of you are the great builders of the next decentralized web. You're the people who are thinking about how to govern this, how to describe this, how to make it a just and fair web how to bake our values into the code. That is a big goal, and it is a long journey, but we want to start taking that journey today with you and with all of you all over the world who are watching this. I could not be more pleased to be introducing to you this woman, Mitchell Baker, the chairwoman of Mozilla. For 20 years, Mozilla has had, I think they've held this vision of what our web could be, what our web could be, what distributed communities all over the globe could accomplish together if they were connected, open, and free. They were among the many who helped to make open mainstream. Joey Ito, Ito over at MIT, I hope he's watching, likes to talk about the conspiracy of open. Mozilla, EFF, Internet Archive, Wikimedia, 
we're all charter members of the conspiracy of open because we believe that this web belongs to everybody and we have to keep it that way. So it is so appropriate that the sponsor of this event, the sponsor of the original Moonshot Talk would be Mozilla, now thinking about their role in creating the next decentralized web. Please welcome the chairwoman of Mozilla, Mitchell Baker. Thanks, Wendy. So today we have two concepts, decentralized and the web. And many, if not all of us, are involved in the decentralized thinking and explorations that we'll spend today and tomorrow looking at. And so to open, I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about the web. So what actually is the web? And as we build the decentralized web, what are some of the principles we want to think about? And coming from Mozilla, you might think, what? can you go back to the first one, please? Uh, coming from Mozilla, you might think, oh, the web is about a browser, but no, certainly not. You might think from this group that the web is about the protocol, it's about HTTP. But Tim has said clearly, you know, HTTP is not set in stone, it's changing too. So the web, even to those of us who've been involved in building the first version of it, is not about a particular technology or the way we accessed it before. The web is actually something much broader, much more important. And so at Mozilla, we've been working on distilling those traits into a handful. We have four of them. That's our work in progress to date. I'm going to share the high-level four traits here. I'll put a URL in the Slack channel, and we'll find a public spot for it as well, which has these four in the next level of detail. Please feel free to join in. We'd like to have a shared consensus of what the web is. So as we build decentralized web, or will we have a IoT or a web of things, what are the traits that we care about? And as we're building the decentralized web, what are the key things we're bringing forward from the last 15 or 20 years? So one, the web is immediate. You can access content immediately, and it's safe meaning there is a safety model so that you as an individual are not constantly making trust decisions. That's a system that would never succeed because most of us aren't equipped to make the kind of constant trust decisions about content. And it's accessible via a URL, that the content itself can be accessed without intermediate structures. So trait one, trait two, it's open. Anyone can publish content without permission. You plug in, <laughs> you need to connect to the network, and that should be it. And the publisher of content should set the terms on which that content is available. It might be public, maybe there's access control, but it is the publisher that determines that, not some third party. And the relationship is between a publisher and the individual end user. That is how we get access to all the world's information for all of us. So there is one relationship that matters, and that's between the human being and the publisher of the content. Right. Our third suggested principle, the web is universal, that the content and access to the content is separate from your device or your system or however it is that you choose to access it. That, of course, we have done traditionally through standards. And the W3C has a social web working group related to decentralizing the web. As you might expect, you know, Mozilla is pretty active in that. And that principle that content and your device should be completely unrelated is something we'd like to see carried forward. And finally, agency. One trait about the web and the way the client to the web, the browser, is different from many other systems, is there is something in the system capable of representing you, so that you can moderate your experience. And the relationship between the content provider and the individual human being is not 
the content provider has 100% of the power and you as the human being have zero. It is that there is technology and policy which helps you mediate that experience. That's everything as simple as changing the font size, being able to change the color of links. You know, these are very old things, all the way up to the browser protecting you from malware, to the tracking protection and do not track that you would find as well. These are all ways in which the user or the software representing the user can exert our influence on the content we see. And for us, this is why we build Firefox. I mean, we have a long browser history and there's plenty of people who love browsers, but a browser could go away and this concept must remain in the system somewhere. And so, as we think about the decentralized web, that question of what are the traits that are really key, I hope this is useful and that as we build the decentralized web, these key traits show up in the technologies and the policies and the software and the data access and the content that we built. Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. Oops. Next, I get to bring up the man who's most often called the father of the internet. He was one of the creators of the internet that has changed our lives today. He now works for Google. I think many, many of us work for Google. Uh, he's the vice president and chief internet evangelist at Google. But for the last two or three years, Vint Cerf has been talking about something called the digital dark age the digital dark age. It's, I think he will tell you about that, but in essence, the fact that much of what we think is permanent on the web isn't really permanent. It goes away, it blinks on and off. In fact, we built something called the Wayback Machine, 479 billion web captures to give the web a memory. But quite frankly, that's just a patch, right? It's just a patch on the fact that websites go away, links die, things rot on the internet. But I asked Vint this morning, well, you know, Vint, you've done so many things in your career. Why now? Why now are you talking about this digital dark age? And he said, and I'm going to show you the movement. He said, Wendy, we all die. Me, sooner than most. And he said, when I die, I want to know that there is a permanent record of what I did, how I walked on this earth. That's why he is dedicating all his passion, his intelligence, his, his power uh, to focus us on this big issue. He's here to talk about a web that archives itself. Please welcome Vint Cerf. Thank you very much, Wendy. I have to say, when people clap before you said anything, I think I should just sit down because it won't get any better than that. Uh, there's nothing more satisfying than being the chief internet evangelist in this room. <laughs> May all of your packets land in the right bit bucket. <laughs> know, minus, now I think I'm appropriately attired for this too. Let me start out by saying that what you're about to hear and see is stream of consciousness generated at about four o'clock this morning. So it may be worth not much. I will not take any offense if someone jumps up and says, this is stupid, I have a better way to do it, or you don't know what you're talking about. When you get to be my age, you recognize that sometimes you actually don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but let me, and by the way, when it comes to q and A, I'm only taking questions from the far uh, left and the far right. <laughs> just in case you want to move over there. All right, so let's, let's start out. I, I was asked to at least opine on uh, lessons learned from the internet. And so here you see a few. One of them is that collaboration and cooperation were enormously essential to the evolution of the net. People worked together towards a common goal. And I think that even if the vision was not necessarily always 
precise and, and shared, we all had this general sense of get everything to talk to everything else, uh, get all the networks to interconnect, or at least be possible to interconnect was important. The openness of the design process and the evolution of the protocols that make up the internet also contributed enormously uh, to its success and continue to do so today. The open standards of the internet continue to evolve as they, as they should and they must. Anyone can join. We said if you can figure out how to build a system that does this and find somebody to connect to, in theory it should work, it should interoperate because of the common protocols. Most of the time that's been true. We also didn't impose any business models on anybody. You could run a nonprofit piece of the internet, you could run a for-profit part, it could be government, it could be just something running in your home, you know, a little Wi-Fi local area network. We didn't care what the business models were. Uh, we didn't want the network to impose them uh, so that uh, any number of different parties could participate. We looked for modularity. We tried to hide things where it wasn't necessary for other parts of the system to know, which allowed us to sweep new transmission technology underneath the internet protocol layer without the protocol layer knowing anything about how the packets were carried. And many of you heard me uh, say that it's like internet postcards. They don't know how they're being carried and they don't know what was written on them. So the internet packets don't know what the bits are that they're carrying, what they mean, they just move them from one place to another. It's the software at the edges of the net that interpret the meaning of those electronic postcards and that allows us to invent all kinds of new applications without changing the underlying network. And finally, I think e pluribus unum is exactly what's happened. We collected many, many different networks and made out of them one thing. <coughs> now, here, here's where we get to the thinking out loud part. I'm actually thinking <coughs> about archiving and recognizing that there are little bits and pieces of it. One thing we often do is to build compression schemes in order to uh, use as little space as possible in order to remember something. Then there, you know, there's tarball and other kinds of, of related formats. But this usually only applies to storing a particular object, compressing it, putting it away in a particular format for later retrieval. Um, but think for a minute about what we do with software. In a really good environment, uh, we have versioning capabilities and they're uh, automated so that they help you. They, are, they enable you to keep track of various instances of things. There are some document structures that do that as well. They keep track of changes that have been made and you can dial them back and forth in order to see how the document evolved, maybe even who made changes to it. This is starting to get to uh, what Wendy mentioned earlier about the Wayback Machine and the idea that there is uh, a, a space of time in which objects uh, exist and they change during that time or they may change and we should hang on to that. But if you look at the World Wide Web, it's a really complex reference structure. If you look at a web page, it has pointers all over everywhere. Pages are pointing to each other and figuring out how to archive that is very, very different from the kinds of tarball compression schemes for one single digital object. So what happens here at this wonderful institution is that snapshots are taken of uh, web pages. And what's interesting is that uh, there's a lot of metadata that's associated with it. So we can actually do things like when did this page exist? If we wanted to go back in time, can we see when those page, what those pages looked like at a certain point in time? And I'm sure there's a lot more to, to this uh, uh, than I can even articulate, but it's clear that a lot of metadata had to be collected. The hyperlinks themselves have to be reformed. Everybody understands that because the uh, domain names that made up the URL, that were part of the URLs, may not resolve in five years' time or even tomorrow. And so in order to archive this material and make it still work as a web, you have to reformulate those uh, references and point to things that are within the scope of the archive. And that's a fairly heavy, uh, heavy duty process. It's a self-contained system with all those storage devices in the back of the room. It requires continuous crawling through the web and making copies of it. Uh, and then there's a question, uh, if you're really serious about keeping track of different instances of web pages, then when do you decide that this is different? And so there isn't, I don't know what Brewster's model is for that, maybe we'll learn more about that today, but figuring out when that happens is important, otherwise you can, might be continuously making 
uh, sample copies that aren't necessary. RSS is an example of something alerting you to things have changed and maybe you should pay attention to that. Uh, and, and then I started thinking about uh, a system which is accumulating web pages and copies of web pages that have changed. And then I started remembering the, you know, the set of all sets and I wondered does the set of all sets contain itself? And I don't remember what the answer is to that. <laughs> I think I don't even want to know what the answer is and it might even be one of those unanswerable questions. <coughs> So it, it, we've already, we have a problem here. The web can barely contain itself as it is, right? Because it's just all this stuff that we keep creating, 500 hours of video uploaded per minute into YouTube, et cetera. So I'm kind of worried about the locks idea because I'm not even sure that the existing storage that holds the existing World Wide Web has enough room in it to replicate pieces of the World Wide Web in order to uh, uh, save parts of it from being lost because part of the memory has disappeared. Uh, so I, you know, th these are potential environmental constraints as we start thinking about how a self-archiving system would work. The hyperlinks deteriorate, we all know about that. Bob Kahn has this digital object uh, architecture, digital object identifier scheme and one of the good things about it is that once you uh, obtain an identifier, it's intended that it not ever change. It's not, it, it's not subject to the kinds of uh, problems we have with the domain name system where if you don't pay your rent at the end of the year, the domain name might go away completely, in which case the URL is no longer resolved, or maybe it gets acquired by somebody else and the URL resolves to something that you didn't intend it to resolve to. Uh, those are all infirmities in the design. Uh, or in the, I would say, in the current operating environment. Uh, the other thing which is interesting has to do with backward compatibility. Uh, we've done pretty well, I think, in the World Wide Web environment, getting uh, the, even the earliest HTML to still be interpretable by browsers. I mean, when we use Brewster's Wayback Machine, I'm pretty astonished at how well the system renders the crappy graphics of 20 years ago. Uh, so. So, but we should be conscious of the hazards of uh, backward compatibility or lack of backward compatibility. So to give you a concrete example, yesterday uh, I was uh, preparing a talk uh, at Google and I sent uh, my uh, slides, which I had originally composed in PowerPoint, and then uploaded into the Google Doc system over to the people who were preparing uh, the presentation. And I got a note back saying one of the slides was blank. And so I went to look to see what the problem was. And it turned out that the uh, PowerPoint had correctly rendered TIFF, but Google Docs didn't know what TIFF was. And so it left a big blank there. And so I had to go and translate TIFF into JPEG and then reformulate that particular page. This is not the first time stuff like that has happened and maybe you've experienced it too. I have another example. Um, I don't mean to be picking on Microsoft. It just happens that these are examples that come readily to mind. Uh, <laughs> I have some 1997 PowerPoint slides which I prepared in, in the relatively early days of the dot boom period. And I pulled one of them up the other day in my current, whatever it was, I think it was Microsoft uh, Office 2011 or something. And uh, I pull up this 1997 PowerPoint file and it says, what's that? It looks corrupted, uh, which reinforces my belief that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, it, what this, this backward compatibility issue I think is actually quite a serious one, especially if you are thinking about archiving things and preserving them over really long periods of time, decades to centuries. And so it's a huge issue. And then there's all these kinds of permissions that are associated with the things that the web points to, whether it's another web page or an object that the web page lets you retrieve. There may be uh, those permissions and accesses are going to change over time. Copyright is supposed to expire at some point, although there are some copyright folks who don't believe that. Uh, so those are some of the kinds of stream of consciousness thoughts. So one thing which I like very much is the idea that when we're creating web pages that somehow they get automatically uh, replicated and archived. And the question is when to do that and I certainly would not want every instance of my page every time I make an edit or a change to get archived. But at the point where I'm interested in publishing it, 
that sounds like a reasonable cut point where I'm saying I want this to be seen by others. Maybe that's the point at which this archiving process and this replication process takes place. One of the interesting things that we do at Google is to allow multiple parties to share in the editing of all kinds of documents. It's dynamic, it's very distributed, we make multiple copies, and yet we allow people to make changes in real time and we propagate that to all of the copies. So there may be some machinery uh, in that which could be applied to a self-replicating distributed uh, web archive. Another thing which is really important uh, is that the reference space, the, the, the ability to point to something, has to be held somehow in common. Now, we all hold the URL scheme in common through the domain name system, but I've already alluded to the fact that the domain name system has weaknesses associated with it, including the loss of resolution of domain names. So we may have to think a, a bit more about that. We do uh, a lot of sharding of content scattered across our data centers. We replicate things across data centers and yet we can reference them using the same fairly messy looking alphabet soup strings that allow us to uh, uh, find things uh, precisely. So there's more thinking out loud. Uh, you, we, I think many of you have probably uh, spent time on PubSub, pub, you know, publish and sub subscribe mechanisms. It feels to me, in, just intuitively, that there's something appealing about that. The idea that I take an action to publish something into this self-archiving environment and others who participate in it are subscribed to that. And you can imagine for a moment that not everybody has to subscribe to everything, so you could opt in as an archiving element uh, for some content and maybe not for others. So as I say, this is stream of consciousness just thinking kind of out loud about mechanisms that we could use that have flexibility in them, that let people choose what they want to commit to and what they uh, don't want to do. Uh, now, uh, again, metadata uh, is a term that gets used all the time, and it's really important here, because understanding something about where did something come from, what does it have, are there permissions associated with access and use, who owns it or who has authority over it, all of that metadata, I think, is part of this picture. Now, Mitchell, uh, with her lovely uh, four desiderata, uh, implied a kind of openness which didn't have any constraints at all. Uh, I, will, I have to say that uh, we probably will not succeed in creating an environment where nothing is, uh, is ever protected or there are no constraints on anything. I could accept the idea that people will generate content which they declare to have those properties. But I can also easily imagine parties who will say, I do not wish to make them freely uh, open. I want access control. I want control over replication or distribution. And I think that's OK. I think we ought to be able to do this distributed archive idea uh, in a big tent sense, allowing all of those various cases to be catered for in the same way that the business models of the internet were wide open and not constraining. Um, the other thing which uh, is relevant is whether we can render the objects that are pointed to in this, um, in this distributed web. Um, and we're back to the leaves of the tree. If this is a spreadsheet or if it's an AVI movie file or, or an MP4 or something else, software is needed to correctly interpret and render or permit you to interact with these digital objects. We're going to need a library full of that stuff. And we're going to figure, have to figure out ways in which to populate the library so that we don't run into barriers for the use of that software. Because 50 years from now, uh, we may have software that no longer runs on the operating systems of the day or the hardware of the day. We're going to need to have the ability to run that old software, which means that we may need to uh, end up uh, emulating old hardware and running old operating systems. There's a project at Carnegie Mellon called Olive, like the thing you stick in your uh, martini, that's run by uh, a man named Brewster, uh, Brewster Kale, right. No, it's run by a man named Mahadev Satya Narayanan. Brewster Kale is easier to say, but it's, it, we call him Satya because, for obvious reason. Uh, Satya has invented a scheme for emulating old hardware in the cloud. 
He's demonstrated this with some fairly old, you know, PC type things. He's run uh, DOS 3.1. He showed uh, examples of old applications running on those operating systems in the cloud environment so that you can take old objects that have been created and uh, essentially re-render them. Many of these things are not static either. They're interactive spreadsheets and things like that. So it's actually going to be really important to figure out how do we uh, find a way to get permission to use that software over a period of time. Companies will go out of business. Companies will go bankrupt. Uh, some, uh, the bankruptcy judge will say, I'm sorry, you can't have the source code because it's an asset and, uh, and I need to sell it to somebody else. And you're saying, but I invested my entire life building all these books and objects and other things and I need to have access to that, and they'll say, how many billions of dollars are you willing to pay for that? We have to make sure that people don't end up investing huge amounts of their creative energy to have it taken away because of some business process or some technical failure in our ability to render old stuff. Uh, guaranteeing backward compatibility is largely impossible. A good goal, something we should look towards, but over a period of decades to hundreds of years, uh, I think it's unlikely, so we may still have to find a way to run the old stuff. Um, let's see, what did I mean by this? This is what happens when you do this at 4 o'clock in the morning. Oh, I see, okay. So imagine uh, that we are on a page and there's a hyperlink and it's not a URL, it's this new whatever it is thing which is, uh, which is not subject to uh, degradation. The question is, no matter um, which, let's see, if, I'm, if I am activating this path to get to that destination, it shouldn't matter where I end up. Wherever I end up should be an instance of the thing I'm looking for. Uh, and so rather than resolving to a particular IP address, it's got to be resolved to a collection of destinations, however those are uh, expressed. And so it shouldn't matter in the archive which instance I get as long as they're all the same. So part of the property of this is clicking on a link should get you to an instance of the thing that you are looking for regardless of where it actually ended up. That turns out to be important, but it's also complicated because if we start moving things around and making copies of things, how do we make sure that during the resolution process we have learned where we can point to successfully to resolve that link uh, to the destination? Uh, so. In the case of uh, newspapers and magazines, we already have this idea of editions. And the notion of edition is sort of evaporating a bit in the web environment because basically you publish whenever it's ready to go, which is one of the attractions. You don't have to wait until the print engine prints a copy of the newspaper in order to physically deliver it somewhere. But at the same time, it gives a certain amount of uh, meaning to the notion of edition. We may have to reinvent these notions uh, in order to make more coherent the collection of things that are archived so we know what instance it is of an object we're looking at. And so I don't quite know at what rate we should be snapshotting this self-archiving web, but as I say, it could be that the action of publishing is the clue that tells us that we should archive that instance. So here we are, automatic archiving on publication. Is this a service that you sign up for? And if it is, who pays for it? So what's the business model for that? Do I have to register all the rendering engines or do I want to register them so they can be found in the event that I'm looking at something that's 20, 30, 40, 50, or 100 years old? Uh, should I, in the course of doing this archiving, um, Mitchell's uh, desirable properties felt really wide open and it felt like they also included possibility of malware being uh, put away as well. And I wonder whether maybe we should be trying to filter that out. Maybe we won't even be able to recognize something as malware, in which case uh, it's again viewer beware, but I don't know whether that should be part of the service or not. Mitchell mentioned safe. And so, you know, I have this feeling of tension between it's safe to use this thing and, oh, by the way, I didn't put any constraints on what you could put away and therefore it might be malware when you look. Uh, and by the way, oh, Mitchell, where's Mitchell? Uh, wave your hand. There you are. Okay. Uh, this is not a criticism of your desiderata. This is me exploring their implications. Thank you.
I got a thumbs up as opposed to a, uh, I think. Uh, so, so this idea of, of how can we make this a safe environment for people to use is still an open question. Uh, and then there's this question about how much fidelity are we likely to be able to retain as we explore the archive, uh, particularly to use uh, Brewster's Wayback Machine uh, as a metaphor. As we go back in time, we may be able to render the surface view of a page because we took a snapshot, but it isn't clear that the links will necessarily all resolve or that if I clicked on something that turned out to be uh, in theory, would have activated a streaming video, but I don't have the software correctly uh, configured to render it, then I, I may not get 100% fidelity of the uh, archived objects. And so there's a question about uh, how far we can go and how we even say, you know, what vocabulary do we use in order to say this is high fidelity and this is not. Uh, this was, uh, I was unable to render this because I didn't have the appropriate software or I wasn't un unable to render it because the rights to get access to this particular object had expired or maybe never existed. So these are all, you know, questions that we should be wrestling with, I think. So uh, here's an interesting question. If we archive something, is it possible that that uh, process can be of such fidelity that we can point to it later and say this existed and its integrity is high. In other words, digitally signing a page so that we can say it existed then, this is a picture of a contract, this is a picture of a functional capability in case somebody is making an argument that this was invented before or after some patent. It's an interesting question whether we should impose on the archiving system this level of requirement. But from my point of view, it's very attractive because if we think about this uh, self-archiving web as an instrument of history, then preserving its integrity turns out to be important. And a side effect of that integrity uh, preservation may also be its use in legal contexts. Uh, is it possible that if we do this well, that this self-archiving instrument becomes the means of recording official records? Is this the place where I record uh, financial transactions? Do I record real property transfers? Do I record intellectual property exchanges or transfers of rights and things like that? From my point of view, if it turns out that we can build this degree of integrity into the system, it would be quite a powerful contribution to the way our society works. Then I get worried about encrypted content. There are reasons that people encrypt things. They want them to be kept private or controllable as to who gets access. The problem with encryption is that it's encryption. And if you lose the keys, you have this little problem, especially if you're not NSA and you can't break them. So one question is whether or not this archival environment can accommodate uh, mechanisms like encryption. And if so, what are the, by what process do we uh, hold on to the keys? Who has access to them? What if you die? What if you forget what the keys are? What should be done? And I guess that we will simply lose some information that got encrypted because the keys are no longer available. Uh, I don't think that we should rule out being able to put things away that are in this form. I mean, the basic, this is layering again. Uh, the basic idea here is that the system should accommodate a fairly broad range of applications and we should try very hard not to let the system limit our imagination and our creativity. Uh, and th then there's this other question when you start thinking about national uh, records and things like that, some records are actually held, uh, uh, access is inhibited for a period of time. And you can imagine copyright being an example of that, but there's a finite time after which it's supposed to expire. And the question is, well, okay, so what metadata can I put into the system in order to trigger the uh, opening up of access to something which is constrained as to uh, time before it can be made available? I think that may be the last slide. No, there's a little more. Ah, okay. I, w I read this in an article. I don't know if you can read this, but uh, I think so. Can you read it from the back? Yes, okay, that means we have 24-year-olds back there with 20-20 vision. <laughs> That's, that's most people in my experience these days. Uh, anyway, the whole point about this is that containers have turned out to be a pretty interesting mechanism 
in which you wrap in all of the stuff you need in order to execute something in a, a virtual environment, in a, a cloud environment. And so the more I think about that, the more I imagine that maybe there's a role for this container notion in the distributed archive of the web so that the containers have everything we need in them in order to do the rendering. Now this still gets us back to questions about who has the right to run the software and under what circumstances and terms and conditions. But I'm looking for technical means to assure that the bits that we work so hard to preserve are still interpretable uh, many, many years from now. I really do think that's the last slide. So I'll stop there and I have 13 minutes left, which means that we can do Q&A or you can decide that that was boring and you want to go on to something better, which would be Tim Berners Lake. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, if we're going to have a, d a discussion, uh, I noticed that the acoustics are not terrific uh, for me up here. So if I can't understand what you said, and I see there's a microphone over here, I may come down stairs in order to lip read. Uh, if that messes up the video guys, tough. Uh, so, so let's find out, first of all, if there's any discussion. I see Carl Hewitt is approaching the microphone, which is over here. This is part of our health plan, Carl, to get you to move around. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks, Ben. That was a great talk stop. for a 4 uh, a.m. production. Um, it, one of the things that's happening to our web is we've gone mobile, and we have all these apps, and they're taking over the, the uh, eyeballs. Yes. And that is a real challenge, because that's where the advertising dollars are going. That's where the people's eyes are going. And if we can't accommodate to that, we're toast. Not in, the, not in the current structure, you're right. So, so I would formulate your question as, uh, what should we think about with regard to apps and what is their place in this picture? Of, if, we wanted, if we wanted to show people what the app world looked like uh, you know, 25 years from now, uh, looking back at 2016, what would we actually do? And I honestly am not sure I know the answer to that, although I did see something very interesting that uh, Google is apparently uh, finding a way to run apps in native form in the Chrome operating system. And so this is somehow a kind of a transport of the Android world into the Chrome world. That doesn't necessarily make it a web world, mm -hmm. but it does say that we can get off the mobile platform onto something else, which might help us get to where I think you're suggesting we should go. I, I, we need to find ways to index stuff that's in the apps. Uh, Brewster needs to up his game on 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 on, <laughs> on on games that run in these apps with their many with their many core requirements, and we need to find some ways to archive this stuff from these apps because they they can do what the the browser can do in the apps. They can easily do all the HTML stuff, but the browser can't do what they do. You know, uh, Carl, as you talk about this, I have this image in my head. You know, you go to these museums. And, and you see these dioramas, a reproduction of the, you know, uh, Jurassic period or something, or Jurassic period yeah, or something like problem. that. I'm beginning to think that if we fail to do a good job of archiving, we may still have people creating these sort of digital dioramas of what the world looked like in 2016. And if we're still alive to go and look at that, we'll probably all have a good laugh. But uh, I think it's a good point that we should think about apps too to feed into some kind of standardization thank process. Yep, yes. Thank you. Well, well noted. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, you might say who you are so that everybody can get back at you later. Sure. <laughs> hey, Vince. Uh, I'm Ryan Barrett. I'm with the Indie Web. Um, this was great. I was surprised you didn't mention digital vellum. It seemed related. Is it too far down the stack? You wanted to focus high level? or? Uh, I, that's right. Uh, well, my favorite term for creating an environment where we can preserve the digital rendering of things is digital vellum. Uh, and uh, I, it didn't occur to me this morning to go and throw that into the, uh, the mix of all the other things, but you're quite right. Um, in some sense, um, I think thinking about the self-archiving web influences my thinking about this vellum notion, because the vellum idea is, was mostly focused on an object and its rendering, 
and our ability to interact with it. What we're challenged to do in the self-archiving web environment is broader in, in some sense, but the vellum ideas, I think, comport well with containers and the ability to render things that are at the edges of the web. And so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I've now officially said digital vellum in this august gathering. Everyone's tall. Hi, I'm Hi. Samantha, and I work in the I'm web moving, VR I'm space. over here where I can see your mouth better, but it's not, not working that well. How about so that? here we go. <laughs> All right, so much for the cameras. Yes. Um, I have noticed since, yeah, get on in here. <laughs> No, it's okay. This is I fine. No, I mean, I've noticed since I've um, moved over to delivering our, you know, VR experiences through the web, that um, people look at me like I'm crazy to think that we would go beyond apps. And how would you suggest when people are asking me, well, how do I monetize this, and how how would you suggest that we start having this conversation where it's obvious, so obvious to me that we already have this delivery platform on everyone's devices in this room and across the world, how can we start creating this conversation and making it seem normal to people that are so used to apps? Because this is something that I find I stutter over. So that's actually many questions wrapped up in one. Okay. Uh, the app space for me uh, has grown almost out of control. There are so many of them that it takes too long to find them. It takes too long to set up the one I want. I certainly do not want the Internet of Things to turn into a gigantic app verse where I have to run a different app to turn a light bulb off and on. And so it's pretty clear we need to move away from this individual uh, app for every individual thing you want to do into a broader environment. Some people are talking about using web apps as an alternative, which might allow us to use the underlying web structure as a way of interacting. It has an app-like character to it, but it feels more like you're in a browser. That might help. But I think you were also asking about monetization. Uh, is well, that just correct? Just the sort of post-scarcity of information. This has been something, as a startup, I've been, you know, for me it's more about just having your content go viral. And it can't do that through an app, especially when it's experiential like VR. So, so well, wait now, I'm not sure I agree. I mean, I, let's, yeah. let's look at the various models that are available. One is obviously the advertising model. Uh, another one, uh, and, and there's nothing stopping people from putting ads in the middle of apps. That's something probably Google and others are, you know, are doing or thinking about. Um, another possibility is subscription models, and service type uh, models can be very helpful there. You subscribe to the service, and the app is a mechanism for activating the service and interacting with it. Uh, I'm not sure whether, there's also the you know, pay-per-view mobile mobile. I'm, I'm a little surprised that you're saying that you're not seeing a business model that would work. No, I, I'm seeing a business model. I, I see it. I'm just, it's been an interesting sort of translation showing people that you can just use the web um, for everything. <laughs> well, I'm, look, I'm just an engineer, not a business guy, so I'm a bad guy to talk to about that. Okay, we got one last one, and then I think I'm supposed to shut up, right? Okay, go okay, for it. Okay, um, thank you. I'm curious, because in this context, we're, the environment we're in right now with the report, for example, about the Stanford rape, the rise of intolerance, anti-Semitism in the current um, political climate, I'm curious about your position on, on privacy and the right to be forgotten. In the case of this archiving, when someone's something make it essentially archived, essentially, that you don't want to be archived. What, what would be the mechanisms, or how are you thinking about that? So uh, many people worry about privacy. In fact, there is a, a whole uh, process called the, the right to be forgotten, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, for me, technically, that's kind of weird, because we have to remember everything we're supposed to forget. Because we have to, no, it's exactly correct. Because in order to wipe something out of the index, we have to remember that we're supposed to wipe it out. And we have to remember that forever because it might come back. So, you know, the, it, this, there's, there's something, there's a reductio ad absurdum element to that particular line of reasoning. This doesn't mean that, therefore, there's no privacy. And so I'm not channeling Scott McNeely here. Um, what I do think, though, is that we have to think a little bit more about what it means for uh, us to use this Internet environment, including the web. 
and what control we have over uh, the content that gets generated. Part of the problem is that it's not just the stuff that we generate. It's the stuff that other people generate that introduce problems with privacy. It's made worse by the fact that we now carry cameras with us that have radios on them and we can take pictures and upload them. I've noticed one interesting social phenomenon. It's a weak response to your question. But people who ask to do selfies and pictures and things like that ask. You know, they could just take the picture and they don't. So there's this interesting social phenomenon and it may be that as time goes on and as the, as the technical and social problems become more apparent, it's conceivable that we will evolve social practices and mores, if you like, uh, in order to cope with the side effects of this very, very visible and online environment. I don't think there is a simple technical solution to this. We use cryptography in order to hide things, but it has its own problems, including not knowing to whom to give the keys, or if you gave somebody a key and you want to take it back, you can't because they copied it. I mean, a whole series of challenges like that, and so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a trivial answer okay. to say crypto is well, the solution. Thank you, because uh, I should, I, I, speaking of forgetting, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Ken Goldberg, professor Hello, of there. engineering at UC Berkeley, and we're, we're very interested in the power of the people in this context, so thank you. Good. Thank you very much for that advertisement. <laughs> All right. Um, Wendy, you're back online. Thank you. Let's hear it for Vint Cerf, everyone. Oh my God. Come on. This man gave you the internet. I think he deserves a kind of a standing ovation. I mean, Samantha, how cool is that? You just got to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Vint Cerf and Ken Goldberg, who runs this great new AI lab at UC Berkeley, our favorite university. Love them. Grab him at the taco truck tonight, Ken. I think you have lots to talk about. But if I were hearing, was hearing Vint right, he had a few lessons for all of you builders of the decentralized web out there. He said, make sure it's a big tent. Keep that tent big. He said that we're someday going to need a library of emulation. We call ours the emularity here. That's what allows you to play Oregon Trail on Internet Archive late at night with your, with your friends. And finally, thank you for saying that we're going to need good metadata. All you librarians and archivists in the room, right? Metadata is that bibliographic information that allows us to find and catalog and index things. Vint Cerf, the father of the internet, says we're going to need good metadata. So thank you very much and thank you so much for all you've done to change and enhance our lives. Vint Cerf. Well, next, oh my goodness, you know, it's kind of this embarrassment of riches, isn't it? Someone was tweeting just now, it's kind of like the Beatles. Paul McCartney is here and now John Lennon just walked into the room, right? Um, I guess I just want to tell you a little bit of the background story on Sir Tim Berners-Lee. You know, back in 1989, he was just this young physicist who had gone to go work for CERN, which at that time was the largest internet node in all of Europe. And he had a job, you know, he had a job just like all of you working for companies today have a job. But he had this idea that maybe he could take hypertext and marry that to the internet that Vint had just created and create something new. So he went to his boss and he said, I have this idea, could I work on that? And the boss said, well, oh, I don't know, Tim, it's kind of slow right now. I'll give you a few weeks. And he had a 100% time to think about this problem. And in subsequent years, he said, all I really needed to do was step back because the pieces were all there. The internet, TCP, which was greatly enhanced by Van Jacobson. Van, can you raise your hand? Van is in the room. Van, he's the one who makes our computers run a lot faster. The pieces created by Vint and Van and many, many others were there. Sir Tim said all he needed to do was step back and think of it as a higher level of abstraction. 
he took his idea, wrote it all up, and he presented it back to his boss, and his boss wrote in the margins, vague but exciting. That vague but exciting idea became the World Wide Web that has revolutionized all our lives, all our professions. Please welcome the man who created, solely created, the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee. Do we have another podium or? Sweet. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Thanks everybody for coming. This uh, redecentralizing the, re the web or the decentralized web is a, is a topic um, dear to my heart. Uh, and uh, it's great to have so much energy. When Brewster starts anything, a lot of energy goes on just from having Brewster involved, never mind all the other people that he ropes in. And we have a great crowd here today, so it's very exciting. I'll, so I suppose uh, I've been asked to as well start just a little bit, uh, touch back on the original, you know, what it was like back then, any other any lessons. Are we both being, being your no, you're not. You're not, but, I'm not, but neither are you on my break. Maybe we could just turn the projector off, it would be good. Uh, and lots of house lights. Um, this is a very yellow situation. It's also a really interesting quasi-religious sensation. Uh, when you were saying that, it, that you, you worried about people might think you had weird dreams. Uh, anybody who just woke up here in a yellow light-filled church with sacred relics containing all of human uh, knowledge at the back of the room, flashing lights, would definitely think they'd woken up in some kind of sci-fi uh, rerun re, re, <laughs> or, or, or something. This is uh, very surreal, so very extra special to be, to be here in this church of uh, the, the church of all knowledge. <laughs> so uh, back then, okay, so Vin had done his work, thank you, Bob Connor folks, 20 years before I did the web thing. Okay, they did it 69, okay, 89. No, totally different music, very different situations. It took 20 years for the people in Europe to actually get around to realizing that the internet wasn't something, was something they could use even though they didn't invent it themselves. And so it became politically uh, appropriate to, to use it at CERN. And the connectivity, which had was more or less throughout the US, had actually percolated through, uh, often through people at, at uh, doing it kind of against the bosses, bosses uh, requests and actually running IP packets over lines which had been lent to them for other purposes, quietly tunneling and things. But it was there at CERN and I could use it. And I had my boss, yeah, and thought, that, uh, thought it was vague, exciting on that piece of paper which turned out only after uh, w w he died, t unfortunately, 10 years later and they found that in his belongings. Uh, so at that point, the, I, the, the objective was to make something universal. I've seen lots and lots of people make really, really cool documentation systems which required you to log into a particular uh, uh, system, use a particular format, use a particular server, use a particular client, uh, use a particular word processor, use a particular, or even use a particular structure. Like some of them were tree oriented, some of them were matrix oriented. And the people, um, the guys who, who had matrix-oriented mind designed matrix-oriented documentation systems for which you had to choose a sort of a classification and a category. And the people who were tree-oriented just rebelled and wouldn't use it. So it was this constant rebellion of people refusing to use documentation control systems and help systems. So the result was at CERN, which had lots of really cool people, there was this mass of heterogeneity. And yeah, just, just stepping back from it, realizing actually all these systems, different though they were, they all could be viewed as just hypertext pages. And so, in fact, it would just take a bit of code to put on, to run on those systems to convert them into hypertext pages within this global system. There was the art of getting that actually to take off uh, was tricky. It involved making a lot of, comp some, uh, to a certain extent, a lot of compromises like uh, the data format, HTML, that looked like HTML, particular HTML, the way CERN people were using it, the tag H1 was because the people I worked with 
were used to writing each one at the front top, in front of a heading, and so they'd go along with that. They'd look at it and say, yeah, okay, that's, okay, that's you know, HTML, HTML, whatever, I can do that. And the HTTP language, you know, so that is using angle brackets, so why shouldn't the network protocol use angle brackets too? Well, that's because the network protocols didn't. If you looked, but if you looked at SNTP and NNT, the network news, all the existing protocols, ones that carried mail and carried the Usenet news for those those that are old enough to remember uh, Usenet news back then, a uh, great system, uh, those protocols all had a different way of being written. They had a sort of, you know, an uppercase verb uh, and, and, they, and, and the lines, and they sent, for example, things like mail messages around. So HTTP was just a, com a concoction of SMTP and NMTP with the bit. And so that when internet programmers back then looked at it, they looked at it and they go, oh, yeah, I could do that, yeah. That looks, so that looks straightforward. You're not trying to pull, pull me into some weird, uh, weird space. So all, and the URL, this thing, everything had to have that we call URLs now, but they're called, they were using they were universal document identifiers uh, back then, and the, and the, the, the the UDI was designed to look as much as possible like a Unix file name. I must admit I had no, <coughs> no uh, compunction at all about making the slashes go the right original way, even though a lot of the world at that point were, ha were, were putting them in backwards uh, for reasons that historians will just write books about, I imagine. Uh, but so the slashes, it was great to have the sort of, uh, the, the slashes going the right way, but then file names were, were good up to the point where you got to the root of your, file, of your computer. And then there was a question of what to do about then the network piece of it. And the double slash actually came from the Apollo domain system. The Apollo domain system, folks had, on a local area network, you could address files on other systems by putting a double slash computer name. So the idea was to get anybody who'd seen the Apollo domain system, uh, then would use that. So, so, so the wet, a lot of the, um, a lot of the web design was about picking up things that people had already used and, uh, and putting them together so that people uh, wouldn't feel that it was strange. I just mentioned that as one of the things which is, kind of, uh, w which is useful and if, if we kind of then build new systems, put new systems together, we'll have to probably use that sort of technique. Incremental change, only change the pieces that we need. But then, you know, then what happened was the thing that actually did take off. It was never clear that it was going to take off. Uh, now people have assumed it's a done deal, but still you have to be careful of the ways it can still fail. Um, but when it took off, to, so then to rewind you back to the first, you know, first five, ten years of the web, then there was a, sort of, a certain sort of euphoria about breaking down those boundaries. The internet was designed without the nation being a concept. So in fact, it's, it's difficult to, if you, you can find out where a web user, the web user of your website is, but you have to take effort. It's not obvious. But, so that the internet packets by default cross boundaries. So this thing, here was a space which was different from nations. Here was this space. And a lot of people like John Perry Barlow and, and people you know, wrote about, oh, you know, cyberspace is new and different and we can do everything right in cyberspace and we can all be, you know, we, uh, it can be one big hippie encampment or it can be one big communist re or regime or it can be one big, but, it, but everybody felt that it would be one big. And, the, and they got very excited about the fact that anybody could write, make a blog, anybody could make a website. And then, you know, website would be making some files, putting them on your computer, downloading the HTTP daemon, and running it on your computer and plugging your computer into the internet, and then bingo, you were a publisher. And the fact that anybody could publish, uh, I think everybody felt that that was really, really, that was uh, nifty to the extent that it was going to completely change society. It was going to, suddenly, it was going to be a big leveler. That culturally, everybody would be able to put their ideas out there, and by just linking to in your blog to the blogs of other people that you respected, we would end up creating a web of very intelligent uh, uh, discussion, which would address all the issues and resolve all the problems of the day. And, 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 uh, so, and so, and the uh, so, and in the years that followed. Uh, we have quietly moved on 
large and, and, and wonderful things have been done. And the creativity that people put into building on top of the web platform uh, has been wonderful. And of course, you know, the whole idea of a platform, the internet was a platform. The great thing about when Vint invented the platform, it didn't, a thing about, good thing about platform, it doesn't have attitude. It didn't have any attitude about what you should use it for. Similarly, the web, no attitude about what you should use it for, and therefore no constraints on what you use it for. It's universal. You can do whatever you like, and therefore a massive amount of creativity and innovation. And the creativity and innovation now has produced wonderful things like very powerful social networks where people spend a lot of their time. And until recently, but recently, so in the last few years, last five years, last two years particularly, uh, people have been coming up to me, and I realized that out there, there's a sort of an unease. There's an unease because there's people thinking, wait a moment, that, oh, that, uh, that utopian uh, leveling of society and that reinvention of our systems of governance and, and our systems of uh, uh, debate, uh, what happened to that? And the answer is, well, all the people that I thought, you know, we, 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 we hoped would be making their own websites and we imagined fancifully, you know, putting them on the computer, sitting under the TV, uh, actually, no, actually, they're all just on one great big website. And it turns out that when you talk to them, they're quite frustrated because you find, you find a typical day uh, in, the, in the life of a person out there is that they're, they have their friends on Facebook and they have some photos on Flickr and they have their uh, colleagues are all on LinkedIn and they, then all they want to do is they've uploaded some photos to Flickr and they just want to share those photos with their colleagues on LinkedIn and with their friends who happen to be on Facebook. And you know what? They can't. And, you know, and that's really, when you look at it, it's really stupid. When if, you, if you're in this world, of course, no, you have to either tell Flickr about all your friends and all your colleagues, or you have to move the photos uh, to Facebook, or you have to, uh, or you have to build a, uh, you have to move your photos onto LinkedIn separately and send them out separately, or you can build a third application and get uh, and run it and get it or get it the rights to extract the, the list of friends from Facebook. And you can try to build a third application which will tr will build a bridge between those two. But then you have to learn the f if you're a developer, you have to learn the Facebook API and you have to learn the LinkedIn API and you have to learn the Flickr API. And <laughs> you know what? You know, I'll, I'll just mail them to them with a with a stamp on it because uh, this. All my life has, has been stuck in these silos. So the siloization of the web is what people are suddenly finding, are, are starting to react against. It was a great, uh, car, if I had one slide, it would be the cartoon that from the, the Economist did several years ago now about of people the, 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 these, uh, showing how, like prison cells, the, the world has got these walls. So when, you're, when you're in one social network, it was really hard to get into the other one of people walking on top of the walls trying to hold, help their friends up and over into the next social, so, social networking site. Great cartoon. So, so they, here we are at a, a situation where the internet was designed to be basically decentralized. We can talk about that in detail. And Vince gone into some of the issues there with, with, with DNS. And the web was designed to be decentralized so everybody can make that, everyone could be, everybody could participate by having their own domain and having their own web server, and this wasn't how. And in fact, we've got a situation where individual personal data uh, and it, uh, was, has been locked up in these silos. And there is, and one of the features of the last few years is that if you read the trade press, uh, uh, you read magazines, what the first thing you get at the top of a lot of the articles, and certainly anything in the, uh, in the marketing world, is you get the assumption, they say, well, what's the world today is one where the consumer gets a whole lot of things for free. And the deal that consumer has done is that they sold their soul of their privacy to in order to get those things for free. And what, in fact, when they sell it, when they, away to give, they give away the privacy to the thing, the machine, to the marketing system, to whoever it is that eventually gets the data that has been captured by you in, uh, in all these many ways. And what happens to that allows them to suddenly get targeted with all kinds of things. It uh, becomes impossible to 
not that, let that person not let you uh, not know that you're pregnant, so you end up getting, and your child ends up getting things for the rest of their life, knowing, uh, from just when you're buying patterns, switch uh, from going out a lot needing to buying diapers, and, or buy, by buying, you buy the first crib, because the system actually makes a huge amount of use of that data, which people find suddenly a little bit creepy. But the, and the assumption is that, but yeah, everybody's happy with that. That is the deal. They're not totally happy with it, but you know, they're so happy to get a search for free and use for free that that's, uh, and, uh, that that's, and that's how it works. And the only way to make advertising on the net at the moment is, you know, is by, uh, to make money is to make is to advertising. So what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture is that, uh, well, I think start with that whole de the deal that the deal that consumer gone through, I put it to you, it's a myth. It's a myth that it has to be. I think it's a myth that everybody's happy with it. And I think it's a myth that it's optimal. So in fact, what's weird about it is if you think of me as a consumer, right, I've, my data, about, I go for a run. I go for a run, say, using some gadget, and my gadget communicates by ant or by Bluetooth with my laptop. My laptop uploads it to the cloud, and then that cloud knows all about how well, fast I ran today. Well, you know what? Value of that little piece of data about how well I ran today is about some guy with some demographic. And it's a little bit about how when some guy with some, in some particular demographic is choosing to keep fit today. From the point of view of marketers, it tells you a little bit about, uh, about what I might buy, I might sell, sell me, want to sell me some running shoes, because you can figure out, uh, maybe you can figure out by looking at the speed I'm running that I probably need some new shoes because I'm getting slower because I'm limping or something by looking at the GPS traces. But, you know, but basically, mm, the actual value to you, the big marketing machine, is actually really, really small compared that actually, to, when you look at my point of view, that, that data, that's data about me, okay? So if I'm, supposing I'm running a machine trying to track of my life, that data, I put it to you, that the, data, the value of the data to me is much greater than the value of the data to anybody else. Um, so, not for a bit. We won't go for questions for a bit. Uh, yeah, I know we have to catch up some time, but we didn't talk about starting times and ending times. Um, so, um, that will give us half an hour of questions if we went to questions now. So, the, um, so, uh, so the proposal is then to bring back the idea of a decentralized web, bring back power to people. The, the things we're doing at MIT uh, and various other uh, organizations uh, involve just breaking that model where you, all your data is in different silos, it involves making, we have a project, for example, which is called Solid, um, and it, uh, which involves having a standard so that when, when I get my fit bit data, whatever it is, I can put it in my own storage, or I can put it in cloud storage that I control, and so we're, we're thinking, we're going to make a social revolution by just tweaking, we're going to use web technology, but we're going to use it in a way that we can separate the apps that you use from the data that you use. And so that I can control my data. Imagine I have a place to keep all my data. And, uh, and uh, so the, whenever I run any app, it will store data in places that I control. And as a result, when I run something like a lifestyle app, it doesn't just get access to the things in one silo, like my friend's my management app doesn't just get access to the stuff in my Facebook silo, it gets access to my whole life. And it, get, and it can, gets access to the pieces of other people's lives that I should be happy to, happy to share with. So that's the way in which we're proposing, you're flip, tweaking the architecture a little bit, but dramatically changing the way it's through socially. There are lots of other ways in which, you know, we've, we, we've had the decentralized interest group, uh, information group at MIT for, for years, I've been talking about redecentralizing re the web, and the, there's a redecentralized.org uh, uh, movement which has had some meetings in London. This, 
But then when you, but when you use the word decentralized, you put up a uh, workshop, then you meet all kinds of interest, um, people who are looking at issues, uh, looking at some of the issues, for example, with the existing web design. The fact that we use domain names system, well, you know, it was there. Uh, and it was clear that it has issues, as Vince mentioned. One of the things we could do is we could change the rules for the domain name system. So we, imagine we have a dot archive and top level domain where actually you don't rent them, you get them forever. And the deal is with, if you have anything and put in the dot archive domain, then it's out there to be copied. It's subject to these interesting protocols and, and, and anything. And, that domain stays forever. If you, don't, might, you might not keep it, you may die, but the domain stays and it will be managed by somebody else. And if nobody, uh, nobody's using it uh, actively, then it'll, turn, it'll just go into the system of all the connected ar uh, internet archives in the world. Um, so, there are interest, so there are lots of things. There are, there are lots of also really cool systems where you say, let's, let's not use human readable names which have semantics at all because those are kind of risky. They, they, uh, people, by the way, people, uh, you should think of the HTTP URL as a name, not as a location. Uh, philosophically, it is a name, it is not a location. Uh, the fact it's called a URL was because of a, a battle I lost uh, in the IETF many years ago. Uh, but you should think about it as names. And, and uh, one of the ways to, move, to get people out of the thinking that these things are locations which can change is to actually not use a domain name at all, but to just use, say, a, a cryptographic hash uh, of the, the actual text of the thing, uh, which has interest, lots of interesting properties. And other things are you can generate a public private key pair for it and have it identified by the public key when you keep the private key. That allows you to to change it, and you can put the changes into the blockchain if you believe, or if you do believe that the blockchain isn't another centralization that we're able to fall into, as a, if there's only just one blockchain. So lots and lots and lots around here. There are lots and lots and lots of. Uh, we've had some discussion with, uh, in the pre-meeting yesterday with r some r very very cool projects, which uh, um, and though I'm sure they will be available. In the t uh, uh, but the uh, but I think the the um, what we're all aiming for is to make the web more you know, better in lots of ways, more reliable, more, uh, uh, give it yeah, give the ability when you follow a link. And already, for example, HTML, you can now, uh, one little thing that's happened on the site, you can put a sub resource integrity. Uh, you can just mention, your, uh, just saying that when you are linking to something with HTTP URL, you can actually give it hash as well. So that's, you know, that's creeping into, uh, you can talk to Wendy when he's down there. Uh, that's sort of new standards up from WTC, which are adding to the web as we know it, the, the, the sort of the name, address by hash, uh, if you like, pro uh, properties that a lot of you have gotten your, uh, in these wacky de cool decentralized systems. So uh, a lot of the issues which we've been talking about, we will be talking about, are about naming, about should we, uh, fixed DNS. Uh, sh I think a lot of people feel that the squatting. I know when I've tried to uh, had a really cool project and I thought, a good, and I've had this name for it, like when can we meet? I get when can we meet dot com, and I find everything like when can we meet dot com has been bought by a speculator, and has and they'll sell it to me for a hundred thousand dollars. That is not very good for innovation. If there is a hundred thousand dollar tax for having a good idea which consists of several English words, so obviously you say when can we meet dot. Uh, and that's why the world is full of when can we mutt and things out there. And it's largely because of speculation, which kind of sucks. So the management of the... So one possibility is we have new top-level domains which are managed completely differently, where we'll find ways of uh, ruling out speculation. Uh, another possibility is we actually uh, start uh, creating, replacing the use of the, uh, of the domain name system by something else. Exciting times, exciting times. And we'll end, all end up... Uh, it's very important that we all end up producing standards, of course. One of the, some of the exciting debate uh, is going to be about the, about the way these different projects can actually use different piece of, uh, pieces of each other. It's hard to do that because it involves constraining the way you work to be able to be compatible with the way somebody else works, which 
Yeah, that sucks, because it's so much easier to just go straight ahead and design your own system without looking at either side. And then, in fact, you always have to catch it. Uh, you have to hit a uh, happy medium. Other things that, um, oh, by the way, yeah, things I should mention happening in WPC, the social web working group you should check out, uh, which is very much in this space. It's about uh, very much about uh, de decentralized power. Web authentication is a biggie. All these systems need authentication. There's a web authentication work, work working group which has taken over the FIDO work. There's also a working group. There's a uh, community group doing ha uh, hardware token. Uh, which you could check out. So um, those things are close by you know, places where to find other like-minded thinking people. Um, I think that uh, also the, uh, one of the things I hope we'll see is emerging of, like, is, is of the world of synchronization of sync and uh, uh, synchronization systems, things which sync your phone and your laptop and, uh, and bits of the cloud should start to be indistinguishable from the web. Uh, yeah, the web itself also, you know, a lot of the websites out there, actually behind them, there's a source code from system. Like you can see the website, and then you can also follow a link to the GitHub repository, where is the, where is the Git source code control of all the different versions of that website. Maybe we should start introducing to HTTP the, uh, the links, so that actually we start surfacing the whole, you know, we basically surface Git. Uh, or, or, or a redesign of Git that's the, the, the easier to use, which uh, uh, we, we surface that source control functionality so that we capture all the different versions and they're all visible in a standard way. Wouldn't that be cool? So and that, uh, and uh, when we do that, then we end up uh, having common languages for talking about the differences between two versions. And when you have common languages between talking about the differences between two versions, there are really cool things you can do by parsing all the differences in a document that you have on your laptop between around the, the other people in the boardroom as you're editing something so that you don't have to even rely on. You can use the same technology, but actually the systems could talk to each other over Bluetooth instead of uh, because they can. Lots of really exciting possibilities, and they connect together in ways which, you know, which would mean to try to elaborate all the connections would take much too long. I just wanted to throw in some of the ways in which I'm a frustrated on behalf of everybody who's using the web at the moment and stuck uh, uh, sil uh, the silos. Be very excited uh, that we can re, -de re decentralize the web, and uh, very excited that we've got this uh, incredible group of people here and very thankful to Brewster for, and company at uh, uh, the, uh, the archive for hosting it all, putting it all together. Thank you very much. Shall we, we take some, shall we take questions? some questions? If you have a question for Sir Tim, please come to this mic. Remind everyone to make it a question, not a statement. And ask one question at a Those time, have the question so we can have more end, people. They go, they go up at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess first, happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I guess I, uh, I'm uh, heartened by the fact that so far, lots of the talks have been about the values that we want and how we can sort of define what we want ahead of time before we go out and try to build it. But I also wonder if you could comment just on maybe the, if you could just stay the top three maybe um, promising projects that uh, achieve a lot of the things we've, we've already talked about, like name data networking, IPFS, things like that. Ooh, you know what? People ask me for the, my top three websites and I always refuse uh, because they're all very wonderful. So I'm uh, I asked to the top three. There are, I would, I, sorry, I'm not going to pick a top three because they are wonderful in different ways. It's not that they're all trying to achieve one particular thing and it's a question, you know, who's closest to the moon? You know, I, you, they've got one person, as with the moon shot, we've got some people working on fuel, we've got some people working on spacesuits, we've got some people working on uh, physics and, uh, and navigation. And they all, f so the interesting thing is how they all fit together. Uh, you can't put them in order, uh, just like you can't put people in order. <laughs> Hi, Tim. So 
I got involved a few years ago in trying to keep a bunch of my friends from joining a walled garden, but they were non-technical people, and it was ultimately impossible because the design of that garden made it very easy for them to understand what to do. So how do we get better design for our better for the world versions of these things? Because that's really the problem. Uh, it's a really important problem. Yes, I agree. One of the, uh, we, so when we're using a decentralized system, uh, where if you try to log on to a solid server, then the, what, what you're doing, when you first, use this, you first use any of these decentralized apps for the first time, is you're getting yourself an ID which will allow you to use any decentralized app and also to allow them to store data on any server, any of the servers you choose, even if you buy a Freedom Box and plug it in at home, you could, you know, you store, server on, store stuff on there. And so there are lots of possibilities. And so uh, how to make the sign-up experience just like you signed up for the simplest social networking chat is, uh, one, is, is a really important goal. And, and in a way, of all the ex user experiences they have, the sign-up experience is kind of a crucial one. Uh, to the, you know, the onboarding. So I agree. Uh, once, uh, so, so, there are, so I hope that one of the things that we'll do is we'll end up with really great designers pitching in to look at, at the, you know, for example, just to rewind, you know, just, to, just to rant, well, start my PGP rant. PGP is a great system. Okay, it's a great, uh, the software UI is really horrible. It's been worked on by hardly anybody with hardly any funds. Uh, but, for example, if you were to take the, 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 the GPG code and, uh, 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 and take the drop-down which says your, your, your key isn't known, you should launch the, the key manager and go download it and search for it and then store it and then save it and then maybe this message will go away and change it into a button which just does all that. Okay? Uh, you know, the, the, some, sometimes the things are very obvious. And there, and there are systems where for years people haven't put the effort into just smoothing it out. And sometimes it's, ob sometimes it's not obvious how to, uh, and sometimes, yeah, the people, the, uh, of course, the huge hordes of people who work in the, in the walled gardens do as, as gardeners, they are paid well, but they, it always turns out in the long term that you can make the long, walled garden very, very sweet but the jungle outside is always more appealing in the long term because it's got cause, cause of the diversity which it produces. So one of the cool things is we, in our decentralized world, we will have lots and lots of competing apps. And if we have good standards, they will store data in compatible forms so you could switch from one to another. Well, so while keep preserving your entire social graph and your contacts and your, and your life and your fitness and all that, you will be able to switch, choose which fitness apps in life and, uh, and contact managing apps you, you can use because you're, cause you're using standards. And so that, in a way, will allow us, that in a way, will allow us to, will allow us to, now people to move from one to another. <coughs> okay. So, okay, next. Thanks. I first want to say uh, thanks for your vague but interesting idea. I've got maybe a vague question <laughs> of my own, uh, actually related to what you're just saying. Um, so the do the web as it is Can now. You poke, poke the, uh, yeah. the moves, um, so the web as it is now was kind of designed for documents, and we still talk about web documents. But so much of uh, you know applications and things like that <coughs> is really data being delivered over the web. Um, but there's no interoperable, you know, Facebook has its standard uh, for their data. Um, Yelp, uh, all these companies have different ways of representing their data. Um, are you aware of any standards uh, that kind of hope to uh, kind of unify this kind of data layer? And how would you go about kind of promoting that, you know, given these ideas are really hard? There's, there's a million different ideas for doing this. How do you standardize people on one? Well, the solid project is exactly that. So github.com slash solid. It's early, it's early days. It's at the developer getting, so how would I promote it? I would say if you're a developer, uh, you uh, do things like think about using Turtle and uh, uh, getting uh, drinking the, coo the, the link data Kool-Aid because it's cool. And, uh, and, when you've 
and, and, uh, and then look at the solid stuff because the solid, uh, the, ho the whole idea of that is, uh, I suppose there's two levels. One is the goal, and I'm talking specifically about this particular project, that the goal is that the data stores are at, are, have generic APIs. So that is one level of standardization. You can tweak f uh, files, you can add data, uh, you can just add facts to a file uh, uh, add, uh, by, by poking them the, so the, uh, at that level or that you're reading and writing files and you're also editing files. You can treat any file as a database, basically. Um, that level, the server just implements a certain functionality, no more. So that we need a certain amount of standardization. To, so to be a solid server, we know when we've got one in Go and we've got one in, a, in Node. Um, and to be a solid server, you just need that level of standardization. But to make it all work, the apps can write stuff into the store, but they can't just write anything. So then we have to standardize how you store your contacts, how you store your friends, how you store your, uh, and how you, uh, how you build the interactions, because these aren't just you know, pieces of data, they're invitations and acceptances and things like that. So we're working through that to join us. Uh, you know, how, how we I hereby encourage you. How do you encourage like this? This is the best I can do. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending and for your work. Um, I'm wondering how you feel about uh, global access to the internet and how keeping this sort of jungle open allows, you know, like Africa is considered a mobile only market at this point uh, rather than mobile first and just the way, um, you know, traditionally disadvantaged populations in the world are starting to access the internet. I'm, I'm wondering if you think like keeping this unsiloed internet allows people in those areas to have the sort of access that we all had in the 90s. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, everyone in this room, we're really privileged to be embedded in tech to this degree. So just, I'm wondering if like the projects at MIT and stuff like that, if they have any focus on, uh, you know, that sort of access globally. Well, check out the, you know, the Web Foundation, for example, webfoundation.org. Yeah, we are right now, uh, we are privileged. We are, the, the number of people using the web. When we started the Web Foundation, you know, we were shocked that it was 10% and 20% of the world. And at that point, for the first time, you know, we, we, called, we couldn't have talked about it as a human right when it was 0.001% just the people in the room. But now it's getting to the... It's, uh, so we started the Web Foundation because, whoa, what about all those people who don't have access? Well, now it's come up to... It's about 41%, roughly. Uh, so that means that something very cool is going to happen. It, something very historic is going to happen. It's going to it's go from being a, a soon, next year or two, it's going to cost 50%. And so suddenly what was a minority thing will become a majority thing. So yes, obviously, a huge amount of effort. As we, as we do that, as we go through this, a lot of effort needs to be... So they look, look at the Alliance for the Affordable Internet and things like that, uh, e4ai.org, uh, trying to just get the cost down of devices, get the cost down of connectivity, making sure there aren't unreasonable taxes, and monopolies uh, across the, de uh, the developing world. Uh, so that's really, really important as we go through this. But then, of course, there's, as it suddenly becomes a majority, there's a different, uh, 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 in a way, the issue flips to something different. And that now, oh, the majority of people in the world have the, uh, have the web, so your business or your government doesn't have to really bother with the people who don't. So the government, so now the digital divide has become, you know, has the gap has become bigger because suddenly a lot of people made the assumption that you're online, and so at this, so for the last 20%, last 10%, and a lot of we need to work a lot of mitigation for how to help people live who are not online, and so on, and so. Uh, okay, uh, what we'll do is I'll close the uh, queue to questions and just take these three questions. I said I'd close the queue to questions, but I take the ones which were on the queue. Oh. <laughs> um, so I think the web platform, my name is Max, the web platform has evolved an amazing amount in the last 10 years. Um, JavaScript is a lot faster. But I think that a lot of the fundamental innovations have kind of been accidental or driven by uh, big interests. So for example, we got WebGL because people wanted to make games on the browser, and then now we get as a side effect, typed arrays, and we can work with binary data, which opens up a whole new section of web apps. 
And then we, people wanted to make video calls on the browser, so we got WebRTC, and as a side effect, we can build these distributed file systems in the browser. Do you think that we need, as a group, one of these big interests to push through the standards process that secretly gives us these side effects that we need? Like, do, or do you think, as a group, um, we don't have the use case yet that can get the standards um, implemented because we need a kind of big semi-truck to write in on? Do you think that's accurate? I don't think we need something weird. One, I, th w you know, I use this stuff for my d daily life. I use it for my, for for example, if you uh, invite me to, a, uh, to, to, to something, to, to, to a seminar, it goes into a tracker, which is all based on solid, and so uh, and that's been I've been you know using that basically for years and keeping it tracking the solid standard. And my feeling is that uh, a lot the, you know, the if you want the sort of killer app, it meet one of the things. So one possibility is actually. The early adopter community is developers because they can they can install stuff, and also they understand they they will understand what's going on, get all excited about it, and maybe just you know we're using you no know, we we have used IRC for ages because it's been kind of had a nice decentralized uncontrolled feel, but this uh, there is a, there, I think there's a Slack channel here. You no know, Slack is another silo. Uh, you're recommend, recommended to tweet. The Twitter is tricky because it's a big, it's centralized for a reason. Slack isn't centralized for a reason. It's centralized just in the lots and lots of versions. There's Gitter and stuff. So one possibility is you know, we just get together afterwards tomorrow and we make a solid-based uh, uh, chat and basically whatever groups need to organize and sh uh, share meeting materials and stuff like that, organize a few basic uh, so it could be that it's not rocket science apps, but just day-to-day -day life really useful apps could do it. Cool, thanks. Hey, question. my name is Juan. Um, my question is going to be about uh, kind of the frontier. So we're here talking about decentralization and location and uh, moving the web outside of some particular point and adding content addressing and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of other things going on in the network right now. So uh, Things like Bitcoin reminded us that we can have payment systems that are decentralized. We are getting overturned in terms of um, the organizations or authorities that run these systems. Web 1.0 was about connecting all these devices to be able to exchange documents and be able to have information sharing. Web 2.0 was about making everything dynamic and being able to have a read-write connection uh, with the websites. What do you think is Web 3.0? There's things like the blockchain that are giving us payment systems and application processing systems that are decentralized. There's things like the file systems that we're going to talk about uh, in this conference that gives us, that lifts the web from location. Uh, there's a lot of disenfranchised people around the planet, people in the developing world that can't actually connect reliably to the rest of the internet, cannot have maintain a, a proper connection. Uh, what do you think are, is the frontier? Uh, would love to hear more about like various ideas. Well, uh, so for that piece, low uh, lots, there, are, there are solutions coming along and low Earth orbit satellites and things like that. That's a bit of a distraction. Let's go back to the essential thing about the sort of the, the, the web. People, uh, yes, the web is a web of documents. When you use and when you download an app, a web app, when it come, when you uh, and you. Uh, and you run it, you're running a bunch of JavaScript, very often you're actually exploring a piece of data. So in fact, behind that is the web of data. So one of the directions is exposing the web of data to users, if you like, allowing, realize, let them realize that what they're looking, when they're looking at a bank statement presented by their bank, they could actually turn on a bunch of really cool, more powerful tools to look at that bank statement and to do their taxes and so on, and they could buy and pay m good money for apps. So exposing the web of data uh, is the, in a way, to a certain extent, is one part of the answer to the, to the app question. The reason why people have apps is because they need powerful ways of looking at the data. And in fact, uh, so may maybe our hope will be a web which is two pieces. It's a, just a plain docu vanilla documents that you will just look at with a, with a normal browser and, the, uh, and the, the space of data which you explore using powerful tools, but uh, tools uh, which will be uh, hope hopefully uh, archivable and uh, you, um, which will be po looking at uh, standard you know, data which you will still be able to read in 20 years time. Okay, uh, that, okay so the, the uh, I will take. I wasn't going to take the question, question, but this fits so well with your answer. Um, 
linked data. I've, I've watched the libraries and archives world put a lot of effort into adopting, getting their heads around linked data and then getting momentum up behind adoption. And now when I go into that space and talk about decentralization, uh, some confusion comes up around identifiers. And I wonder, in the rules of linked data, one of the rules is that your identifiers are HTTP URIs, where HTTP was designed for the web of documents, right? Hypertext, right? So do you feel like HTTP still has a role in the web of data, or? No, 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 on? no, no, web, right. uh, the uh, HTTP was not designed for web of documents in the sense of Word, doc Word documents. HTTP was designed to be a set of identifiers for anything. And the, the, what Semantic Web says is you can use, uh, you can make a URI to talk about this church, you, this organization yourself. So, the, so if you, the, the way, and in fact, so quick uh, web, uh, web architecture 101. The hash, the web architecture is the hash. The web, the web design is, we will take the identifiers of documents and we will put a hash and then after the hash, we will put something else, which depending on what system you're in, identifies something within the document. So this can be a document about a church, and then hash this church itself is the church itself. Okay, so RDF uses HTTP differently to the way HTML uses it. And it doesn't, and in fact, so you can use these, uh, and you can use these identifiers uh, just as identifiers, you can use them like hashes if you like. Oftentimes, you can look, you can cache them, and you can hash them, and you can, uh, you can, and, and in fact, because they, they start with HTTP, you can look them up uh, and, as well. But that's and that's something that you always need. We can change. We, yeah, we, sometimes you need different. Sometimes you use your, you need to have URNs, but most of the time, almost always, you need to have something. You know, it's, it's valuable to look, look these things up. So. Uh, I think you know what I'd like to be able to do is to stick with using HTTP uh, and you know, as for the namespace, and then morph, and then we and we're constantly changing. And HTTP is constantly changing. HTTP two is a complete redesign just came out. Okay, uh, we're constantly adding headers to it in the Solid project and other projects because you can throw in your uh, other headers. So things. So if you want to use it in a particular way for a semantic web identifiers of things which are distributed between different desktops uh, or uh, for example or in a very peer-to-peer -peer way you can you can do that so uh, anyway we can talk about let's talk about this at the break thank you let's give it up for sir tim berners lee on his birthday For the history books, I want to note that on June 8, 2016, Sir Tim Berners-Lee said that re-decentralizing the web was an exciting possibility. <laughs> Remember that. You heard it here first, folks. Okay, we are about to go to a break, and I tell you what, we're going to shorten that break just a little bit from 10.55 to 11.10. And you're going to want to be sure to be back here because we've got a great video about fun on the internet uh, when you come back. And then during lunch, we've added a new uh, groovy feature. We're calling it Science Fair. And the technologies in the room, 25, 30 of them, will be at tables outside. If you are a Science Fair presenter, I want you to um, power up your computer now because you'll be outside showing off your demos. Okay, go have a good break. We'll see you at 
point them out to you.
Where you going? Too many people over there. Um, Hi, James. Um, so the frame I want to give it is, we talk about the internet as a cloud, and that came from the original ideas of um, the networking that Vin talked about this morning, where you could send something from one end to the other without having to know where it went in between. So we have the, the plumbing, the infrastructure was hidden from us, and that enabled us to build all this stuff on top of it. Enabled him to build the web on that, as he said, we were just joining pieces together, he could not worry about the pieces inside that. Um, and IndieWeb, we've taken that same model of we're building on top of the web that we have um, and finding ways to make that personal and belong to us. What these groups, this group of people are doing are changing what's inside the, that cloud so that we can still move things from one place to the without worrying about what's inside, but we're gonna actually going to talk about some of the mechanisms. I say, oh. okay, everybody, we'd like you to take a seat. We're ready to get ready for our next part of this exciting session. So grab a seat. Please grab a seat. There's going to be lots of breakout time to come. You're on. Okay. Okay, everyone grab a seat. So what do you guys think so far? The father of the internet, the father of the web? Thumbs up, thumbs down? All right, all right. Very good. Are we ready? Okay, we're gonna let just a few more people filter back in because the internet is many things, the web is many things, but it is also fun. And so we thought we would show you just a little bit of that and a little bit of somebody who has been working to reinvigorate the fun of websites. I don't know if you remember back in the 90s, how many of you had a GeoCities site? All right, a GeoCities site. Well, those are long gone. They got taken down. Most of them still live in the Wayback Machine. But today in 2016, we have NeoCities. Here it is. Why did you create NeoCities? <laughs> 
for the lulls. I created NeoCities because I kind of missed the, the way that the web used to be. People actually creating their own websites and like having complete control over the presentation of what they want to create. NeoCities is just an attempt to try to recreate that world so that people can stop feeling like they're being kind of controlled by these large corporations, but rather that they're active participants. NeoCities sort of became the first decentralized, or I guess distrib... Oh, I don't like the word decentralized. Uh, we think that websites are incredibly important, magical, beautiful things that should be preserved through history. To me, every website is a book. And the idea that we lose these books to server failures, to um, you know, political censorship, to anything, is it, just, it, it, it's, it's against sort of my very core of being because we want our sites to be able to stay up for a very long time, uh, for, if, if not forever. Our history is, is the shoulders that we stand on in order to improve the state of our knowledge and to improve the state of our society. People are gonna do some crazy, crazy fun stuff with 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 uh, the web. I mean, the distributed web is going to make it so that anyone can have the same power that a major corporation does. In fact, a power that is even greater than a single corporation because uh, it gives them the ability to create information, to create something fun, and have it so that it will be available forever. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't wait. I mean, it's gonna be great. That's Kyle Drake, the founder of NeoCities. He's standing right here. Stand up, Kyle. Thank you, one of our organizers. And that is a film by a promising young filmmaker, Kenny Okagaki, over there. So, thank you, Tim, also. You know, when, when Brewster kind of put out his, his talk and then a white paper and a longer talk in Amsterdam about locking the web open. I think we, we thought maybe it was kind of theoretical, but slowly and surely, people started to beat a path to his door. Juan Benet came by with IPFS, Devin Reed with the Alexandria Project, Max Ogden and Carissa with DAT, and they started to show us this was not theoretical, that pieces of this were being built and I think what Brewster has always done is see the big picture. As Tim Berners-Lee said, he's able to step up and get to another level of abstraction. And that's what I think he did. He saw all these disparate pieces across the web being created, and he saw a unifying vision in his own head of how those could come together into something stronger, more resilient, more fun. That's why I love working for Brewster Kale, and I do, because there is no vision, no idea too big for him to tackle. And when he says he thinks the decentralized web can happen, I think I'd bet on that. So here he is, Brewster Kale. Thank you, and, I, and I'd like to give a, a, a big applause for, to uh, to Wendy and the Internet Archive staff that have pulled this together and the organizing committee, if you'd please stand up. This, is, this has been a fabulous uh, um, coming together, I think, in terms of also the, the support coming from lots of different angles towards rethinking what it is that we uh, we might uh, build out there. Uh, getting to ride to the archive with Tim Berners-Lee, and he says, HTTP is something that I think is not cast in stone. We should go and think through what it could become. It's like, wow, that's an idea, right? That's an opening. Um, when uh, Mitchell Baker goes and says, the Mozilla, a major force for open, is, can be rethought as to what it is um, that it should do that there's uh, opportunity here, that possibility, that we're not as locked in as we could. Uh, Jeff Uboys, who's here, he posited, we, can we lock the web open? Which is one of those kind of interesting, right? can you actually make it so that openness is irrevocable? Can you make it so that you've baked the values into the web itself? And I would say yes, 
That is our opportunity. Over the last 25 years, we've had millions of us pour our lives into the web. And as oh, a hero, Larry Lessig has put it, code is law. That the way that we code the web will say a lot about how we live our lives online. The code actually determines a lot of how we interact. So if we're doing that, we want it to represent the values and the structures that we want to uh, reinforce and enable. It should uh, encourage universal access to all knowledge. It should make it so that it's not a privacy want, uh, uh, doubt every time you hit a link. You want it to uh, have the First Amendment baked into it. But is that happened? The answer is no. The, uh, the, the web is a very, very simple system and very um, uh, successful system, but it doesn't have some of these basic structures baked into it. But it is huge. We know that it's huge. We collect a billion web pages every week. You can see them uh, um, on just some of our servers that are within this space. Um, the, the web is enormous, um, and it's been uh, very attractive towards getting people to come together. But it's not available everywhere. So the idea of universal access is like, great, except if you're in China or Russia, you can't get to anything on the Internet Archive. In China, you can't get to anything on uh, the New York Times. So it depends on who you are or where you are of whether you have access to this. Also, web pages blink on and offline. The average life of a web page is 100 days before it's either changed or deleted. So it's a very ephemeral medium. It's not a reliable medium, and it's not reliably uh, available. It's also not private. I, one of those sort of eureka moments was one of the Snowden revelations that was put out and uh, reported in the press is JCHQ, the, uh, the UK's um, NSA equivalent, uh, watched all of the readers of WikiLeaks and recorded all of the IP addresses and then took those, the ones that were coming from the United States and handed them to the NSA. The NSA used their authority to then provide, uh, to put them on a trigger list to be uh, surveilled more. In the library world, we have a, um, the idea of being watched for what it is you read and rounded up has a long and dreadful history. We don't want to go down that path. And so the idea of making it so that following a link will make you afraid, as Mitchell Baker said, should not be the case, is very uh, important. But it is fun. I mean, we, we've built this thing that is really pretty amazing out there, where people are, it's malleable enough to go and have people just do wacko, cool-ass things. Um, uh, it's a jungle out there, but it's a fun jungle uh, to go play in. So I would say out of the big three priorities that I've got for the web, we got one out of three. Is it reliable? Eh, not really. Um, is it uh, private? Eh, demonstrably not. Um, but is it fun? Yes. Hooray, we got one out of three. I would like to suggest that we can do something better. I think we can go for a trifecta here. I think we can go for a three out of three of making it reliable, private, and still fun. Um, it's going to require some technologies that basically weren't really available um, 25 years ago. Um, the idea of it building a decentralized system say the internet is a series of tubes, um, is uh, I'm going to try to distinguish the web from the internet in, in, this, in the dimension of decentralization. Uh, one of the nice characteristics of the internet is that it is uh, any particular piece of it can get nuked, literally, and it will still work. That there's a, basically a rerouting. There's not a specificity uh, to some particular pieces of hardware that make it so that it is uh, reliable and robust and resilient across certain types of failure. And a decentralized system that has no centralized points of control where anybody can plug into it and still be part of it is a more difficult system to make than centralized systems, whether it's you have to get an account on a particular system or um, that there's a, a particular piece of hardware that if you take that particular piece out, it will fail. For instance, web servers, most web servers, if you go and knock out a particular um, piece of hardware, it will go down. Or if you go and watch all of the people transiting over a particular I ISP to that 
uh, a web server, you can either block everybody or you can see what everybody that's doing. The internet isn't like that. And I asked Vint, um, sort of how hard was it to try to make a system that had these particular characteristics? And as I recall his response, it was, he said it was five guys locked in a room for a year to go and there was one guy um, uh, that had the role of trying to poke holes in every system they came up with. And there was this back and forth to try to make a resilient, reliable, decentralized system. Another system that's uh, large, large scale used is the Amazon Cloud. The Amazon Cloud is data centers all over the world, and um, popular websites will be shifted from one of these to another to get them closer to their users. They'll even go, and if you pay enough money, they'll go and replicate themselves in such a way that they get bigger um, based on use. This kind of a uh, decentralized system under one ownership control, granted, um, has some really great features that we would like to make available to everybody in the world. Can we do that? Can we go and make the decentralized web operate as if you are a high paying member of the Amazon cloud community um, and um, make it work uh, in a decentralized way? I would say yes. Another goal is we want to make it reader private. We want to make it in such a way that if you were to go and read something, you could feel okay being stupid. I, I, Wikipedia is a wonderful thing for people in my position where you're actually supposed to know things, um, but it's like, I don't quite sure what that was, and you could look things up. If there were any kind of uh, 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 potential kickback for going and saying, oh, no, I'm not going to do that because somebody's going to know that I don't really know what I'm talking about on that particular subject until I re read about it on Wikipedia, that would be a disincentive. So we need a, a, a reader uh, private and then a writer private actually turns out to be easier than reader private on the internet, which is a little flipped backwards from the way it was in print. It used to be difficult to go and publish a book uh, anonymously, um, but then you could just pass the book around um, and, and get access to it. But on the internet, actually, I'd say it's, it's harder to be reader private than it is to be writer private. Let's build a time axis into this one. Let's make it so we don't have to do a clue to like the Wayback Machine that takes snapshots of web pages and then goes and tries to get them to, to be replayed at the right uh, time. I think that the crew here has done a fabulous job doing that, but it's a fix, it's a clue. Why don't we build it into the system itself in such a way that we're not just archiving what websites look like, but the websites themselves. So that as people um, decide to move on to do something else, their uh, research project gets uh, defunded, whatever, the, uh, the project continues to live on. So that scientific publishing doesn't just go down as a professor's website uh, go, goes away. Can we go and put a time axis in this so that it lives in multiple places, multi-homed, um, and is uh, able to be rolled back in time uh, to be able to see different uh, versions? And I'd say we get extra points, extra credit, if we can make it so that people can make money by publishing on the decentralized web without going through a third party. It's something that we really didn't do very well the first time around. Right now, you've got to go and put it into an iTunes store or an Amazon or a sign up with PayPal and they can turn you off. Is there a mechanism making it so that people can have media that they could go and make available if they're a rock band and do this? So I'd say if we're going to go and rethink the web, these are the things that I would like to see in our next generation web. Fortunately, we've got some technologies that are freaking awesome uh, now that we can go and use. Uh, one is JavaScript, and it is it was a real mind blow in the last year uh, when a group archive team working with these uh, uh, unbelievable um, <clears throat> volunteers went and made it so you can actually run old computer platforms in JavaScript in your browser. It was surreal to me. The idea of taking an IBM PC, you click, it boots, and it boots actually faster than it used to, and then it reads a virtual floppy and you're playing Oregon Trail. Um, that was pretty awesome. And so the idea of 15 years ago, computer system living in JavaScript, being able to be downloaded, was a light bulb going on for me, saying that you, we can actually use JavaScript as a comp distributed computing platform. It can become an operating system for a new web, that we can use that as something and not always have to go back to a server. Encryption was illegal to distribute 
in the time of the creation of the World Wide Web. It was illegal to. So the idea of building it in from scratch wasn't uh, uh, allowed. And as I understood from Vint, he would have liked to and assumed that uh, the internet was going to be encrypted, but there were political things. We won those wars, uh, the crypto wars, in the 1990s, and right now it's pretty much just used, being used for guardian credit card records going over the internet. Not good enough, guys. We can go and use this technology to do something pretty interesting with encryption, but also public key to do a, a pseudonymous identities. Peer-to-peer -peer technologies have come a long way. Bram Cohen uh, and the BitTorrent folks have been participating in this um, uh, conference and has been able to make peer-to-peer um, -peer technologies work. And now with WebRTC, you can do it in your browser in JavaScript. So you can actually make it so that your, if any reader of the distributed web can be a uh, redistributor of those web pages. It's a little surreal, but every reader of a web page could then go and share it with other people. And with cryptography, you could know that you're not getting a corrupted version. Another technology is blockchain and Bitcoin that uh, a distributed database system and, and, uh, and a money system that we might actually be able to make smooth an API to money which would be awesome and being able to be able to do that. But it's another thing that was a mind blow for me is there's one of those maxims that only the stupid survive, that only the really simple systems live. But between BitTorrent, uh, between the blockchain, the internet itself, um, those are not simple systems. Some of these decentralized systems are complicated, but they've been successful. So it was a help to me to see that we might be able to build a system out of some of these components to be able to do something pretty interesting. What, uh, what about a whole bold goal? Um, about 25% of all of the websites, it said, are built on one piece of technology, and it's WordPress. Can we make a WordPress equivalent but decentralized? Can we make it as easy for somebody to go and set up a website, but instead of having it either served off of um, uh, WordPress.com or a downloadable thing that you put on your server, can we make it so that you'd have a third option and say, I want to make a WordPress type service that, um, uh, that is decentralized, that would be uh, served from everywhere and nowhere. Could we do this? And so I put out this call about a, a year ago. It's like, what do you think? Um, and it's been a very interesting um, year. Um, so the idea of can we do this? What, would, what do we want? Well, we want it to work with normal browser. So it's built on top of the existing web. So that your phones will work, you know, everything. You, so you're not going to, no new downloads required. It's got to have good names. So I don't know quite what the names and how to uh, factor it in, but it's got to have good naming structure. It's got to have snappy performance. It's got to make be fun and, and useful for interacting. It's got to have an identity system that allows you to go and say, oh, he's the administrator of that website, um, and he can delegate authority. So we need these basic modules, but if we have that, then we have a mechanism of having a website. It, we get extra points if somebody could go and put their band's songs up on this in such a way that if somebody puts a Bitcoin or something else in a, in a slot, that they can go and, and listen to or play those, um, those pieces. And of course, we need archived versions all along, the, all, all along the way. OK, so this is the goal. It turns out JavaScript as an operating system is completely doable now, that you can go and use this as a mechanism of doing a peer-to-peer uh, infrastructure. And actually, as a demo of just that piece, I'm going to do what every, what Wendy probably coaxes me not to do, which is don't do a live demo on a stage, because it's going to go wrong. So I'm going to require you to clap if this actually works. What I'm going to do is um, click on this link, which is a HTTP uh, 127, blah, 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 and, and this big hash, but it's an IPFS hash. And what uh, I'm hoping this happens is it goes to a browser and it will go and retrieve from a little uh, piece of C code in my, um, uh, on my machine, it will use a uh, distributed system to find the web pages that are my blog. And not only my blog isn't just a bunch of static pages, it has a search engine in it that allows you to search all of the blog posts. 
It also has a little database in it. All of that lives in a decentralized world. Let's see if I can get it to go. Score! Okay. All right, not the most exciting graphics here, um, but notice that it is a different kind of URL than you've seen before, and if I search Stallman um, or Vint, uh, it's actually running code here in my browser to do some of the functions that you would do normally in a, um, and if I click on things, I go to different, uh, different web, web pages. So that is a, a sort of an example of being able to get this thing uh, to work. Oops. Present. So we need easy names. There's Namecoin that's in the room. There are other people that are trying to figure out different ways around the DNS system that's less uh, centralized and gets around some of the existing problems. Maybe Ethereum could do some uh, contracts for this. I'm assured by those guys that we can actually have a name system so we're not typing hashes or IP addresses um, that we actually have reasonable things to play with. Versions and performance. Going and serving this out of everybody else's browser cache is just not going to be good enough. We're going to need institutions that are high-speed participants. And fortunately, there are things like the Internet Archive that want to go and archive the web. But we can't even go and just serve out of just the Internet Archives of the world. We need others, like ISPs, that will want to make things faster for their users. Fortunately, they've got the right incentives. And the idea of getting a petabyte of servers is not that hard. So the idea of having caches closer to users as a decentralized distribution system can make it so that Akamai is kind of embedded in everybody's system that's going and using the decentralized web. So maybe the fastest way to publish on the web is going to be by using um, uh, the decentralized web because we can get people that have had the right incentives to make the, uh, the net reliable and fast for their users uh, will be there. Updates and decentralization. So if you go and put a blog post, you have to have it replicate. And that's actually not trivial to go and have that uh, type of system work. And if people are doing it and they're offline, how do you get that weaved together? But actually, over the last few days, I've come to understand that there's solutions to these things. They're not easy, but they are understandable um, and implementable. Uh, so an de decentralized identity system, I don't know that we have to solve everything about it, um, but we have to make a system that will knows that it's you coming back again tomorrow. And uh, one of the nice things about the Bitcoin system is they actually figured some of this stuff out so that if you download a wallet, you get an identity and a mechanism of moving through an encrypto system that typically has been very hard to implement. Um, whether it's PGP in your email, which is notoriously difficult, there are other people that have made it so that you can have an identity system um, that works very well um, in terms of going and saying, this is mine, and I can prove that nobody's going to break it because if somebody did, they'd make millions of dollars off of the Bitcoin system. So if we can piggyback on to somebody else's system, um, then we can uh, make that work. So I would suggest we can have WordPress, but decentralized. And what I find interesting over um, the, the last six months of this is a lot of the pieces, as, as uh, Tim said, is important, a lot of the pieces actually exist. They need to be put together into a, uh, into a focused um, uh, components to be able to deliver something that we've kind of always wanted, a reliable, private, and fun piece of infrastructure that we can use for a very long time. I think we can lock the web open. We can bake the First Amendment into the code itself. We can make it so that openness is irrevocable. We can use these new technologies to extend the work of, Vint, of, of Tim Berners-Lee, of the Mozilla Foundation, and be able to build something now on top of it that responds to some of the needs that we have for expanding to the next four billion people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Come on down. Oh, there's not. I'm sorry. There's no time for questions now, but Brewster will be at the taco truck today. I promise you. And he'll be here all tomorrow when we have all these lightning talks. So much. So we're going to get set up here.
You know, so far, you have heard from the OGs, right? I'm from Oakland, so OG stands for Original Gangstas, right? You heard from the OGs, and now we're going to go to the new, new Gs, the new gangstas of the uh, decentralized web, the new guys and women who are building this new web. So I want to call them up, go and, go, and, go and sit down while we get set up for you. They have come from all over, from Palo Alto, from Lisbon, from London, from Boulder. And leading them in this uh, inquiry about the peer-to-peer -peer layer that Brewster talked about is none other than our moderator, Kevin Marks. Now, Kevin, Kevin is one of the founders of something called IndieWeb. Now, IndieWeb says that you should all be able to own your own data. You should be able to set up your own domain. Right now, IndieWeb has a few hundred members who, with their own websites, but just imagine a decentralized future when they could all have peer-to-peer -peer connections seamlessly, frictionlessly. Imagine what would happen. That is what Kevin Marks and his team are going to talk about. Take it away, Kevin. Thank you. <clears throat> So I want to go back a little bit and um, explain how we used to diagram the, the internet. Um, we used to draw a diagram which had arrows coming in on one side, arrows coming out on the other side, and a big cloud in the middle that said internet. Um, and this meme has taken off everything, calls everything the cloud. But there was a reason we called it a cloud in the first place, which was that we didn't have to worry about what was happening inside it. Um, you could say, um, I'm going to send information to this computer over here, and it would go in one side and come out the other side. And, and as, as Tim said this morning, building on the, the work that Vint and co. had done before, he was able to not worry about that piece and just join pieces together and think about the layer he was working on. What we've been, what I've, we've been doing with IndieWeb has been taking the existing web for granted broadly and saying we're going to be using URLs and DNS and HTTP and HTML, build on top of that and connect people together with that, but encourage them to use their own websites and connect to what is there. What this group has been doing is thinking about where are the pieces of um, the things inside that abstraction that aren't working quite right for everything, how can we replace them with new pieces that solve a particular problem that people are having using the infrastructure we've got. So what I would hope to do is get them to explain the problem they're solving for you, um, as you th that you may not realize you have yet as, as part of their work. So who shall I go with first? Shall I start with Zuko? Do you think you could give us a few sentences on what, you, what you've been, the problem you've been solving for users and what that would be? Uh, I, I'm working on two things. And one of them is kind of not that new. So I'm kind of a medium to old G. Uh, <laughs> for maybe about 20 years now, uh, I, I've been working on this first thing, which is the current uh, edition of it is Tahoe Laughs, L-A-F-S. And that is solving the problem of censorship and impermanence of data, including of web pages. And I, I thought of it a lot while listening to Vince's keynote talk this morning, because it was, it's those problems, the ones that, that Vince Cerf was uh, emphasizing in his, in his talk that Tahoe is all about. Um, so I think of it as the strong web in the sense that the links are not so fragile. Okay. And the other thing that I'm now working on, which is uh, actually my primary uh, focus nowadays, is Zcash, which is a censorship-resistant uh, cryptocurrency, like Bitcoin, but with privacy and therefore with censorship resistance. Um, and I think that's also an important problem because everything needs to be, all kinds of cooperation and provision of resources uh, needs to happen either because uh, people love you and provide you with those resources or because someone else has some motivation to provide you with those. And I, I think Tim or someone mentioned that the absence of payments as an option in the early web has turned into one of its weaknesses um, because what has grown up to replace that has turned into a problem. Um, so that's another thing that I think is very important. Okay. Um, David. 
Would um, you like to tell us your project, what it's called, and what it does? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I'm David. Um, I work on the IPFS project, and that entails two sub-projects. IPFS. Uh, stands for the Interplanetary File System, and what it does is it offers a way for developers to publish applications and basically publish data to the network without having the need to have the data centralized in one <coughs> point, without having one central uh, source of origin. And the way that IPFS is built is really uh, not to create an alternative, alternative to the web that we have today, but actually to upgrade the fabric of the web. And while developing IPFS, uh, we realized that developing peer-to-peer -peer applications has a set common of challenges that every peer-to-peer -peer developer has to face. And when we were facing those challenges, we built a network stack to fulfill the needs of IPFS and to make those apps be able to run both in the desktop, mobile, and even in the browser, the platform that most used to them. So, but we call so, that so we the problem that the user has is the web isn't always accessible, and this will let them get to the stuff Absolutely. when they're detached from the so main web? Is that the, the basic idea? Um, could you repeat, please? Could not so so some, the web isn't always reachable. Yeah. Um, so IPFS solves that by letting you get access to things that are, that are yeah. closer to you, effectively. Yeah, solves the problem of finding content on the network. And basically, you are able to put applications or content and run it anywhere in any device through the network stack that we also developed called we peer to peer So those okay. are the two projects that I'm really going to focus on. OK. Yeah. Okay. Gavin, can you give us your three-sentence version? Sure. <laughs> um, so I'm working on a project called Ethereum. Um, hands up who, who knows about Ethereum already. Ah, wow. Who knows about what? I thought you were going to ask Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> I know about Ethereum. What was the question? Ethereum. Ethereum? It is. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm with him. So I suppose for those who didn't put their hands up, Ethereum is a bit like a decentralized answer to HTTP post. So what Ethereum allows you to do is to run a, 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 an application, in, in principle on a, on a computer, on a, what would normally go on a server and allow, um, allow requests to make transactions within that uh, application. So what we would normally do through HTTP POST, um, we can now make a, a decentralized service in order to do that for you without there having to be at the server on the other side in order to, in order to actually serve that POST request. So the POST request is what you normally create when you're filling in a form on the web. To to clarify, you, you will fill in a bunch of fields and hit a button, and that will create a post. So normally that will go to a server. You're saying, well, that will go to Ethereum instead, and things will happen without you having to stand up servers for that. Indeed. It all just happens magically. It's very good. <laughs> just like magic. OK. And for us, can you tell us what, you, what you're solving for the individual users? Sure. So uh, I work on WebTorrent. And uh, the goal of WebTorrent is to make a torrent client that runs uh, in the browser, so a torrent client that's native to the web. And the, the reason why I started this project was because uh, the torrent protocol is the, probably the most successful, most widely deployed peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol uh, in the world. Um, you know, there's hundreds of millions of participants. And uh, it's this you know, amazing success story of a, of, of of a peer-to-peer -peer application that a lot of people use. But if you look at um, you know, BitTorrent and, and Bitcoin and Tor and all these successful, um, widely used peer-to-peer -peer projects, um, you see that uh, they're all uh, applications that you have to install on your computer. And you don't really use them through the web. You kind of use the web to download them, and then you, you run them separately. And they're really not part of, part of the web. Um, and I think that makes them a little bit more difficult to use than they need to be. And so the goal of WebTorrent was to basically take the torrent protocol and just make it work natively uh, in a web page, meaning that I, as a website owner, could make the videos on my site powered in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Just the you know, pieces of, of media that I, I want to, I can, I can basically make the visitors on my site 
help to host that content while they're on the site and do this within the framework of the existing web that we have today. So the problem you're solving for the user is, I want to post my videos, but not to YouTube. Um, I don't want to post them to the centralized place. I want to post them somewhere where they will stay um, and people can have access to them effectively. Right. So that, but it's also more generic because you can, uh, you know, it's just an efficient way to send data across the network in general. So if I'm okay. like a scientist and I have a big data set, I can, uh, I can stream that from my one, you know, my one browser to another browser and none of us have to install any software on our computer and we don't have to go through any intermediaries. Uh, it's completely, you know, a one-to-one -one thing. Okay. So, okay, so we, we got, I, I see some related issues. I don't want to get the, the projects finding that are solving the same, the same kind of thing, because I think um, the abstraction that, that we're looking for as users is, does this stuff work for me? Is this going to work um, inside my site, or do I need to do some special thing to make it happen? Mm -hmm. um, the, the tension between, so I, was, I mentioned YouTube there as an example. The tension is always between the centralized and decentralized in that we, we, you first build something, you put it in one place, then lots of people copy it, it becomes decentralized if you get it right and make it a protocol, and then someone does a good job of making that into a business and it ends up re-centralized again because everyone goes to the same place to use that same thing. For, so YouTube is a great example of that for video. They did a good job of hosting video, which meant that um, compared to hosting it on your own server, which was always a pain. Um, so they, they basically took over that business. Another example in the programming world is GitHub. Git is a very distributed protocol. It's designed to be distributed, yet by putting it on one website, they gave you a place for people to go to and point other people to, to use that code. So there's a, there's a back and forth between centralized and decentralized. So my sense of this is we've had a big wave of centralization. We've got a lot of things that are now in silos. Um, you know, Tim was saying like half, half the web is now running through three or four companies. We're ready for a wave of things to go to more decentralized again. Does, it, does that fit with, with what you're building? Yeah. Um, so I, I'd say that the GitHub at least example isn't, isn't quite right. I think that if GitHub started doing, um, doing bad things or underperforming in terms of uh, hosting Git repositories, uh, competitors would, would up their game and we'd move elsewhere. I think that's the critical thing, um, okay. is, that, is that the Git protocol is decentralized. It allows us to move between providers, and providers actually provide us with relatively little service. They, they're much more streamlined and focused in what their business actually does, and that's, that's critical. Uh, one, one, one point on that, though, is uh, Think about the damage that will happen in the meantime during that transition period when people are switching from you know, one service provider to another. There's, you know, there's going to be a lot of broken URLs. There's going to be a, a yes. lot of confusion um, and a lot of uh, potentially um, moving costs to, to export your data from such a system. And is there going to be a yeah. mechanism you know, for that? Uh, I use GitHub, and I would I do too. probably like to uh, move to something else in some cases, but I'm never going to do it because there's a whole bunch of uh, hyperlinks pointing to my stuff. And I don't right. So, so, so part of this is that um, by selling you rely the, the problem is that the web breaks piecemeal. The links on the web break one at a time because somebody's site goes down. So broadly, the web itself is resilient and anti-fragile, if, if you like that term, in that it repairs itself. What happens is someone says, oh, I can make this single site stronger by just putting everything in one place and doing a good job of it. Um, so they, they build up that place, and that place becomes a useful place. But in effect, they're creating fragility debt. Um, what happens is, um, at some point, their business model will fail. They'll have some management collapse some other thing will happen, and that company will vanish, and suddenly all that fragility happens in one spot, and we lose all of GeoCities overnight, for example. So th there's, um, the, one of the challenges of this centralization decentralization thing is that um, as, people, as these services take off and get network effects, they're building up the possibility of a site death that will take out a big chunk of the web in one go, and then it takes us a while to rebuild that again. So, how do, how do your distributed systems defend us against that, effectively? We're just going to start duetting here, because we need more microphones. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I think the lesson from the GitHub topic is that uh, the, the links matter. It's really important that the decentralization start at the layer of the URL. 
and that's what um, all of the keynotes this morning were mostly about. Um, and that's something that the Tahoe technology has always been about. The Tahoe LAFS URLs are the focus of the um, integrity and resilience of the, of the Tahoe architecture. Yeah, I mean, it's really important to distinguish between Git and GitHub. So GitHub's a lovely user interface. They give, they give great service right. in terms of providing that, that um, may not be the, best example, the yeah. hosting of data. But Git is pretty decentralized. And so actually, compared to Facebook, which does not have decentralized underlying data hosting, yes. then it would be a real pain um, uh, with Facebook to move to some other social network, as we all know. I'm sure it does have decentralized underlying data storage, just that the rest of the world's uh, excluded from being able to access it. Uh, I would call that distributed rather than decentralized. So decentralized, okay. yeah. So uh, in the long run, what we are really talking about is about like the user experience and the developer experience, right? So when we talk about decentralized versus centralized, we really want to provide our users with the capabilities that we provide. When they access our app, they want to access the app independently of the network that they are present on. And when we are developers, when we are uh, business owners, we want to provide this capability and we want to make sure that they can access it at any point in time. And the fact is that the web and the while the web works today doesn't provide enough uh, robustness, like enough resilience for our services to run independently on how the users are connected. We are very used to have access to the web in very fast networks and very connected networks. But when we move to a more disconnected environment where the latency is high or the servers that are providing these services are just very far, then the experience just crashes. And I think that's part of why the web is losing on mobile. That's is true. losing? Is losing on mobile. And IoT, which is completely excluded, right? Well, I mean, but it's not losing on mobile to another distributed system. It's, um, and I can argue, we can no, argue about which point. Yeah. But what, what actually each app is building is effectively a little browser that only works on one website and manages its own caching. Uh, it's not, the apps aren't decentralized, but I think they have superior UX in terms of networking the, than the web does. This is starting to change, though. I mean, the, the web standardization process is, is going to always be slower than something that a private company can you know, push out without, you know, talking to others, but uh, there, there are starting to be solutions like Service Worker in the browser does yes. allow you to build uh, offline web apps, web apps that uh, work without an internet connection that, um, you know, are very competitive with native apps. Okay. So, so but I agree with what David said, let me Sorry. interrupt, uh, that it's the UX that's the important thing about decentralization versus centralization. It's the, what will determine whether it succeeds well, or not. The UX is the important thing about all of these things. I, I mean, one of the reasons that you know, we lose that with the distributed social networks lost out to the centralized ones was that the UX was um, both more coherent because you weren't having to make choices, but also they iterated really well, and one of them won. Um, I think that decentralization versus centralization has, has, is essentially orthogonal to um, bad UX versus good UX. I know many centralized systems that have absolutely awful UX. No, but the, well, so the point is how you get from a, um, one of the network effects of we have a large number of competing things in the marketplace. So, you know, my example would be social networks, because I worked on open social at Google, so I have the scars, um, where we tried very hard to build um, an open protocol that you could write an application against and run it in one of 20 or 30 different social networks or anyone who invented the, the protocols. And um, what we found was that kind of worked, but each of the, each of the silos wanted to make it their own one special. Um, and Facebook was big enough to say, we don't care, use our API instead, and we'll give you extra suites and, and access to more users as a developer if you do that. And gradually, the other social networks were outcompeted by that, that user experience. So perhaps that's more about trying to take something that is fundamentally uh, already centralized, which is to say an oligopoly, and apply some form of um, open platform system on top of that, rather than actually re-engineering the system to be decentralized. And that's fair. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, but, that's but how I opened. I said we were building on the structures we had. Um, we built, you know, we built OAuth as part of that process to say I want to trust one silo to talk to another silo, but that didn't give the same distributed trust of I want to spawn a process that can talk to another process anywhere that, that's closer to the, the original web. I think that um, 
one of the things, uh, well, why don't you talk about the, fu the funding? That's a really um, good point right here, I think. I think that the important difference is that Facebook, that Facebook's centralized social networking site is massively profitable. And I think that the reason it's massively profitable is because it's excludable. And that being centralized allows you to exclude people so you can make a profit. And I think that's why it has better UX. So I think it's very, very important. I think it's much more important than the other issues about networking, latency, and bandwidth, and availability, and having the user has to make choices. Those are all relevant, uh, but I think the important thing is that you can pour more and more money into improving it. You can overcome all of those other things with enough money. But by, by exclude, you mean uh, Facebook can say, uh, we are going to be the only ones who show ads on Facebook.com exactly. and our Facebook app. Or you know, if you're GitHub, for example, we're going to be we're going to charge you if you want to keep your code private on our site. Yeah. And then that allows you to take your profits yeah, GitHub's, and reinvest it back into GitHub's your platform. More, more usable and better because it can exclude people, so it can charge money for the people that it lets in. So that's well, a big challenge for There's a different nuance between the model. But yeah, so, so the, well, then the, the, let me turn that back around and say, so how do you make your systems excludable so that they can, or how do, can other people build excludable things on them so that I they can become rich too? I don't know, because I don't want exclusivity, yeah. right? I right. don't want people to, like, large fractions or the vast majority of all humanity to be excluded from something. Uh, but we can't ignore the fact that that's what makes those things successful versus their competitors. So I, one mm -hmm. possibility that I don't know is um, new, some kind of vague but exciting new business models that are decentralized from because they don't have the option of excluding people, and so they're forced to figure something else out. And Ethereum is the leader of that. There are all kinds of crazy experiments about how humans can organize uh, without being able to simply control a, a, a central walled garden. Do you have some examples for us, Gavin, that could, could um, well, explain that to I think, a general I think audience? Firstly, I'd make a, a small point that um, you know, successful things like Facebook actually had a good UI before they had vast profits and, and, and advertising revenue. That's because they had investment to build a good UI because the investors thought they would make vast profits. So I remember a circa 97 Google site that had one search box. It had a vastly better UI than Alta Vista, which was the major competitor at the time. Mm. And that was before they had enough, enough money to put anything other than a search box on their page, apparently. But, but the, the point is still that if I go to a venture capitalist and I say, I have this, this great idea to build this thing that's going to help the world, and I don't want to have any control over it. I don't want to have any points in the system at all at which I can exert some control, uh, you know, some lever. They're not going to fund me. They're not going to give me money. You know what? Some of them are. Yeah. There's these venture capitalists that are funding these entirely decentralized systems, notably USV, if you are into the venture capital social scene, um, who funded Open Bazaar, which is an entirely decentralized uh, like variant of eBay. And that kind of blows my mind. Oh, we're almost out of time. But that will be we only have? one of the factors, right? Like, we have to be aware of all of the unfair advantages that the centralized systems had from the beginning. For example, when the internet and the web came along, uh, we kind of enforced ourselves to accept these layers of trust known as firewalls that stopped us from communicating from, to each other. Like, it, it's now impossible for me to co connect directly to my neighbor's house, even if like, the, I share the same infrastructure. I have a direct cable, but still I cannot dial to those machines because the web, the web was designed for me to dial not only to a centralized system, but a centralized and publicly accessible, that everyone had to go through these gateways. So when building peer-to-peer -peer applications, we are in an, like, they have an unfair advantage against us because the primitives to build centralized applications were way more polished and way more available from the beginning. And OK. Well. I'd like to invite questions from the audience now, if people want to come up. Um, I would gently push back against that. The web was not designed to be centralized, but the infrastructure for routing the web was designed to be centralized. The web was designed to let you have servers anywhere, as was IP itself. But the infrastructure we've inherited was built around that client-server asymmetric up-down model. By design, but today okay. we cannot like, host services from our homes, for example. Yeah, I, I agree with David, actually, because if you you know, if, you, if you're uh, writing a, uh, you're trying to write a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized application that runs in, in the browser, up until recently, up until the advent of, of WebRTC, um, you were forced to 
any, any network communication back, you do, yeah. you have to talk to an HTTP uh, endpoint, and that's going to be a server with a public IP. It's not going to be you know, his laptop who's you know, right. sitting right next to me. I have to talk to a server, to, and then the server has to talk to him, and that's how we can talk to each other. We have to go through this, this intermediary that could be you know, in Virginia or whatever, even though we're sitting next to each other, right? I, I'd agree with that. I think uh, the centralization that's, that's in there by design is the fact that you need a web server. OK. But, but the, the, the point is that you can no longer run on your own machine. But OK, let's go to questions from the audience. Yeah, I, I think this leads decently off of what you were just saying, because I think a lot of the tools that you're building work well together. We could pretty much have a uh, video hosting site where the address is IPFS, and you know, the back end is WebTorrent, and the name resolution is Ethereum, and then you pay with Zcash. But that initial URL is to go to a normal web browser, uh, like we saw earlier, right? You have to go to, uh, right now, an IPFS node. Right, which means like you have like a trusted node, which is basically what you were just saying. So, would you would you uh, say that we kind of need like maybe a browser standard around uh, IPFS or like some kind of decentralized resolution where you you're basically requesting a static resource, maybe with an agreed upon name scheme, uh, because that's what it would take for a normal browser to adopt a resolution to these kinds of distributed resources. Um, so several things like one of the first is that although the demo from Brewster, he had to go through the, this gateway, this IPFS node that he installed on his machine, that is not 100% true anymore because it's possible to have these protocols implemented on the platform that we are uh, trying to execute them. So it is now today possible to run an IPFS node fully on the browser just by loading a JavaScript asset as you would load for any other web page. And as that is possible for IPFS. That applies to any of the other protocols that's being developed by the panel. And All right. <laughs> okay. Hi. There's been a lot of talk this morning about uh, decentralization and self-archiving webs and a lot of content being distributed over lots of nodes in a network. Can you guys express any of your thoughts about who actually pays for all of this? Because I, I run a startup, and we have a pretty expensive web hosting bill. And I would love to be able to dump that onto somebody else. But <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think you guys are volunteering or creating technology that allows other people to pay for my expenses. So the idea that you can just have magical content in the internet, that's you just pay for it to be there once. It's there permanently. It's immutable. And you never have to pay for it again, no matter how many times people access it, seems to me to be an idea that people have about the decentralized web, but it's a mistaken idea. Obviously, it can't be true, so why don't you guys educate us on who pays for all this stuff? Well, one core, core idea I'd like to do that is, is to just try to align incentives of people in the system. So a really simple example is, is in BitTorrent, where uh, in order to access the content while you're doing that, you, you have to share with others in order to uh, in order for them to even cooperate with you. There's a tit for tat, but we need more complex solutions that these guys can talk about to do it for other, in, in other situations. Yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, um, users basically sell their identity and their, their advertising space on their screens um, in order to pay for the, uh, the servers that, that serve them the content, right? Or provide the applications. Um, I think in the future, maybe users will have the option of uh, maybe they'll, they'll ha have the advertising space and they'll be able to sort of, um, through micropayments, give back to the applications that they're using in order to, uh, from, the, from the, the revenue that these advertising uh, things generate. But also maybe they'll, um, um, this bandwidth will come from uh, the user's own machines. So like with BitTorrent, um, aligning interests. Maybe in this case the, uh, the interests will be um, aligned essentially through the user uh, taking payment um, for uh, sort of micro provision of, of bandwidth by hosting various applications and content on their own machine, and then that, th that those micro payments will then be going back to the uh, to the applications in order for whatever to, for them to actually uh, build their services and provide it. So. And and remember that like one of the things that Bitcoin taught us was that like it is possible to put value on the network and to create incentives that will uh, convince people to uh, provide. Uh, computation and storage to the network and instead of having to resource to a centralized service that was going to be way more expensive, we can reuse the machines that we already have available 
uh, to feed these uh, resources to the network. And by doing that, reducing a lot the cost uh, of running these services on the network. Uh, you can definitely incentivize file storage uh, on the network uh, by paying some amount of money to the nodes that have the file available and by checking that you can retrieve the files from them. And uh, that's something that we as the IPFS community are also working on. Uh, the name of that project is Filecoin. And yeah, worth checking out. Yeah. I'm going to answer two. You're getting okay. four answers because it was a really good question. And I, all three of those answers I also think are valid. Um, but there's a model which is that the payment for the hosting is the same as the current model. So you pay because it's your website. But we can use cryptography to make it so that the hosting doesn't, that, that you're not, the person that you're, the, the company that you're relying on for web hosting, you are not vulnerable to that company for the possibility that they could spy on your content or inject ads into your content or um, uh, if a hacker takes over that company, they can put malware into that content or anything like that. We can use cryptography to separate the security and the, the strength of the links from the hosting. Uh, okay. So it seems to me that any kind of consensus process has a fundamental scaling limit beyond which it starts to appear to be centralized. And you can get around that kind of issue uh, by creating multiple consensus processes. That's sort of what Ethereum is trying to do with its sharding solution. And my question is mostly directed to Gavin Wood. Um, in Bitcoin, one of the major reasons for Bitcoin's success and its still current status as a decentralized system is the fact that it actually has thin clients. Thin clients are a way to access blockchains in a decentralized manner and in a secure manner without having to bear the costs of running uh, an entire node yourself. Ethereum, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question is, is Ethereum, to my current knowledge, is uh, still lacking uh, a thin client protocol or an implementation of one. And I'm wondering uh, what the status on that is, if that's going, if, if, if there's any progress being made on that. Um, yeah, I'll answer it quickly. I know we're running out of time. So the, uh, the Go team already have a prototype of a thin client. Um, I believe they're planning a release, a, a, a very early sort of alpha release for that quite soon. Um, uh, my own team, uh, the Parity team, uh, working on um, a sort of hybrid client that would be uh, sit halfway between a full client and a thin client. Uh, that would um, synchronize very quickly, use very little resources, but, but still not be quite um, uh, at that point the sort of thing that actually might be quite reasonable for desktop users, though perhaps less so for, uh, for mobile users. So it is coming along. Um, because Ethereum is an application platform, very generalized, the problems uh, with doing thin client technology are, are greatly magnified. Um, uh, when you have a, a very single specific application used for a blockchain like Bitcoin, um, you can you can get away with relatively simple architecture for doing all the thin client stuff. So uh, that's why it's taking a bit longer. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So thanks, guys, for putting uh, pointing the elephant out in the room, which is that centralization allows toll booths. Toll booths produce revenue. Revenue produces businesses. I have to ask you to take this question to them at lunch in the science okay. fair. Yes. So okay. Thank Talk you. to me about that. Okay, yes. so uh, you know, I'd like to um, wrap up now, thank these guys. They will all be at the science fair, um, so you can ask them the detailed technical questions about their protocols there. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for Kevin Marks, IndieWeb, for David Diaz, IPFS, for, uh, I'm going to just call you Faras, Faras of um, WebTorrents, Zuka Wilcox of Zcash, and Tahoe Laughs and Dr. Gavin Wood here from London of Ethcore and Ethereum. Let's hear it for these guys. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to ask our next panelist to go up and get mic'd. And while we're doing that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. And this is the only thing between us and lunch. So thank you so much for your energy, your questions. Uh, we have one more panel, and then we're going to head to lunch. So they're going to go on up and get set while we're doing that. 
I do want to mention that all of those incredible engineers, developers who are on the stage will be very available at lunch at these tables outside for one-on-one -on -one questionings and demos. Two, they are all giving lightning talks tomorrow, five-minute expositions of their technology followed by questions, and some of them are even giving 90-minute workshops tomorrow. So if you really want to dig into Ethereum or uh, web torrents, you have so many more opportunities. And it is free, Brewster says. Tomorrow is a meetup, so anyone can come. No tickets required. We'll still feed you uh, pizzas and beers, I think. So uh, please encourage everyone to come. OK, going up on stage, we have a great panel for you. We have Jeremy Rand of Namecoin, Joachim Lokomp of Yolakom here from Berlin, Muneeb Ali getting some water with Blockstack and also Christopher Allen of Boxstream, and they are being led by the very able Chelsea Barabas. She's from the MIT Center for Civic Media. That's the, the great think tank run by our friend Ethan Zuckerman. So Ethan, I hope you're watching out there, because Ethan and Chelsea are very concerned. They're worried about the increasing centralization and what that means when we mediate our lives through these central corporate sites. So they have created something called a web of our own. You're going to hear more about that from Chelsea later, but these guys are going to tell you about naming and user identities. Take it away, Chelsea. OK. Good morning. How's everybody doing? So this is going to be a really fun panel, I think. Um, you know, just to, by way of background, um, we've been talking a lot about you know the transformations we'd seen um, with the web over the last 20 years, and we've really seen it transform from this kind of esoteric system for publishing technical notes to really being kind of a bedrock for a lot of what we do with commerce and education and social interaction today. Um, and a lot of that has really been facilitated and driven by the rise of services that make the web easier to use. So hosting platforms, publishing platforms that make really any everyday person um, somebody who can very easily kind of interact with and share content, um, look at content online, which has been awesome. Um, but at the same time, kind of the rise of these services has also driven this rise in centralization we keep talking about. Um, so most people in this group, I think, probably take at face value kind of this premise that, you know, centralization is kind of a bad thing in and of itself. But for a lot of people outside of this room, that's not going to be very intuitive to talk about. People aren't going to, you know, getting behind this banner of re-decentralizing the web anytime soon. Um, but if you talk about something maybe with your more politically oriented friends around censorship uh, in China or Russia, that might, you know, start ringing some bells. Um, but what we've found, you know, personally in my own work too, is if, if you start talking about something like identity theft, the fastest growing crime in the world, how many people in this room have been impacted by identity theft in some form or fashion? Most people have, one in three Americans have been directly kind of victims of identity theft. Um, I only have the stats for the US, but I can only imagine it's worse uh, or about the same abroad. Um, and a lot of that is really tied to the way that um, we've thought about um, handling and managing identity and naming on the web. Um, over the last couple of decades. We've got some of the people who are kind of on the front lines of thinking about how we could reimagine doing this kind of moving forward. And I'm going to give just some introductions um, of these guys. Uh, on the far left, your left, I guess, we've got Christopher Allen, um, one of the OGs in the room, somebody who's been kind of on the frontiers fighting and thinking about this stuff for a very long time. Um, I, we were talking, he's got a diverse set of interests, you know, everything from kind of like online gaming to kind of playing, are they called hand drums, hand pan drums? So if you guys want to like jam after this, he might be the person to go to. Uh, but you know, kind of the thing that kind of ties all these things together is this idea of kind of fostering collaboration and kind of um, uh, grassroots-driven kind of communities and things like that. We've got Mo Muneeb Ali right here in the middle. Um, works on Blockstack. Um, Muneeb was actually a PhD student at Princeton, kind of left a few, a couple years ago now, I guess, to work on Blockstack. Um, about a year ago, he went back to Princeton to kind of do um, a presentation on the progress they'd made on their, um, their project, which we'll learn about later. Uh, and his advisor actually said, uh, I'm going to make a public bet saying that Muneeb's not going to come back. He's not going to finish his PhD because this project is so interesting. Actually, Muneeb's finishing, defending in about a month or so. Let's give him a round of applause. So you don't have to drop out of college to save the world. So, so, so uh, maybe that was a Jedi mind trick he was trying to do. Like. <laughs> Um, next to me, we've got um, Joachim here. Uh, Joachim 
also used to be a pilot uh, before he did this um, and has been kind of at the forefront of kind of working on collaborative economies, uh, been a leader of a group called WeShare uh, based in Europe, I think, but has spread kind of globally, is working on a program called Jolocom, Yolocom, something like this. Uh, and then here um, closest to me is Jeremy Rand, who is one of the um, longest, most active members of a project called Namecoin. So we're going to be learning about all of these today. And maybe just to kick it off, I'm going to ask you guys first, let's start with problems. And I'd like to start with concrete, kind of intuitive problems. I'd love to go down the row and ask each of you to kind of give us one very brief anecdote that kind of illustrates some of the challenges we're facing today around naming an identity on the web. Um, and then I'm going to follow up with that to ask you to please just give us two or three sentences specifically on your project and how it maybe um, is trying to address that problem. So Jeremy, we can start with you. Uh, yeah, so I guess one of the uh, examples that I tell people when I'm trying to explain why Namecoin and naming generally matters um, is HTTPS. I'm sure you guys all use it. Uh, it's very centralized. There are these corporations called certificate authorities, and they are involved in certifying that a website really is who they says they are. And if a certificate authority either gets compromised or gets coerced or just is evil, um, they can issue false certificates, and these can let websites be impersonated. And this has actually happened. Uh, there was one really high-profile case a few years ago. Um, a large certificate authority got compromised. The IP address who did the compromise traced to Iran. It may have been Iranian intelligence. Um, and the certificates that were fraudulently issued uh, were for uh, uh, websites such as Google, Mozilla, Skype, Gmail, um, uh, lots of things that you really do not want Iranian intelligence agencies, or for that matter, any intelligence agency to be able to impersonate at will. Um, and the certificates that were issued were found to be in use uh, on an Iranian web server. And the certificate authority that was compromised did not notice that any of this had happened for over a month. And I think that's really problematic. And uh, Namecoin and naming systems in general that are more secure, uh, I think, can uh, make this kind of attack a lot more difficult. Um, OK, do you want me to talk about my thing now as well? Yeah, sure. Just like one or two sentences about Namecoin. Sure. Be um, yeah, so Namecoin is a modified version of Bitcoin, which basically repurposes Bitcoin to be used as a naming system rather than a currency. Uh, its most common use right now is as a decentralized DNS system. Um, and I think it's uh, more uh, suitable um, than the traditional DNS system because uh, when uh, the attacks such as you know, imp uh, fraudulently uh, falsifying records um, it, with Namecoin, that's basically equivalent to attacking Bitcoin, stealing Bitcoin, which is very difficult. Yes, so um, how we look at it, it's like, you know, centralization, a big problem is the fight over data. So we have uh, a couple of big platforms that congregate as much data as possible. And um, there might be many, many cool services out there that we want to use, but our data sits with um, some of these huge third-party platforms and we cannot use these services. So what we build is... Um, a, a multi-purpose client um, for the social link data graph, or also known as SOLID. It's a W3C uh, standard developed by Tim Berners-Lee and his team. And what it does is that it decouples data and the application, and at its core is a user identity that provides authentication and um, control over the data. Yeah, so uh, one problem that, you know, kind of like stuck with me was um, I was actually sitting at a presentation by David Clark, the chief protocol architect of the internet. I think, Brewster, you should definitely try to get him here on the, on the next one. And he was kind of like looking back at what uh, the internet like should have been uh, or what went wrong. 
and he did this thought exercise that I think you guys should also do uh, right now that uh, let's say you just want to go to Facebook and you launch your browser. Uh, in the time between you launch your browser and you type in facebook.com and you actually log in, how many trust points are actually there? How many parties and organizations are actually involved in that simple step that you do every day that you're just blindly trusting? That yes, all of this are my trusted parties and now I can, and, and all you're trying to do is like, uh, I just want to know what my friends are up to. So, and that list turned out to be more than 10. Right. And so something is wrong with the picture when you are trusting people that don't, you don't even know exist. Right. So uh, our work with Blockstack kind of like goes back to uh, uh, this notion that to really decentralize the web, you need to decentralize these trust points which are currently inside this like big bubble and you don't even know about them. So what we are doing is that we are actually building this layer by layer that first there's naming, then there's identity, and, and, and so on and so forth. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about it later. Uh, but it's a production system. We've actually been running it for more than two years. Uh, recently, actually, Microsoft publicly announced that they are putting their weight behind this technology. Uh, they're going to help and develop it. And I, I, I'd love to talk more about it later on. My name is Christopher Allen. I've um, been trying to s address and solve these problems for a long time. I'm the co-author of TLS, and I can tell you stories about how that was an attempt to uh, break some of the centralization that existed before. So centralization as a way of creeping in. Every new generation, there's a new kind of centralization that we have to worry about. The, we've got a lot of first world problems that we've talked about here. Um, but I'm also very concerned about um, uh, the underprivileged and where they fall and the issues that they have with identity. Um, I teach in an MBA program, and one of my students went to Afghanistan to help young women become uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so she's you know, out there where you know, every few days there's a bomb or whatever, and she's dealing with a population that is, um, has a lot of issues with, uh, you know, leaders and other different communities saying, no, you can't do this. You can't participate in, in our uh, world economy. Um, so she's teaching them how to use uh, smartphones and other types of devices. Uh, but there's a real risk that the uh, uh, Afghan authorities or various tribes um, will abuse this information. Another story, um, I'm involved with ID2020, which is a UN event that happened last month, the first one on uh, digital identity at the New York uh, headquarters. And uh, a, a, a service organization that works with refugees said that they had this wonderful um, facility that was warm and beds and dry and whatever, but it required a handprint to get in the facility and they had refugees that were basically uh, living in tents in the mud instead because they feared that if the, if the Syrians knew that the, the Syrian government knew that they were there, that they then may go persecute their um, loved ones back at home. Um, so the whole, they were just very, very fearful of, of uh, that identity information being uh, abused and taken back uh, for human rights abuse. I mean, the root of all of this is, you know, um, you know, back in the 1930s, Holland had the best civil service administration uh, in the world. Um, they really were able to take care of their citizens and deal with a lot of different types of issues uh, that the government um, uh, in a uh, 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 you know northern European country wanted to do. They were invaded by the Germans, and as a consequence, more Jews. Uh, homosexuals, gypsies, etc., died as a percentage of population in Holland than they did in Germany, because they had all these wonderful records on everybody and who knew who. And you know, one of the first things the Germans did was they went into every uh, temple uh, and grabbed all the temple records uh, so they could grab things. And so today we actually know more about some of the the Jewish temples before the World War II because the Germans grabbed it all and took it back with them and preserved it. Um, so these are some of the kinds of problems that I think uh, we also have to worry about, and I do believe there are solutions for. But I just want to say, 
this also illustrates how hard these solutions are. Great, thanks guys. I think you've all really highlighted how important this is beyond just you know preventing your little brother from signing into your Facebook account and writing something embarrassing on your wall. So um, the breadth and depth of this problem and topic is, is quite significant. Uh, Chris, I'm wondering if we can ask you though to kind of help give us a historical perspective on this. So what were some of the early decisions that um, we were making in the early days of the web that really kind of shaped the way we think about naming an identity today. And then can, can you walk us through a, some of the conversations? This conversation also isn't new, right? How have we been, how has our thinking on this evolved over time? Um, and what are, you know, the, the big challenges we've kind of seen pop up as we've tried to give more user control and agency uh, in this equation? Sure. So I'll, I'll start back with uh, sort of my roots with uh, TLS. Um, there, were a lot of comp there was a lot of competition for TLS. It was not clear that it was going to be the winner in the standards war. At that particular point, Visa and MasterCard had joined separate efforts together to basically do this. An entrenched patent holder um, basically had given a free license for yet another standard. And Microsoft had done their um, typical embrace and extend strategy where they had something that was just different enough that they could control it. So a lot of what allowed the community that built TLS um, to be uh, successful was a story about decentralization, that we were basically not having one ring rule them all. Um, that you know, basically you could choose what certificate authority you wish to use. It was up to you. Um, you could turn on and off different types of things, you know, what is nowadays called trust agility. Um, well, we did succeed in that. It's the world's broadest deployed security standard, but centralization has cropped in again. We have fewer browsers. The browsers, be to make it easy for us, give us less flexibility about um, uh, turning on and off various certificate authorities. It's hard to understand. Uh, and even like, I, uh, there was one browser where when you removed the certificate authority through some arcane thing, it would basically restore it the next uh, time you did an update. Um, so centralization creeps in, and I think this has been you know, the ongoing story. Uh, uh, Passport was an attempt by Microsoft to, to be federated so that we could have these silos that could talk to an, each other, but then nobody wanted Microsoft once again to be kind of the master of those silos, so the Liberty Alliance was created, and uh, uh, you know, that was basically, then corporations could do it, but it didn't have individuals as kind of um, uh, peers in a sense. It was only corporations could be members of Liberty Alliance. So in 2000, a group of people started working on uh, um, the identity, uh, it was uh, the Internet Identity Workshop and uh, Identity Commons formed to try to address some of these things, to allow people to be peers with corporations and do federation this way. Uh, but once again, um, I mean, out of that OpenID, OAuth, a lot of the standards that you use today are there. But if you look at Twitter's um, sign-on, you look at Facebook uh, 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 federated signs, they're effectively um, using OpenID style uh, work and, and OAuth. So what, what happened was an attempt to make us all be equals and be peers, well, they decide, well, we're only going to do half of it. We're going to make other, allow other people to use our stuff, but we're not going to allow other people to use our stuff. So again, centralization creeped in. Great, yeah. And so maybe Joachim and Jeremy, if you guys could speak a little bit, you know, Chris just outlined for us, you know, kind of this cycle we seem to be going through, the decentralization back to centralization, decentralization back through. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, what new technologies or developments are you guys seeing kind of on the horizon now that makes you think we might be able to break this cycle and, and kind of achieve what Brewster's been alluding to in terms of actually locking the web open um, at this layer? Um, what, what, are, what specific kind of things drew you guys to this space? And, and what technologies are you using that you think might actually be the tipping point in a way that we haven't been able to achieve in the past? Okay, so <laughs> I think like uh, what I mentioned before, like that the decoupling of uh, data and, uh, and the application is like key because it will be really a liberation um, for services, but also for competing companies and also for developers. 
Um, and sorry, what do we need to decouple uh, data from the, from the applications that use it? So right now, when you look at a platform like Facebook, you have like um, uh, the, uh, your user profile or identity, mm -hmm. um, the application and the database all tied into one block, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, prevents people from using other services. And for instance, when uh, or even losing their complete data and their identity if the service closes down or if uh, the service closes your account, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what's new? What's, uh, you guys mentioned using Solid. Like, what is Solid providing you guys that... Um, so um, as Tim Berners-Lee earlier also uh, explained, it's like basically um, uh, the, the data mm -hmm. is not tied to the application. You just have your data somewhere and you can um, exchange the, the, the application at any time. So you get the best application out there or the one that you like the most, mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about your data. And, um, but this also, you know, it's, it's like for personal use cases, but um, it really becomes also important for um, uh, initiatives in the sharing and collaborative ec economy because data is not um, locked into uh, silos where it's stuck. It can be used in... Um, uh, or reused uh, for, for different purposes. And this is like um, something where data actually become a commons instead of that they are locked in into a silo. Okay, great. Moody, did you want to jump yeah, in? This, yeah, this is a great question, so I wanted to like comment on it. Uh, so this is definitely a cycle in the sense of, you know, like decentralization and centralization. You can think of this as a pendulum, keeps swinging like from one side to the other side. And uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is not the first wave, right? Like in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were a lot of excitement in peer-to-peer -peer systems, right? And, and there are only few survivors, and they're actually sitting here, like BitTorrent is one, uh, Tor is another, right? Uh, and then there is a graveyard of dead projects. Like if you think that you're trying to decentralize DNS now, people were trying to do it back then as well using P2P. If you think you're trying to decentralize storage now, people were exactly trying to do these exact same things earlier as well. And literally there's a graveyard of these dead projects. And it, as a community, I think it's important for us to ask that question that what has changed? What makes us think that we can be successful now when we weren't earlier? And for me, the biggest thing that has happened since then, and that was kind of like a trigger, is actually Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin has solved a very hard computer science problem, and its public infrastructure has been running for seven years. There is a multi-billion dollar bounty on finding bugs in Bitcoin. Like, you can actually just go and steal money if there are actual problems with it. Uh, and what Bitcoin really solves is that if you, even if you take something as simple as logging into something, uh, you have to start somewhere, right? Who do you trust initially? Like, where do you start? That's where these companies c come in, that they will be like, yeah, I just use Twitter's OAuth, right? And you can start from here. So Bitcoin actually gives you that neutral playing field that we never had. No one owns it. It's a neutral playing field. You can start off from there. You can have your public keys, private key mapping mapped on the blockchain. And from there, you can actually build these decentralized systems. So for me, that's the single most important thing that has happened and which gives us hope that we can get it right this time around. Yeah, and to build on what uh, Munib said, um, there have been lots of attempts in the past to replace the certificate authority system that HTTPS uses. Um, and I think one of the really big problems with all of those attempts so far, things like Dane, which stores the the data in the DNS system rather than with uh, certificate authorities or things like convergence which use trust agility. The problem that they all have is they just shuffle around the trust of third parties. They don't actually remove the third party trust. And what, the, what Bitcoin really innovated on here is Bitcoin gives us a method of just getting rid of that third party trust completely. Um, and so I think that's a really, that's a game changer, I think. 
Great, that's um, very helpful. Manube, I want to jump back to you too. So you, you guys with Blockstack have kind of gone through some evolutions in how you even kind of conceptualize the role of the blockchain in your solution. So you guys initially started on Namecoin, you've since moved to Bitcoin, but also kind of building in this kind of agnosticism to the systems that you're designing uh, so that you have some flexibility moving forward that can kind of match the changes in this ecosystem as it grows. Can you just kind of walk us through some of that? Like, you know, how, do, how we kind of move from this general kind of uh, inclination to throw stuff on the blockchain to what you have today? Yeah, yeah, uh, actually, I think maybe I had a slide uh, that we can display. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I can control that or not. Sure. Uh, let, let's see if we get it. But uh, basically, Oops. if you look at this, it's very interesting that this is uh, the CTO of Amazon, Werner Vogels. And this is an account that he made on our system, uh, on Blockstack. It just looks like any website, right? Like an about.me kind of a page. The interesting thing about this website is that he owns his name, Werner.id, like, kind of like a domain name built on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. And to change even a single character, you will have to take down Bitcoin, which costs like a couple of billion dollars, right? There is no company in the middle. Uh, with that private key, Werner directly owns this profile. He can actually log into systems, like a new website, by just proving, by just signing a quick message that, hey, I'm the owner of, of Werner.id, right? And, and this is live. This is in production. So we already have these abilities. And uh, the question was about how our thinking has changed. So I, w I, I think that's a very, very uh, interesting question that um, theoretically we might think that certain things are, are possible or interesting. I actually am a firm believer in uh, building production systems. And this is where you know, the rubber actually meets the road. And you find out problems that you weren't thinking about initially. So one of the things that we learned is that we can't tie ourselves to any particular blockchain. Like if you're thinking of building like a self-archiving internet which should be there forever, we should design it in a way that it can run when Bitcoin fails, right? Or any other blockchain fails. So the architecture has to be designed that way. Uh, another thing that, that, that uh, we learned was you have to pay attention to the UX issues and performance issues from the get-go, right? People are not going to stop using the existing systems if your performance is worse or if your user interface is worse, right? It actually has to be better, right? And building these, these, these data center-based systems is actually hard enough. Like, talk to Facebook engineers or Google engineers, and they will tell you what, what what hard work they actually do to make those things scale. When you try to build the same performance in a decentralized world, it actually becomes like much, much harder. Right? So from, from a technical perspective, scaling these systems is actually harder, but it's, it's, it's worth uh, uh, fighting that fight. Great. I'm going to invite people to come up for questions. We're almost running out of time. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask one more question, which is, you know, a lot of what you guys are talking about um, does have a direct impact on the way, you know, uh, web companies and other startups are going to think about the cost benefit uh, analysis of their, their business model and things like that. Um, in your experiences so far, have people perceived this, uh, this push for decentralization of identity as a threat or as um, a value added thing they'd love to see kind of on the market? Um, not everybody has to speak, but if you've got you know particular insight well, on that, I mean, we have we have a challenge in our industry, which is Metcalfe's law. Metcalfe's law is really old; it goes back to the original Ethernet. The more people that are on a network, the more valuable the network becomes in excess of the size of the net of the the growth. Um, what we're seeing now is that the big players, once you reach a certain threshold, don't really want to participate because they basically already won in some fashion. So it, in every generation for the last you know, 20, 25 years, it's always been the upstarts, the ones that are basically trying to uh, be the next uh, Google, the next Uber, the next whatever. 
Um, they, so we are seeing a lot of interest from these new innovative companies. Uh, we're seeing less interest, of course, from the Googles, the Facebooks. Uh, we have to find out ways to do that. In, in Bitcoin, we get very concerned about any party having uh, more than 50% control. Now, some of that's mathematical, but it's not just about mathematical. Um, you know, we basically have one code base. Ultimately, we don't want to have um, a single code base for things. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on right now called Liquid, we actually are not allowing uh, a, any processor to have more than 50% of the motherboards. I mean, that's how level, that's the level of concern that we're having. And as a culture, we may need to do things where we say, you know, things can be too big, just like we're saying in the financial system. Great. Okay, we've got six people standing in six minutes, so we're going to try to make really incisive, succinct answers to your questions, and we're going to have short questions too, right? Cool. Okay. Okay, uh, so this question is for uh, Jeremy and Muneeb. Uh, specifically, uh, how do you guys propose dealing with things like fraud or abuse or a misplaced private key? Um, you know, for example, if like a user you know forgets their credentials, is there any way that they can get their identity restored, or do they just you know lose control of their identity into the ether forever and it's gone? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, okay, so very briefly, if you lose all the private key material that has the ability to update your name, then yeah, you're going to lose it. But there are a lot of technical methods that can be used to reduce the likelihood of that happening. Things like multi-signature uh, addresses, uh, things like cold storage. Um, I think Namecoin is looking at adding revocation keys, so if someone steals your name, you can still revoke it if you notice within a certain period of time. Um, it's not finalized, we're looking at it. Um, so yeah, basically, there are ways to reduce the risk of that happening, but if it does happen, yeah, it, you're, there's not much recourse. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question, right? Uh, so there's an issue of UX, like how do you make users to understand what is this new technology? And, and, and also like the, the, the technical side as well. So basically the approach that we are taking is that you can uh, kind of like ride the wave with the blockchain technology. Like so far, uh, close to like $1.1 .1 billion have been already invested in this space. People are working on hardware wallets, people are wor working on multi-sig, people are working on cold storage. So the world that we imagine is that you can have like five or six parties it could be your ISP, it could be uh, your employer, or your brother, or your wife, or your friend. And you, if you lost your private key, you can actually go back and get the signatures, like two out of five, three out of seven, whatever you are most comfortable with, to restore that, that identity. And it's a very hard problem, but luckily, a lot of people are actually working on it. So I'm the rebooting. Like this answer because he's got actually a very interesting thing to say. So. So I think the future of this. So these are the techniques for right now. I think the future of this is your identity acquires weight. You've collected a social network of just like uh, Werner had all those different attributions that were there. Potentially down the line, if there's a total catastrophe, you've lost your backup keys. Nobody can recover the. F you know, five of the nine keys that you did in some kind of multi-sig, um, that the system can basically go look at the weight of your social network and you can basically back channel to your social network for them to recreate your keys. And I think that in the long term we're going to need those types of things because, you know, keys may not just be lost this way. You know, we've got quantum potentially coming up, other different kinds of attacks. Uh, we may need you know, an ultimate backup. Cool. Let's jump to the next question. Yeah. So you said that um, Bitcoin is secure because if someone breaks it, they can take $5 billion. But m isn't it more like if they break it, they'll just destroy $5 billion? There isn't actually a way for them to steal it They can because it would be fairly obvious very quickly. So, so I, I would say that that's the kind of like what is the attack that you're doing. But uh, what's interesting to see is that there is a public bounty, right? Like. Uh, Let's say that Namecoin is an example. Someone discovered a bug where you could actually steal names, right? If something like that is discovered in the code base or in the design, there's a public bounty on that attack that I can now go and actually steal money from you, right? And if that has not happened for six, seven years, 
it, it actually says that Bitcoin has some sort of an incentive structure going around where it seems to be working, like they have done something right that the system is stable and, and in production. Yeah and, uh, yeah, and to build on that, I think d definitely because Bitcoin has been so massively successful as a uh, decentralized currency that has a really big market cap, I think it definitely does make sense uh, to um, try to uh, keep, um, like if you have the ability to keep your system very similar to Bitcoin, I think it's a very good idea because Bitcoin's code is very well proven. It's very well audited. People audit it all the time. Um, and so you, by using uh, Bitcoin's code as much as possible and their algorithms as much as possible, you gain a lot of practical security from that. All right, we've just got about a minute left. So why don't we take all four questions and then I'm gonna let you guys pick which question to answer as your closing word. One of the more interesting and useful aspects of centralized identity systems is, re is reputation. Um, how can we achieve that kind of aggregated thing in a de decentralized world? Okay. Do you think names for people and names for systems have different properties? Say I have a friend group and we all have a mail server. Does that need to act differently? So right now we address things on the web, like HTTP, waynechain.com, slash wayne.jpg. In a different kind of world, we'd address uh, things on the web in a different way, different types of identifiers. So how do we transition from the way that we do things today to this future? What does that transition look like for developers? So this is the second panel that's brought up the importance of UX uh, and observed that centralized systems often tend to have better UX than decentralized. Can you all think of an example, other than your own, of a truly decentralized system that has truly great UX. Okay, so um, regarding the uh, third question, um, uh, so um, let's see. Um, I guess I couldn't quite understand everything that was said. Is it possible to get a repeat? Um, On the third question? Yeah. Uh, sure, we'll come back to it. Joaquin, you want to answer questioner number three? Do you want to come reiterate? Well, I think it, it was not directly into my domain. Uh, I, I remember that question number three, I can answer it. Uh, okay. So it's basically, uh, the, the question is that people are used to using, let's say, the domain name system or a certain way the websites are. And if you try to replace it, uh, how do you transition over? Uh, my answer is you don't. You try to make the system as similar to DNS as possible, which is exactly what we have done with Blockstack. So we even have the same zone files. So if you just do like pip install block stack, you can do a who is query exactly like DNS. You'll get the same records back. It's like on DNS, you have the .com, .org, .net. Now you have these new TLDs, which are now on a blockchain. So you get a .id, or uh, there are certain companies that we are working with who want to start a namespace for Internet of Things or for uh, software repositories. So these will look very similar to the old system. Um, yeah, so from my perspective, uh, for the third question, um, one of the interesting things that uh, things like Namecoin can be used for uh, quite well is there's a lot of these uh, new um, uh, address schemes, things like uh, ZeroNet, IPFS, um, that use uh, hashes and things like that as the uh, addressing scheme. And things like Namecoin are relatively well suited for adapting those systems so that they're more usable because they have human readable names, but they still have the security of the hash-based uh, addressing behind them. So I think that's actually a fairly good way to transition to new things such as ZeroNet and IPFS as well. Um, I'll talk to the uh, reputation question. So reputation is incredibly hard. It's also incredibly valuable. Um, the, chal the, the challenges that we're already facing that we have to solve with identity, um, in my opinion, maybe be 10% of the challenges when we start talking about reputation. Uh, there's a wonderful book by uh, uh, Randall Farmer on reputation systems uh, that I highly recommend uh, there. I mean, the, the challenges are things like um, people game systems, you know, systems that have negative ratings, people can uh, cheat and abuse the system. So we have to do all this sort of game theory and, and incentive uh, uh, adjustments and dealing with a lot of um, 
of uh, negative consequences with reputation systems. I think it's a, a, an admirable goal. Um, my short-term answer for that is uh, to have self-sovereign reputations, which is if somebody gives me a good rating, I ought to be able to, at my discretion, choose it. It's not perfect, but at least lets it be underneath my control and thus hopefully will be less abused. Great, and we can wrap up with you, Joaquin. You haven't gotten to close, have you? Um, yeah, so uh, I maybe just want to say that um, I see that in the um, attempt to decentralize, there are really um, um, many companies also um, turning open to see the benefits of organizing data in a different way. And um, so we have been talking to banks, we have been talking to energy providers, uh, but also uh, companies in the health sector, and they actually explore uh, how could um, it beneficial to organize data in a decentralized way, and um, also the benefits when users actually own their data. Great, all right. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. I wanna thank Chelsea and also Chris, Munib, Joaquin, and Jeremy. Let's have one last round of applause. Okay, guess what? It is time for science fair and lunch, folks. But two pieces of business. If you are parked in front of our building, please move your car by 3 p.m. so we can put the taco trucks there. You would not want to come between us and your tacos. Also, no food or drink in the great room. And if you have a science fair table, we ask that you go find it now because everyone's going to want to talk to you. See you at 2 o'clock. I had, I had um, updated. My, my slide was updated. I'm not sure that...
Here, Amber, let me put this on your ear. You can pretend to be a Beyonce. Yeah, let me let me just sneeze real quick. And I, uh, you can, you can do on. whatever you want, so. Just, uh, Check one, two, three, four. Hello. Okay, everyone. I want everyone outside to come back inside. Grab a seat. We're going to have a great afternoon. I see lots of great conversations and so many interesting people in the house. I mean, obviously, we have great coders, but Carl Malamud, are you still in the house? <laughs> Carl was in the house. And Wes Boyd, the founder of MoveOn.org, is in the house. Wes, can you wave? There he is. Boy, do we need to move on now. This is the moment, Wes. <laughs> Please. So. The Internet Archive is more than a library. It's always this great place where artists and activists and engineers come and collide. And we have these great collections of things, including something called electric sheep. I wanna, want you to take a look. Electric Sheep realizes the collective dream of sleeping computers from all over the internet. It's a distributed screensaver that harnesses idle computers into a render farm with the purpose of animating and evolving artificial life forms. It's a channel that anyone can tune into and influence. The clients render JPEG frames and upload them to the server. The server collects JPEG frames and compresses them into MPEG. The software is open source and anyone may participate in the network freely and anonymously. Unlike most math art, the colors are not specified with algebraic formulas, but with palettes originally derived algorithmically from scans of famous paintings 
and landscape photography. When the screensaver is active and someone sees a sheep they like, they may vote for it by pressing the up arrow key. By downloading and running the program, a sleeping computer uses Draves' flame algorithm to render fractal images. The images communicate with those created by other users and new artwork is created. Through network rendered animation, the Electric Sheep project gives us an idea of the versatility that lies within a decentralized web. While Draves bred the first sheep, each time someone tinkers with the source code, the new version spreads and the flock flourishes. Let your screensaver come on, you should do the rest. That short film is by the budding filmmaker Christian Vasquez. How about another round of applause for both Scott Traves, one of our great, great contributors, and Christian. You know, you've been so in your head. We've been talking about DNS and identities and ontologies and things like that. But the web is really for more than that. You heard Kyle say it's for fun. It can be for art. It can be for creativity. So we thought to get you out of your head, we would have a little art project going on back there. Andy, can you wave your hand? That's Andy Wong. She's one of my very best friends. And she is creating a collective piece. You're invited to go write a thought, um, collective thought, and we're going to put it together all at the end uh, as a symbol, in a way, of how all of your thoughts, all of your work, all of your collaboration can come together. We're looking for points of intersection, principles we can agree on. That's the goal of this conference. To that end, I want to introduce our next speaker. Now, most of you probably know Corey for his artistic work. He's a great science fiction writer. You probably know his work, Little Brothers. But Corey also has been a longtime activist, employee of EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He returned to them about two years ago to launch his own moonshot project. It's called Apollo 12, and I'm going to let Corey tell you about it. Corey Doctorow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us here, Wendy and Brewster. This is fabulous. Uh, it, it is like being back at the O'Reilly P2P conference in 1999. Uh, some of the same faces, too. So, uh, as you might imagine, I'm here to talk to you about dieting advice. Uh, if you ever want to go on a diet, the first thing you should really do is throw away all your Oreos. Uh, it's um, not that you don't want to lose weight when you raid your Oreo stash in the middle of the night. It's just that the net present value of tomorrow's weight loss is hyperbolically discounted in favor of the carbohydrate rush of tonight's Oreos. Uh, if you're serious about not eating a bag of Oreos, your best bet is to not have a bag of Oreos to eat. Not because you're weak-willed, because you are a grown-up. And once you become a grown-up, you start to understand that there will be tired and desperate moments in your future. And the most strong-willed thing you can do is use the willpower that you have now when you're strong at your best moment to be the best that you can be later when you're at your weakest moment. And this has a name. It's called a Ulysses Pact. Uh, Ulysses was going into siren-infested waters. Those are the sirens. Uh, when you go into siren-infested waters, you should know this is a nautical portion, um, you put wax in your ears so that you can't hear what the sirens are singing, because otherwise you'll jump in the sea and drown. But Ulysses wanted to hear the sirens. And so he came up with uh, a compromise he had his sailors tie him to the mast so that uh, when he heard the call of the sirens, even though he would beg and gibber and ask them to untie him so that he could jump into the sea, he would be bound to the mast and he would be able to sail through the uh, infested waters. And so this is a thing that economists talk about all the time. It's a really critical part of how you build things that work well and fail well. Um, now, you are here to do a hard thing, right? We want to build a web that is decentralized. Uh, and the reason that the web ceases to be decentralized periodically is because it's very tempting to centralize things. There are lots of short-term gains to be had 
from centralizing things. And you want to be your best you. You want to protect your worst you, uh, your best you from your worst you that's coming in the future. Uh, the reason that the web is closed today is that people just like you, the kind of people who were at the P2P conference in 1999, the kind of people who went to Doug Engelbart's demo in 1968, the kind of people who went to the first hackers conference, people just like you made compromises that seemed like the right compromise to make at the time. And then they made another compromise, little compromises, one after another. And as humans, our sensory apparatus is really only capable of distinguishing relative differences. That's, you know, the optical illusion where you put a black thing and a white thing and a gray thing in the middle, and when you cover the black thing, it seems lighter, and the white thing, it seems darker, because we only sense relative differences, not absolute ones. And so when you make a little compromise, the next compromise that you make, you don't compare to where you were when you were fresh and idealistic. You compare it to your originally stained, your, your current stained state. And a little bit more stain hardly makes any difference. One compromise after another. And before you know it, you're suing to make APIs copyrightable, or you're signing your name to a patent on one click uh, purchasing, or you're filing the headers off of a GPL library and hoping no one looks too hard at your binaries, or you're putting a backdoor in your code for the NSA. And the thing is, I am not better than the people who made those compromises, and you are not better than the people who made those compromises. The people who made those compromises discounted the future costs of the present benefits of some course of action because it's easy to understand present benefits and it's hard to remember future costs. You are not weak if you eat a bag of Oreos in the middle of the night. You're not weak if you save all of your friends' mortgages by making a compromise when your business runs out of runway. You're just human and you're experiencing that hyperbolic discounting of future costs because of that immediate reward in the here and now. If you want to make sure you don't eat a bag of Oreos in the middle of the night, make it more expensive to eat Oreos. Make it so that you have to get dressed and find your keys and figure out where the all-night grocery store is and drive there and buy a bag of Oreos. And that's how you help yourself in the future, when, in the moment, when you know what's coming down the road. Um, the answer to not getting pressure from your bosses or your stakeholders or your investors or your members to do the wrong thing later when times are hard is by taking options off the table right now. And now this is a time-honored tradition in all kinds of economic realms. Uh, union negotiators, before they go into a tough negotiation, will say, I will resign as your negotiator before I'll give up your pension. And then they sit down across the table from the other side and the other side says, it's pensions or nothing. And they say, I hear what you're saying. I am not empowered to trade away the pensions. I have to quit. You have, they have to go elect a new negotiator. Because I was elected contingent on not bargaining away the pensions. And the pensions are off the table. Now, Brewster has talked about this in the context of code. He suggested that we could um, build distributed technologies using the kinds of JavaScript libraries that are found in things like Google Docs and Google Mail because no matter how much pressure is put on browser vendors or on uh, technology companies more generally, the likelihood that they will disable Google Docs or Google Mail is very, very low. And so we can take Google Docs hostage and use it as an inhuman shield for our own projects. The GPL does this, right? Uh, once you write code with the GPL, it's locked open. It's irrevocably licensed for openness and no one can shut it down in the future by adding restrictive terms to the license. Now, the reason the GPL worked so well, the reason it became such a force for locking things open is that it became indispensable. Companies that wanted to charge admission for commodity components like operating systems or file editors or compilers uh, found themselves confronted with the reality that there's a huge difference between even a small price and no price at all, or no monetary price. Eventually, it just became absurd to think that you would instantiate 100 million virtual machines for an 11th of a second and get a license for each one of them and pay a royalty for each one of them. And at that point, GPL code became the only code that people used in cloud applications in any great volume, unless they actually were the company that published the operating system that wasn't GPL'd.
Now, communities coalesced around the idea of making free and open alternatives to these components. Uh, GNU Linux, uh, Open and LibreOffice, and Git, and those projects benefited from a whole bunch of different motives, not always the purest ones. Uh, sometimes it was programmers who really believed ethically in the project and funded their own work. Zuka talked about that a little yesterday. Sometimes talent was tight, and companies wanted to attract programmers and the way that they got them to come in the door was they said, we'll give you some of your time to work on an ethical project and contribute code to it. Sometimes companies got tactical benefits by zeroing out the margins on their biggest competitor's major revenue stream. So if you want to fight with Microsoft, uh, just make Office free. Uh, and sometimes companies wanted to use but not sell commodity components. So maybe you want to run a cloud service, but you don't want to be in the operating system business. And so you put a bunch of programmers on making Linux better for your business without ever caring about getting money from, from the operating system. Instead, you get it from the people who hire you to run their cloud. Now, every one of those entities, regardless of how they got into the situation of contributing to open projects, they eventually faced hard times, because hard times are a fact of life. And systems that work well, well but fail badly, they are doomed to die in flames. The GPL is designed to fail well. It makes it impossible to hyperbolically discount the future cost of doing the wrong thing to gain an immediate benefit. When your investor or your acquisition suitor or your boss says, screw your ethics, hippie, we need to make payroll, you can just uh, pull out the GPL and say, do you have any idea how badly we will be destroyed if we violate copyright law by violating the GPL? It's why Microsoft was right to be freaked out about the GPL during the, f f the free and open source wars. Uh, Microsoft's coders, they were nerds like us. Uh, they fell in love with computers first and became Microsoft employees second. And they had benefited from freedom and openness. They had catted out basic programs. They would viewed source. And they had an instinct towards openness. And combining that with the expedience of being able to use floss, like not having to call a lawyer before you could be an engineer, and combined with the rational calculus that if they made floss, that when they eventually left Microsoft, they could keep using the code that they'd made there, it meant that Microsoft's coders and Microsoft were working for different goals, and the way that they expressed that was in how they used their code and how they licensed their code. This worked so well that for a long time, nobody even knew if the GPL was enforceable, because nobody wanted to take the risk of suing and setting a bad precedent. It took years and years for us to find out in which jurisdictions we could enforce the GPL. Now, that brings me to another kind of computer regulation and something that has been uh, bubbling along under the surface for a long time, at least since the open source wars. And that's the use of digital rights management, or DRM, or some people call it digital restrictions management. This is the technology that tries to control how you use your computer. The idea is that you have software on the computer that the user can't uh, override. If there's remote policy set on that computer that the user objects to, the computer rejects the user's instruction in favor of the remote policy. It doesn't work very well. It's very hard to stop people who are sitting in front of a computer from figuring out how it works and changing how it works. Uh, we don't keep safes in bank robbers' living rooms, not even really good ones. Um, but we have a law that protects it, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's been around since 1998. Uh, and it has lots of global equivalents, like uh, the EUCD, Section 6 of the EUCD in Europe has been implemented all across the EU member states. They got their own version of the DMCA. Uh, in New Zealand, they tried to pass a version of the DMCA, and there was uprisings, protests in the streets, and they actually had to take the law off the books because it was so unpopular. And then the Christchurch earthquake hit, and a member of parliament reintroduced it as a rider to the emergency relief bill to dig people out of the rubble. Uh, in Canada, it's Bill uh, C-11 from 2011. And what it does is it makes it a felony to tamper with those locks, a felony punishable by $500,000 uh, fine and five years in jail for a first offense. And it makes it a felony to do security auditing of those locks and publish information about the flaws made in them or their systems. Now, this started off as a way to make sure that people who bought DVDs in India didn't ship them to America. But this is a bad idea whose time has come. It has metastasized into every corner of our world. 
because if you put just enough DRM around a product that you can invoke the law, then you can use other code sitting behind the DRM to control how the user uses that product to extract more money. So GM uses it to make sure that you can't get diagnostics out of the car without getting a tool that they license to you, and that license comes with a term that says you have to buy parts from GM. And so all repair shops for GM that can access your, uh, your diagnostic information have to buy their parts from GM and pay monopoly rents. We see it in insulin pumps. We see it in thermostats. We see it in, uh, usually, I'm, I'm a one-slide guy. When it's not harpies attacking Odysseus, I, I usually default to the Internet of Things rectal thermometer, uh, which debuted at, at CES this year, because we now have DRM-restricted works in our asses. Um, <laughs> and it's come to the web. Uh, it's been lurking in the corners of the web for a long time, but now it's being standardized at the World Wide Web Consortium through something called Encrypted Media Extensions, or, or EME. And the idea of EME is that there is conduct that users want to engage in that no legislature in the world has banned, like PVRing their Netflix videos. But there are companies that would prefer that that conduct not be allowed. By wrapping the video with just enough DRM to invoke the DMCA, you can convert your commercial preference to not have PVRs, which are no more and no less legal than the VCR was when, in 1984, the Supreme Court said you can record video off your TV, and you can record video off your screen. Um, to convert that commercial preference into something with the force of law whose enforcement you can outsource to national governments. And what that means is that if you want to do interoperability without permission, if you want to do adversarial interoperability, if you want to add a feature that the manufacturer, the value chain doesn't want, if you want to encapsulate Gopher inside of the web to launch your web browser with content from the first day, if you want to add a, a, an abstraction layer that lets you interoperate between two different video products so that you can shop between them and find out which one has the better deal, that conduct, which has never been banned by a legislature, becomes radioactively illegal. It also means that if you want to implement something that users can modify, that you will find yourself on the sharp end of a law, because user modifiability for the core components of this system are antithetical with its goals of controlling user conduct. If there's a bit you can toggle that says, turn DRM off now, then um, if you turn that bit off, uh, the entire system ceases to work. But the worst part of all is it makes browsers into no-go zones for security disclosures about vulnerabilities in the browser. Because if you know about that vulnerability, you could use it to weaken EME. But if you know about that vulnerability, you can also use it to attack the user in other ways. Now, adding DRM to browsers, standardizing DRM as an open standards organization, that's a compromise. It's a, a little compromise, because after all, there's already DRM in the world. And it's a compromise that's rational if you believe that DRM is inevitable. If you think that the choice is DRM that's fragmented or DRM that we get a say in, that we get to nudge into a better position, then it's the right decision to make. You get to stick around and do something to make it less screwed up later as opposed to being self-marginalized by refusing to participate at all. But if DRM is inevitable, and I refuse to believe that it is, but if it's inevitable, it's because individually, all across the world, people who started out with the best of intentions made a million tiny compromises that took us to the point where we got to where DRM became inevitable, where the computers that are woven into our lives with increasing intimacy and urgency are designed to control us instead of being controlled by us. And the reason those compromises were made is because each one of us thought that we were alone and that no one would have our back, that if we refused to make the compromise that the next person down the road would, and, when the, and that eventually this would end up being there, and so why not be the one who made the compromise now? They were good people who made those compromises. They were people who were no worse than you and probably better than me. They were acting unselfishly. They were trying to preserve the jobs and livelihoods and projects of people that they cared about, people who believed that others would not back their play, that doing the right thing would be self-limiting. Uh, when we are alone and when we believe we are alone, we're weak. 
Now, it's not unusual to abuse standards bodies to attain some commercial goal. The normal practice is to get standards bodies to incorporate your patents into a standard, right? To ensure that um, if someone implements your standard, that every time it ships, you get a nickel. And that's a great way to make rent off of uh, something that becomes very popular. Uh, but um, the W3C was not arm twisted about adding patents back into standards. That's because the W3C has the very best patent policy of any standards body in the world. When you come to the W3C to make a standard for, a web, for the web, you promise not to use your patents against people who implement that standard. And the W3C was able to make that policy at a moment in which it was ascendant, in which people were clamoring to join it, in which it was uh, the first moments of the web and in which they were fresh. The night they went on a diet, they were able to throw away all the Oreos in the house. They were where you are now, right? Starting a project that people around the world were getting excited about, that was showing up on the front page of the New York Times. Um, now, that policy has become the ironclad signifier of the W3C. What's the W3C? It's the open standards body that's so open that you don't get to assert patents if you join it. Uh, and it remains intact. How will we keep the DMCA from colonizing the locked open web? How will we keep DRM from affecting all of us? By promising to have each other's backs. By promising that by participating in the open web, we take the DMCA off the table. We take silencing security researchers, we take blocking new entrants into the market off the table. Now, when we are fresh, when we are insurgent, before we have turned from uh, the pirates that we started out as into the admirals that some of us will become, we take that option off the table. Uh, EFF has proposed a version of this at the W3C and at other bodies, where we say to be a member, you have to promise not to use the DMCA to aggress against those who uh, report security vulnerabilities in W3C standards and in people who um, uh, make interoperable implementations of W3C standards. We've also proposed that to the FDA as a condition of getting approval for medical implants to get a medical implant uh, approved, we asked the, w the FDA to make companies promise in a binding way never to use the, D the DMCA to aggress against security researchers. We've taken it to the FCC and we're taking it elsewhere. If you want to sign an open letter to the W3C endorsing this, email me, Corey, at EFF.org. But we can go further than that because Ulysses packs are fantastically useful tools for locking stuff open. It's not just the paper that you sign when you start your job that takes a little bit of money out of your bank account every month for your 401k, although that works too. The US Constitution is a Ulysses Pact. It understands that lawmakers will be corrupted, and it establishes a principal basis for repealing the laws that are inconsistent with the founding principles, as well as a process for revising those principles as need be. Now, a society of laws is a lot harder to uh, uh, make work than a society of code or a society of people. If all you need to do is find someone who's smart and kind and ask them to make all their, your decisions for you, you will spend a lot less time in meetings and a lot more time writing code. You won't have to wrangle and flame or talk to lawyers, but it fails badly. We are all of us a mix of short-sighted and long-term, depending on the moment, depending on our optimism, depending on our urgency, depending on our blood sugar levels. Uh, we must give each other moral support, literal support to uphold the morals of the decentralized web by agreeing now what an open internet is and locking it open. When we do that, if we create binding agreements to take certain kinds of conduct off the table for anything that interoperates with or is part of what we're building today, then our wise leaders tomorrow will never be pressurized to make those compromises because uh, if the compromise can't be made, there's no point in leaning on them to make it. We must set out agreements and principles that allow us to resist the song of the sirens in the future moments of desperation. And I want to propose two key principles as foundational as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or the First Amendment. The first one is that when a computer receives conflicting instructions from its owner and from a remote party, the owner always wins. <laughs> it's 
systems should always be designed so that their owners can override remote instructions and should never be designed so that remote instructions can be executed if the owner objects to them. Once you create the capacity for remote parties to override the owners of computers, you set the stage for terrible things to come. Anytime there's a power imbalance, expect the landlord, the teacher, the parent of the queer kid to enforce that power imbalance to allow them to remotely control the device that the person they have power over uh, uses. It, uh, you will create security risks, because as soon as you have a mechanism that hides from the user to run code on the user's computers, anyone who hijacks that mechanism, either by presenting a secret warrant or by breaking into a vulnerability in the system, will be running in a privilege mode that is designed not to be interdicted by the user. If you want to make sure that people show up at the door of the distributed web asking for backdoors till the end of time, just build in an update mechanism that the user can't stop. If you want to stop those backdoor requests from coming in, build in binary transparency. So anytime an update ships to one user that's materially different from the other ones, everybody gets notified and your business never sells another product. Your board of directors will never pressurize you to go along with the NSA or the Chinese secret police to add a backdoor if doing so will immediately shut down your business. Throw away the Oreos now. Um, now, so long as we're on it, let's throw in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This is the act that says that uh, if you exceed your authorization on someone else's computer, where that authorization can be defined as just um, uh, uh, the terms of service that you click through on your way into using a common service, if you do that, you commit a felony and can go to jail. Let's throw that away because it's being used routinely to shut down people who discover security vulnerabilities in systems. And that second principle should be disclosing true facts about the security of systems that we rely upon should never, ever be illegal. We can have normative ways and persuasive ways of stopping people from disclosing recklessly. We can pay them bug bounties. We can have codes of conduct. But the, we must never, ever give corporations or the state the legal power to silence people who know true things about the systems we entrust our lives, safety, and privacy to. These are the foundational principles. Computers obey their owners. True facts about risk to users are always legal to talk about. And I charge you to be hardliners on these principles, to be called fanatics. If they're not calling you Puritans for these principles, you're not pushing hard enough. If you computerize the world and you don't safeguard the users of computers from coercive control, history will not remember you as the heroes of progress, but as the blind handmaidens of future tyranny. The internet, this internet, this distributed internet that we are building, the re-decentralization of the internet, if it ever succeeds, will someday fail because everything fails, because overwhelmingly things are impermanent. What it gives rise to next is a function of what we make today. There's a parable about this, that the state of Roman metallurgy at the era and the era of chariots determined the wheelbase of a Roman chariot, which determined the width of the Roman road, which determined the width of the contemporary road, because they were built atop the ruins of the Roman roads, which determined the wheelbase of cars, which determined the widest size that you could have a container that could move from a ship to a truck to a train, which determined the size of a train car, which determined the maximum size of the space shuttle's disposable rockets. Roman metallurgy prefigured the size of the space shuttle's rockets. Not entirely true. There are historians who will explain the glosses in which it's not true, but it is a parable about what happens when empires fall. Empires always fall. If you build a glorious empire, a shining city on the hill, as, as former governor of California liked to talk about, if you build uh, a, a good empire, an empire we can all be proud to live in, it will someday fall. You cannot lock it open forever. The best you can hope for is to wedge it open until it falls and to leave behind the materials, the infrastructure that the people who reboot the civilization that comes after ours will use to make a better world. A legacy of technology 
norms and skills that embrace fairness and freedom and openness and transparency is a commitment to care about your shared destiny with every person alive today and all the people who will live in the future. Thank you. So thank you. It's very nice of you, but I want to get some questions in, and we have two and a half minutes. Uh, can we start with a question from a woman, because it's always a sausage trust. We'll alternate if we have time. Long rambling statements, followed by what do you think of that, are or or questions, but not good ones. Denise, please. <coughs> Excuse me, it went down the wrong way. Hi, I'm a woman. Hi, Denise. So it sold to the most evil place we could possibly be sold to, and they just undermined everything. So how do we keep that from happening? I mean, there were valiant efforts. You know, people went to the EC and said, this is going to screw up my sequel, mm -hmm. and they came up with an accommodation, and another accommodation, and another accommodation. How can we stop that stuff? So there are two levels at which you bind your conduct. The first is in the specific, and the second is at the principal. So in the specific, you might say um, a condition of using some library, uh, participating in some consortium, uh, contributing to something is to irrevocably promise never to abuse your patents against people who use that. That's a really good start. And it, it um, to the extent that you're in a firm that's joining, say, the Twitter open patent pool, that's great news. I'm uh, glad for, for you to be doing that, and they're doing that. But the next piece is the harder piece, which is coming up with a principle that says, in addition, you will never take any step that, uh, or, or, or any step that um, restricts the thing that using a patent would restrict is also off the table. And defining that is really hard uh, because people will argue about whether or not, for example, exercising 12 DMCA rights to shut down interoperable Im implementations is the same as using patent rights to shut down interoperable implementations. I suspect if you're making the interoperable implementation, it doesn't matter which law that only your general counsel understands is, is being used to shut you down. What matters is that you're being shut down, but it invites endless wrangling about whether two things are equivalent. But if you look at the way that uh, the Constitution is structured and then the laws that depend from it are structured, it starts with principles and then it implements those principles in laws, and then those laws are um, uh, then referred back to the principles to see whether they match. So when the NSA prohibited uh, the publication of strong crypto, we represented Daniel J. Bernstein to the Ninth Circuit where we argued that the First Amendment protected his right to publish source code. And though the founders had never heard of source code, we were able to use the specific principle to overturn the law, and we have also been able to go in the opposite direction where laws were enacted, like laws that protect equal um, access under the law, anti-discriminatory laws, because they are consistent with those, with those principles. So you have to do both. You need specific conduct that is taken off the table, and you need principles to refer to for future conduct that will be taken off the table, and you need an amendment process to add that future conduct to it as circumstances change. David. Yeah, um, I'm, 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 I've been extremely interested in the DMCA, so it, it, since you're, you know more about it than practically anybody, I, I, I have a question that okay. might be useful to other people. Um, it seems that the DMCA is structured so that one person, the Librarian of Congress who is appointed for life, is the only person who can decide um, when the DMCA does not apply. And um, I'm curious, as to the structure of getting DMCA not to apply, you know, rather than you know re removing right. it. Right. How entirely. do we fix it structurally how instead do, of onesies, twosies? In other words, can we can we fix it by just getting 
the library, you know, someone other than right. the Librarian of Congress. To so, be the, oh my the God, thing. do I wish the Librarian of Congress had the power to take the DMCA off the table. Like, it's actually significantly worse than that. What the Librarian of Congress has the authority to do is every three years hear petitions for uses that you're allowed to make, but not to grant you the right to make the tool to make the use. So the Librarian of Congress just said, like, security researchers are allowed to break DRM to do security research, but they're not allowed to make tools or traffic in tools or tell anyone how their tools work in order to do that security research, in order to break the DMCA. In Norway, their version of this, because remember, this is global, and the fact that the Copyright Office took some stuff off the table doesn't help the Norwegians or anyone else. The US trade representatives like Patient Zero in an epidemic of shitty internet law, and everyone who <laughs> trades with the internet is stuck in this horrible regime. And uh, in Norway, they said, blind people are allowed to break the DRM on eBooks, but no one's allowed to make a tool to help a blind person take the DRM off eBooks, and you are not allowed to share a tool if you are blind and you make a tool to take the DRM off eBooks. You're not allowed to share it with other blind people, right? So like, holy crap, is it much worse than you thought it was? Because those exemptions show that the DMs are, create facts and evidence about the harms of the DMCA, but they don't solve those harms because they still make the trafficking of tools uh, they, they're still illegal. The way we are going to change this in legislatures is iteratively by picking it off around the edges and using that to influence debates in the middle and then using that debate to pick it off more around the edge and then going back into the middle. So we'll get the FCC and the FDA to take the DMC off the table for medical implants and um, set-top boxes. And then we're going to go to Congress when, as they are right now, debating reform to Section 1201 of the DMCA, and we'll say, look at how stupid this law is. The, um, the FDA and the FCC just took it off the, the table. And Congress will table reforms to it that won't get passed, and then we'll use the fact that there were reforms tabled in Congress that had significant support but didn't pass to go to three more organizations and get it taken off the table. And then th that will use that to make Congress hold more hearings, right? And we're gonna go back and forth. And while we're doing it, we have some pending lit litigation we're gonna announce very soon now that will challenge the constitutionality of the DMCA altogether. And every single one of those pieces are gonna go together. So it looks like I'm out of time. Thank you all very much. I'd be remiss if I failed to remind you that EFF is a member-supported nonprofit. Uh, I also would like to remind you that if you'd like to sign on to a letter endorsing these principles for web standards, please send me an email, corey at EFF.org. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Why don't you guys go up? Okay, the new rule of decentralized web conferences is don't go after Cory Doctorow. Because <laughs> you gotta summon your passionate self. But if anyone could do it, it is this panel here. We thought that it would be a really good panel to follow up Cory to talk about how do we bake our values into the code. And who better to lead that than our own Amber Case. She is a cyborg anthropologist. She's done startups. She's heading to the Berkman Center. But really, the thing that ties all that together is that she's interested in how people can use technology instead of the other way around. Amber Case. Thanks very much. So I have this great group of people here but I don't have a chair, so I'm gonna be standing here next to you guys instead of sitting. Um, we have a lot of builders here. We talk about protocols, sometimes we talk about standards, sometimes we talk about different programming languages and whether they're better than the others. Sometimes we have competing projects and things that have been invested in and, and people that we like better. But one of the big issues is that it's really hard to talk about values. If we have values that are baked into systems from the beginning, that can affect 20 years down the line how we interact with those systems. So we have some really great panelists here and I'll introduce each of them and tell you a little bit about them. So uh, first of all, we have Peter Van Gartren and he's fantastic because he's an archivist and hopefully he can tell you a lot about what values for archiving he'd like built into these systems in the decentralized web. He works on technologies that empower GLAMs and for those of you that don't know that acronym, that's galleries, that's libraries, that's art museums and that's museums. Wait, is it, did I get it right? Archives, there we go. So um, 
And then we have Max Ogden. I know Max Ogden from the open.gov days, like the open.gov days uh, back in Portland, Oregon. And from the very beginning, he was really interested in making technologies that were incredibly usable by citizens, like archive.org, uh, not archive.org. Well, that's incredibly usable by citizens. But uh, um, uh, the, the API, PDX API, Portland API, would gather all this data together, and then it would allow people to use it. And people started making all these great systems based on it. And now he'll be here to talk about DAT and how scientists can use things in a new way. He's really good about being a community builder for builders. And that's a really rare thing to see. So it's fantastic to have him here. Uh, we have Wendy Seltzer. Wendy Seltzer is, is formerly of the EFF and is really a freedom fighter. Uh, and now she's part of the, uh, the standards um, and collective uh, with the W3C. And then we have Primavera de Filippi, and Primavera is interesting because she's really uh, curious and incredibly involved in uh, decentralized governance. And so when we say governance, this is the first thing they thought, okay, we're on this panel, we're at this conference, we all have our own different languages, but one of the, one of the terms is, is governance that we'll probably come into on this panel a lot of times. So Primavera, what does, what does governance mean to you, and, and how do you see this work on the decentralized web? Um, well, what is governance means is kind of a difficult question, but I think it's um, like my research is about uh, the legal aspect, so like the regulation, and um, I started actually focusing a lot on blockchain technologies, and this is where I started looking at how can we actually regulate those technologies, and then to some extent it became kind of like obvious that we actually need to understand how the technology can actually govern itself, right? So if we design a particular technological artifact, um, there, is, there is a way to regulate it like from the outside, but you can also try and design it in a particular manner, right? And um, I think it's actually extremely important because there is today like a lot of focus and a lot of effort being put into designing a technical infrastructure, which is decentralized and like no point of control, etc. But there's actually still too little effort to actually understand how these technologies, this, this new infrastructure, which are decentralized, can actually be governed. Right? And um, so my research is actually about trying to understand, on the one hand, um, so there exists like a lot of design criteria that are designed, like that are backed into the system, and this is about having something that is secure, that is resilient against attacks, etc. And uh, it feels to me that um, it's, it's of course extremely important to be able to design a proper, resilient, and robust technical system, but it's actually not enough. And uh, as we design those tools, we also need to design a governance structure for those, right? And this can be done both at the technical level. So this means that we need to add new design criteria. And those design criteria need to look at uh, uh, how you can ensure, or how you can make it harder at least, for institutional centralization to happen around a decentralized infrastructure. And of course, this is like this is not possible to just like only by technical tools do that, but you can actually design something that makes it a little bit more difficult, or you can actually try and elaborate some set of protocols or rules, which even though uh, institutional centralization happens, because anyhow there is this kind of like entropy towards centralization, then it actually perhaps it doesn't matter because the design rules of the architecture are such that even in case of a centralization, then you can still preserve the basic guarantees that this, the technological artifact was meant to do. And so that, that's one lay. And the other, the other aspect is, in addition to this, I think we anyhow, in order to protect anything against institutional centralization, we need probably an institution. Like the technology itself cannot, be especially at the centralized technology is often much weaker than a centralized one because there is no actual institution that can protect it against co-optation, et cetera. And so I think that what we need to do at the moment is figure out how we can design distributed governance system, which will like, enable to create a decentralized institution to govern a decentralized architecture. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing from you is that we need to help design a, a sort of decentralized uh, governance system and that the way that we can do that is we can 
build these values in from the beginning so that we don't go back to a centralized system so that there's there's ways to make it much more difficult for this to kind of slide out of out of that control over time correct i, I think there's two like there's two ways to do it i think these are complementary one is designing into the architecture itself specific design criteria specific feature that makes it difficult uh, to re-centralize. And on the other hand is we need to also identify the institutional governance of those architecture and we need to identify a decentralized way to, to govern them. Great. So Wendy, you're part of a, you're part of a, a type of standards organization with the W3C. What, what is your view of, of governance, uh, both personally and, and both as part of that organization? Um, well, I, I start out um, I'm a student of Lawrence Lessig's and lots of people think of uh, him saying code is law. Um, in fact, um, he put it into the context of saying there are sort of four forces working together to act as regulators of our activities, code, norms, markets, and law. And uh, I think when we think about governance, uh, it's worth thinking about how all of those forces interact and how pushing or pulling on one of them causes the others to, to move and change in their uh, regulatory force. So while W3C as an open standards organization uh, is working with people who are writing code, uh, computer code, uh, we're also fitting into um, a setting where people are interacting with social norms, interacting with legal institutions, and interacting uh, as market participants. Uh, so we have architectural design principles. Um, the HTML working group has uh, written up the, the priority of constituencies, uh, where they say put users, uh, value users over developers, over implementers, over editors. Think first about the, the end users of your technology and of writing standards that will uh, empower and be valuable to uh, the end users of, uh, of the code because there are more of them, they're trying to do more diverse and different things, and uh, the possibilities for innovation coming out of those end users are well beyond what even the most clever of uh, standards writers can think of. So leave open those options, those possibilities at the edges, uh, and then sort of optimize up the stack, mm -hmm. uh, work to build something that's good for the developers who will be using it, to build something that's implementable, that's useful to the implementers, and and useful to, to those producing products because uh, at the end of the day, a, a standard is only as uh, useful as, as it is implemented and uh, out there uh, creating real interoperable uh, and usable and used uh, products. Great, so this, this brings to mind a term that I've, I think I've heard you use, which is socio-technology, correct? Where it's the idea that, that social is, social is part of technology. Like there wouldn't be technology without people because people are helping to reproduce the technology as they choose technology. And sometimes the technology forms how they become social. But having something that's not too set in stone, that's flexible, that allows things to evolve over time. And as you as you said, the edges is, is really important. And with that, I'd like to go to you, Max, about your involvement in the open source community and how those kind of governance models are set there, where that, in a way, is kind of flexible in some respects and, and kind of hard set in, in other things, and, and how you see that working with what you're working on, the DAP project. So I think there's tons of stuff that government and governance in general can learn from open source, and even going very literally, um, I have a great example. I had the extreme privilege of getting to be an early employee at a place called Code for America here in San Francisco. And the job of Code for America, <coughs> when I went into it, was get better government technology um, to be built by people that are primarily technologists. But coming out of it, what I realized, what the actual goal was, was show the government how to hire the best technologists in the field and figure out how to create jobs that people that normally think that they would have to go work at some big tech company to be challenged with engineering problems could see themselves working in our public institutions, which aren't, uh, are a thing that we sort of abandon as the tech industry, um, which I think is a tragedy of the commons. Um, and it's not uh, crazy to think about the government running these decentralized internet infrastructure nodes. Um, I have a really great example, one of the most mind-blowing projects I've seen lately, which is this project called the GDS Registers Team. Um, the GDS is the Government Digital Service in the UK, and they're the most exciting agency in the UK government, in my opinion. Um, we have our own uh, copycat organization in the US called the US Digital Service, 
And they get people who build you know, Facebook's data centers to take a year off and come and work for the VA or for um, you know, the infrastructure for social security. And they go in there and they say, well, we spent $500 million on this contract and it's been six years and it hasn't shipped yet. And if I was in the private sector, I could build this for $50 million. Um, and getting the people, getting us in the room when they're making the important decisions about the infrastructure for government. Um, this is what the GDS registers team is doing. They're saying, they actually took a thing that Google uses to revoke certificates in the SSL infrastructure, a cornerstone of the decentralized web, and they figured out if we can use this cryptography to have trusted signed lists of authoritative data sets, then we can have an infrastructure where government agencies can refer with trusted uh, data sets to each other, and then it could be auditable. And it doesn't have to be, um, oh, I lost my emails. There's like actual auditable trails of cryptographically signed information. And so it's like they're doing some of the coolest crypto stuff because what they did was they figured out how they can hire the people in this room, make it appealing to go work in government. So I think in terms of governance, um, let's fix our, fix our existing democracy before we uh, try to build a new one. Interesting. So let's say that the existing democracy can't be fixed and we have to deal with it as is. And we always have to deal with it as is. We can make incremental progress. And let's say we do get a bunch of people in this room hired and, and that works out really well. You're a developer. What kind of mistakes have you seen developers make in the past around this type of thing? And, and how would you guide people to do things uh, learning from, from the past in that way, like from your perspective? Um, whoa, what a question. Um, <laughs> so I have no idea. <laughs> um, I don't know if developers are necessarily a good model for a new system. Um, I think one of the issues that I've seen is that we tend to follow the technology to the limits. And I don't think necessarily the limit of technology is the best thing for society. Um, I think that in general, if technologists uh, had a social mission that they could um, use as their use case, something that if they explain it to a person off the street, um, that person can empathize with what they're working on, um, then maybe we wouldn't push our technology to the limits. Maybe we would push it just far enough. And as Primavera was saying, centralization is a lot of, uh, it's convenient and it's easy. And that says a lot, but decentralization means, you know, free from vendor lock-in and has a lot of these nice properties that we want. So sometimes pushing it all the way to the end of decentralization uh, makes it unadoptable or has, has things that people don't necessarily want to support in the public interest. So. Um, I don't know if I would copy the, uh, the extreme technocracy kind of thing that I see in the developer world. I would rather have developers link themselves to um, like real world social causes. Great. Primavera? I, I would just like to add on this. Um, I, I don't want to answer that question because also I don't know how to answer it. But I think that one thing that I see a lot is that there is this uh, kind of obsession in like a lot of developers, especially like in the, in the blockchain space, which is about creating a decentralized technology for the sake of creating a decentralized technology. Whereas like decentralization should actually not be, not be the objective. It should just be a mean to a different objective, which is like social values. So like what, what are the values that we actually want to achieve through decentralization? And I think this, this, this uh, extreme focus on the decentralized technology itself actually prevents some of the developers to see that actually you can you can have the most beautiful decentralized system in the world but if it's actually not protected against the systematic centralization then actually it's not going to achieve mm -hmm. the original value that you wanted to get yeah i think i think both of you bring up a good point that we have a lot of people that are really excited about making a system with the newest technology and then saying i'm going to scale this thing up and make it really centralized and then do that for the point of doing that and then not want to support it later on because some new other interesting piece of technology comes up. Um, uh, Peter, this, this really interests me because you're dealing with things that last for a really long time. You're having to archive things. You're having to deal with all these different systems and programming languages that aren't going to do well over time in even emulators and computers and things like that that run these different versions of what people have made. What are your biggest pet peeves about this? What are the things that you want built into this next generation system that, um, that will make your life and your job easier? Um, yeah, well, I think uh, Vince Cerf did a really good job this morning of kind of like uh, summarizing like all the various issues and potential solutions to that. And you know, certainly in the archives and library space, we've been um, spending a good 10, 15 years you know, analyzing those problems and building solutions. Myself, I've developed an open source digital preservation system. Um, and so, you know, but it keeps coming back to what are the core criteria. What, like it, it comes back to values, like why are we doing this, right? Archives exist, or archival institutions. We, 
um, collect, uh, you know, we create collections of information objects uh, to provide long-term access to these, to these collections for, you know, for self-knowledge, for collective memory, for protecting freedoms. So certainly just like the Internet Archive, like universal access to information knowledge is our goal. And how do we accomplish that? Well, we, you know, the inf like you said, there's technology obsolescence, there's constant new technology platforms. We're talking about decentralized web technologies today. What are we gonna be talking about 10, 15 years from now? You know, and why are we doing it? So, you know, our, I think if there's one word, it's, you know, we're really concerned about authenticity of information, protecting, you know, what's the truth? Like, and, and we want a record of that truth. And certainly the, the information that's being created today is being created in digital formats. And so, yeah, we have certain principles we want to uh, implement so that we can protect the authenticity of information and the long-term accessibility. So peer-to-peer -peer technology, the fact you have multiple copies of information is it's incredibly useful. Um, but if there's only one or two seeds uh, containing that information, that's not useful to us from an archival perspective. So the kind of very practical technical requirements we would lo be looking for in peer-to-peer -peer systems is you know, maintaining a minim minimum number of copies. But the biggest one is authenticity. So how do we um, protect the context of uh, creation and use, uh, the provenance information? There's a lot of hype around uh, proof of existence type solutions with the blockchain solutions right now, which is fantastic. Um, but there's still a big disconnect between that and proof of identity and proving where, you know, you can, I can put an authentic forgery on, on the blockchain, right? But like, how do I trust the information? And that's the kind of stuff that we're concerned about. And we have a lot of, you know, principles and standards that we think we can contribute to this discussion on the decentralized web and just basically building them into functional requirements. And, um, and so maintaining good metadata, multiple copies, those are some very basic things that we as archivists would want to add to the discussion. So, so in summary, you need good metadata, you need to be able to uh, maintain multiple copies, uh, you need to have authenticity and make sure that there's a record of that because the one issue that, you know, there could be governments that go in and change the document and nobody knows about that. There could be misinformation, there could be deleted information, there could be marginalized communities that can't preserve this information versus, you know, museums, like large museums that can just say, okay, here's the truth, here, here we go, it's, it's in this space. So if you had those things built in the system, it would be, make your job a lot easier then? Absolutely, and this is one of the things that's really exciting me personally about the promise of the centralized web because there is a lot of like kind of postmodern analysis happening within our community right now about you know, the role of memory institutions that they have as institutions and kind of, you know, uh, for, you know as the kind of de facto uh, providers of the truth where obviously there's lots of marginalized communities that see that differently and including the way we run it, the policies and procedures and tools we have. So decentralized technologies allow marginalized communities, any community, to kind of take ownership of their own archival collections and the technologies there, the tools are there. Um, and you know, we have best practices to offer to that discussion because we're not in the, this, you know, as archivists, are we, ha you know, we, we subscribe to this idea of providing authentic, access to authentic information and whether that's doing it in an institutional setting or by giving, uh, you know, sharing our knowledge on how to make systems achieve that better, in, in particularly in decentralized systems, that's something that we want to be part of. Great. Uh, in terms of, of all of you, what, what are, so you, you told me a little bit of the values that you, that you want to see, at least the features um, that, that you can have embedded in the system. Uh, this question is for all of you. What do you, you know, what are your kind of your dream list of, of values that you'd like to see? Let's say that the decentralized web was built in the way that you really wanted it to be built. Uh, what, what would it look like? We'll just start with you, Max. So, hello. Um, so I think that any publicly funded asset, um, be it science or uh, government data, um, it should be possible with the web for anyone to help host that to make the bandwidth and the storage, the commodities of the internet um, be free for anyone to upload or download um, public information. Because um, we're losing research outputs every day. I actually wonder, um, I was joking, but I think this might be a serious question, which is disappearing faster, um, scientific research or species uh, in the rainforest? <laughs> or research about species in the rainforest? Um, because there's 404s happening every day, and uh, we spend million of millions and billions of dollars funding science, and then um, the web is kind of failing science because uh, we're using these brittle links. There's no way to look up duplicate copies. There's no mechanism built into the web so that I can help host the science that's important to me. Um, it's, it's very difficult. What if the Internet Archive could say, we want to build a new uh, 25, 27 petabyte cluster and host all of science forever? Um, where do they go and find the science? It's distributed across the web. We made it a system that's a little too decentralized, perhaps, and we need a mechanism built into it that can find duplicate copies. Right. Um, so I think that there's some technical infrastructure that needs to happen, but um, I think it's super important that we start with the public institutions 
Um, I think it's also a very tangible and empathetic issue. Um, I think that the frontier for all of us, like the battleground right now, um, should be scientific access to knowledge, or access to scientific knowledge specifically, because it's publicly funded, um, and it's disappearing rapidly, and there's no solutions for scientists to share their research data online. So maybe we could call the, the scientific papers an endangered species of, of data, where data can be its own type of type of species, and then we can work on ways to protect it and, and say it. Yeah, and I mean, the discussion is getting forced by places like Sci-Hub, which is sort of the Napster of journal articles. Right. And it's sort of forcing all these publishers who are reselling public research to um, maybe go back and figure out if they are rethinking their business models. And right. I think that there's a huge opportunity right now to show people better options for the future built on decentralized technologies. This is also an issue because the less access to research we have, the more money we spend on doing duplicate research and then people don't remember it and then other countries say, well, we have, you know, we have access to better research, so we'll just go over there and do that research there. Uh, Wendy, what do, you, what do you think about all of this with, with the W3C? How can you guys help in the, in the decentralized web and, and helping with access to uh, journals and scientific information and, and the disappearing data that we have on the web? I think one of the things that W3C does well as uh, a standards organization is the r building social consensus uh, around uh, interoperable standards. Right? Because to be part of the web, you don't need to sign on to a grand agreement. You just need to speak HTML and HTTP and other standards, and you are part of the web. And uh, those standards evolve to include new features uh, as people decide that these are things that are useful, things that they are willing to implement and willing to test and to, to find interoperable uh, sets of features, uh, those too can become part of the, the extensible web. They extend uh, the, the platform and uh, build out what we as users and publishers and developers on the web can do with it. So I think uh, as sort of uses uh, c come up, we, we should keep keep the platform open to extension and, and keep the you know, opportunity for people to, to come together and, uh, and, and find those zones of agreement where something is now gelled enough that we can make that part of the platform and uh, encourage the innovation up on a higher level. So you know, we, we follow the, the layered principles on which uh, the internet itself was, uh, was designed that you know, there are standards in some places and, um, and then sort of innovation and uh, diversity flourishes on top of those. Great. Uh, Prima Vera, you have a system that I'm going to summarize incorrectly, but you have a system in which, let's say somebody contributes to a project online uh, and they get a kind of coin for more of what they contribute to. So let's say they contribute a lot, they get more coins. With that, they can vote. Uh, and if they slack off and don't contribute a lot, they can't vote as much. So, the, so people are rewarded for interacting with projects a lot more and contributing. Um, have you seen this type of system work elsewhere in other organizations? Have you seen it work historically? Do you have um, any evidence of, of, of how this has worked in the past or the present? Um, I, I would like to put this in context first because actually I think this is an answer to your question. Um, I think that the like if we look beyond the technical part of the decentralization, which is accessibility, interoperability, security, etc., um, I would say that in my view there are two things that are um, uh, that could be a potential obstacle to uh, full decentralized web, and one is the discoverability and the other one is the incentivization. So in terms of discoverability, the thing is that, I mean, we do have like, you know, if we do have like all the information we can, we can think of, uh, it is important that this information be accessible, be archived, etc. But if we look today, actually, the way in which we access all this overflow of information is, is through infomediaries. And actually, even though we do have a decentralized system for hosting the information, uh, there is like, these new infomediaries which are actually the new gatekeeper to the information because there is just too much information and so people rely on Google, they rely on Facebook, on Twitter in order to actually obtain or discover what is the information that they consider to be the most interesting. And so I think that this is actually, in, this is as an additional layer perhaps, it's not really at the technical level but we do need mechanisms that enable people to discover 
in a decentralized manner what is the information that I will be the most interested in and that this should not be like some kind of objective uh, reality in the sense that today I can just connect on Google and I can search information and I will get what Google considers to be objectively the most relevant information but this actually might not fulfill my own personal values or maybe I want to look at the world according to a particular matrix and then we need to design systems that will enable people to actually become infomediaries in a, in a, in a peer-to-peer -peer or decentralized manner. And then the second point is the incentivization, which is, um, I think that's, that's one of the, like, of the core issues with like open source, for instance, is that how do you actually incentivize people to contribute? Right? And of course, there is a lot of people that have their own ideals and have like social capital, etc. But there is, there is a need to also attract more and more people that maybe would like to contribute, but they have to have a job and they have to uh, do other things. So the model, the, the, the backfeed model is actually, it, it resolves those two problems by providing a tool for people to um, assess the value of things in a distributed manner mm -hmm. and to provide some kind of rewards to the people that contribute and this value. Mm -hmm. so, in, so in summary, the discoverability is really important, uh, not just um, not just about the uh, just going to what Google thinks is the right search results for you, uh, and then the incentivization that even if you have a full-time job, just a little bit of, of contribution and, and incentivizing that is, is a good way to go. I would like to go to questions now. We have very interesting people on this panel, and we're going to just open it to questions. Uh, I would say one thing with the questions, do not make a statement, please ask one question uh, in, in uh, respect of time and the others around you. And if you want to ask or do more statements, then, then find these guys individually. I think so you already, did you already ask a question earlier? Yeah, <laughs> but if nobody else is gonna okay. stand it. I know, I'll ask my question. Would you like to go first? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if I mean, I think that we know that harassment and doxing, particularly of women and marginalized people, is a really big problem on the internet currently. And I'm wondering if working against that is a value that we could work into a decentralized web, and if so, how? Can I answer that question? Absolutely. So I, um, I recently actually have been thinking, doing a lot of thinking about that. I wrote a post recently called Decentralized Autonomous Collections. And it was, in fact, a response to something that's happening. I'm from Canada, the Canadian archival community. There's, um, issues around, uh, this qu quite a tragedy happened in our country, which is the uh, Indian residential school cri uh, crisis where, you know, uh, young First Nations people were taken, torn from their families and brought into residential schools essentially to assimilate them. And, it, you know, it's horrible, horrible past and um, there, we're going through Truth and Reconciliation Commission process in Canada right now to resolve that. Uh, and, and, and part of the, the continuing tragedy was that some of the representatives for the First Nations people actually had to take the, the Library Archives Canada to court to get access to some of the documents. And so there's a kind of a call to so-called decolonize archives. And so there's a big discussion going on on what does that actually look like. And there's some, like, there's been some fantastic projects out of Australia with an open source content management system called Mukurtu, which is essentially designed to allow people um, with communities to self-organize themselves and start creating their own archival collections and to have give their own voice and not be dependent on you know the institutional archival collection um, in, in spite of maybe even best intention from archivists where we don't realize that just because of the discipline that we're working in the you know the the, the, the professional kind of practices that we have are in fact continuing the the, the, the tragedies that they're meant to prevent like and because our, our goal is again access to knowledge and information so that we can have self-knowledge collective memory healing um, and moving forward as a society together. So I think, again, and when I, what I focused on there was that I think right now the, there's a variety of different technologies and tools coming together to actually realize that dream and to empower people to start building their own collections and hopefully have, you know, with incentive models as well, have some sustainability built in for the storage, but also have, you know, the accessible user interfaces. I agree 100% that discovery is one of the biggest issues we need to get around. How do I, you know, now that we have, we have so much information, we're just, we're getting it all online. How do I, you know, I only have so much attention span. How do I, how do I get the information that's relevant to me right now? The right information at the right time to the right person in the right format. And so part of our requirements need to focus on that. And that includes community sensitivity. Like how do we, how do we allow communities to take ownership of their own collections of information and empower them to do that? And as technologists, you know, that's one of the things we should be building into our requirements and then handing it off to other people and letting them do what they need to do. So, so a really quick but, but sort of 
question that's been puzzling me. Brewster talked this morning about reader privacy, and uh, I think that's an important value to many of us. Um, how do we build reader privacy into the decentralized web? Um, reader privacy, as in uh, no one knows what you're accessing? Yes. Like end-to-end -end encryption? So I think um, people try to say that software isn't political, and I completely disagree. I think that uh, as the architects of the systems, um, we might be able to say that we're blaming the capabilities of the technology for what the properties are, but I think it's actually, we have a lot of control over the intent of the system and how it can be used. I think that software absolutely is political. So I think that um, the decision to make HTTP2 have mandatory um, encryption by default and moving the web towards end-to-end -end encryption uh, or like be making it possible to have encrypted transports and making end-to-end -end encryption possible and the whole thing with WhatsApp and end-to-end -end encryption I think is absolutely the direction we need to get behind and support initiatives like that and not try to say it's not a uh, get your politics out of my software. I think we need to get more of this stuff into software. I'd, I'd just add that uh, I think it's a, a mix of the technical and the political that there are uh, software like Tor that enables uh, anonymous reading and anonymous uh, communication. Uh, and then we also need to, to make sure that sites are accessible uh, via uh, anonymous readership and uh, that there are ways to, uh, to publish and to attach stable pseudonyms and uh, that people then uh, attach uh, and build systems around alternate uh, identifiers uh, that are sort of detachable from the single identity that follows you everywhere. Right, thank you. That actually leads into my question. I think one of the big problems, everybody is trying to solve this problem at the same level of thinking. Building values in is a problem because you're assuming you're the one who declared the value. How about we build a system just like HTTP and bits where we let people self-declare what their values are so that in the context and point of view they're coming from, people know who they're talking to from a point of view. Then we can actually have a lot of real and actually building in value and building in what something is from a third party or from a community rated allows real conversations to happen and then you can filter out a lot of the I would say security management that people do, they get spied on, people get actually you know, trolled because if people have an identity. So how do we do that? So actually people actually build something that works, not just talk about it. Because I'm a Cisco guy and an Apple guy and I actually like building things that people use. That's what we should be discussing and figuring out if we're going to really build something. And I'd love to hear what you think about that because that actually could solve the cruft of actually a lot of the problems in communication and securing things. People have to declare if they want to communicate with others who they really are, and then not if they don't want to communicate publicly. I can take a stab at that. I think um, w what you were getting at is how do we make this real? How do we make this demonstrable? How do we make this not just a bunch of talk? How do we actually make some cool stuff? And I think my background is in open source and in JavaScript. And on the web, we've been kind of, JavaScript was kind of a thing people laughed at for a long time. Yeah. And then we were like, no, you can do cool stuff. Yeah. And what we did was we came up with this idea of a polyfill, which is like, the browser doesn't support this yet, but it will in the future. And in order to test it out today, we're going to make a thing that makes it possible to do today that kind of emulates the future. And so I think what we should do is we should fork the browser and put the features into the browser that we want to see to support this stuff happening. We don't need to wait for the browser to implement it. Um, and it's going to be informative to the standards processes. So I mean, yeah. go and make prototypes. Go and make demos. If you see something you want to make today, go and you know, yeah. make it real. And it always forces the browser to change. I've been here 20 years. We always force them to change with better shit. Ship better shit. All right, I think, I think we have to cut on questions. Um, I think we have one last question for the panel. And, uh, and uh, I would just say this, if you, if you had one wish that could just be fulfilled instantly, what, what would that wish be? Um, I'll start with you. Um, so my wish would, that would be that everyone in this room with an idea learns how to pitch it to funders so that they could get grants to work on it as open source infrastructure. Because um, I think it's kind of hard to pitch an abstract new next generation cryptocurrency to a lot of these institutions that are trying to you know, cure malaria. Um, and so I hope that we can reel back uh, the ideas down to something that helps, um, you know, turn all of our ideas into things that 
the rich people in America that funds the technology can actually justify writing grants for. So that's interesting. I'd add a caveat that if you do get funded, you still have control of your project. There's enough structure around it that even if it gets bought by another company, as we were talking about earlier, um, then it can still have those same things baked in the system that, that you want over time. So it can't just suddenly get, get co-opted and go out of your control. Remember? It's so difficult because I have a lot of wish, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think one wish is that, uh, um, I mean, this is my impression that actually there is so much uh, uh, emergent uh, project and so much like uh, desire to actually reach toward this decentralized web. M my, my wish would be that actually we, we, f we try to figure out how all those projects, all those emergent ideas can actually interconnect with each other because I think that actually we're almost there. But uh, like we have a lot of dots, and uh, if we actually figure out how to properly connect all those dots, I think that it's actually not that hard to get the, the web we want, right? Thank you. I would like um, happiness and self-fulfillment for all sentient beings, <laughs> and I believe, that <laughs> I believe that universal access to permanent collections of authentic information is one way to get us there. It gives us freedom of information, freedom of expression, and right to privacy. And I believe everybody in this room is working towards that goal, and I want to thank you for that. It's hard to come after that one, um, but uh, so I'll second it with the wish that we could uh, engage in successful collective action for these values, that uh, we for form a union for the decentralized web to work together and put our energy where our ideas are together. But a decentralized union, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone, for being on this panel. It really means a lot for you to be here. Let's have a hand for Amber Case, Wendy Seltzer, Peter Van Garderen, Prima Verde Philippi, and Max Ogden. All right. So I want to do something while we bring our next panel on. Um, last night, after everyone went home, we had our panelists and they were so nervous because imagine you're a young engineer and you have to share your ideas before Tim Berners-Lee and Vince Cerf and they said what we should do is we should emulate Brewster and when Brewster's excited he goes like this, he goes well this is great <laughs> okay so I want you guys all to do this, this is great, this is great, yeah it's his unbridled passion come on Brewster, come show us what you do, okay <laughs> Great. This is great. This is great. Okay, now you got to say it with us, all right? Come on, Brewster, come on. This is great. Oh, feel better already. No, go on up, please. Oh. Okay. Well, this panel is great. And um, I don't know why we're not going up there yet. But, uh, well, there are handhelds, so you can go up, right? Ah, I get it. All right. Are you using the uh, We are. Okay. okay. Well, we thought we'd get a little real right now. You've been in your head. We've been talking about values and Ulysses packs and things that in some ways can feel like a very distant Thank you abstract thing, but in all of our lives today, there are security issues. And well, we don't want to talk about security in an abstract form, we want to talk about security in a world of black hats, bad actors, people who seek to attack you. We have some great security experts, and who better to lead this than Ross Schulman? He's the director of the Cybersecurity Initiative at New America. And, you know, when people say, Ross, what do you do? He gets to say, I'm an expert on cybersecurity, encryption, and surveillance. How bad is that? That's good. Please welcome Ross Schulman. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, so <clears throat> this morning, to get us started, Mitchell Baker gave a very interesting keynote and laid out four, I guess they'd call them principles. Uh, for the web that Mozilla believes in. And the first principle was titled uh, immediate, but one thing that I noticed is that the very first word of that sentence was safe. Uh, a little later on, Vint in his keynote also talked about 
the safety aspects of the archived web and, and what happens when we come across malware. And I think it was really great to see those first two keynotes dive right into what is a topic that is dear to my heart, and that is the security of the network. And I think that the security of the network is a topic that comes up when you talk about centralized systems, but it's absolutely a topic that comes up when you want to talk about decentralized systems as well. And so that's going to be the focus of our panel today. We're going to talk about um, two sort of aspects. First is going to be what can we learn from centralized systems, because there are some aspects of security in a centralized system that we can export to our decentralized world and, and, and make the best use of. And then we're also going to try to talk about what's unique to, to a decentralized system and how we can use the, the features of a decentralized system to best, uh, you know, um, I guess, protect the users. So um, I want to talk uh, briefly about our panelists. So uh, Paige, sitting nearest to me, uh, is, came to uh, decentralization through a fascinating uh, avenue, and that is art study. Uh, so uh, I believe uh, Paige studied uh, distributed art in nature. Is that more or less right? Um, and, then, and then turned that into her current role uh, at Made Safe um, in decentralized technology. Um, next to her is Mike Perry. Um, you know, uh, Mike Perry, I think it's safe to say, is one of the fundamental, one of the few people who make it possible that, uh, for Iranians and Chinese people to access, access the same World Wide Web as the rest of us. He is uh, one of the primary authors of the Tor Browser Bundle. Thank you, Mike, for all your work on that. Yes. <laughs> Brian Warner told me that one of the most, recent, uh, most interesting things about him is that uh, he shares a name with Marilyn Manson, whose uh, real name is also Brian Warner. Um, and he used to get phone calls from rabid fans just going through the phone book and apparently calling uh, every Brian Warner in, them, in there and refusing to believe that he was not Marilyn Manson, which I think is <laughs> pertinent to both security questions and some of the naming issues that we've been... <laughs> he, literally, he literally lived in a naming collision for a long, long time. Um, and, but uh, also happened to build one of the, uh, one of the early decentralized file uh, exchange programs uh, at uh, Firefox Sync uh, and has resurrected the idea in a newer and better form uh, for Magic Wormhole. So we're going to hear from him. And then finally on the end, but certainly not least, uh, Van Jacobson. Uh, if you don't know him uh, because of his work on the TCP IP stack, uh, you can thank him for having access to the internet essentially. Um, and now is doing a, a really deep dive on content addressed uh, storage through the uh, named data networking project, which I'm excited to hear more about. So um, I want to start with a question for all of you, um, and a real basic question. So for those of you in the audience who are not security engineers, uh, when we start talking about security, the first thing that we ask is, what is our threat model? And it's essentially to say, what is it that we're protecting against? And this can be every, anything from a script kitty running something that he downloaded off of IRC to, you know, the NSA or China's PLA and, or, uh, or anything in between. And it's important to know what your threat model is before you engage in this because not everybody needs to defend against the NSA in, in their projects. And, uh, and, and what your threat model is is going to determine uh, what, your, uh, what your appropriate level of security is. And so I want to start by asking, you know, the projects that you guys work on, what's your threat model? Who do you imagine is coming after you or your users? Uh, and that will set us up to talk about sort of um, what, what we're going to do to protect them uh, going forward. So just, <coughs> yeah, Paige. So um, I guess with uh, a centralized network, you kind of have this party to protect the people using it and um, uh, the, the network as a whole. But it, with the decentralized projects, such as Project Safe uh, by the company I work for, Made Safe, uh, it's a completely open network, so people can join it. And therefore, you have to build insecurities where you're protecting against um, a large actor from being able to flood that network with a lot of uh, participants without you know necessarily being able to know that so by building in a sort of autonomous way to detect uh, new nodes um, we think that uh, this can be sort of a revolutionary idea for not necessarily needing to know who is participating in the network but instead allowing the network to monitor itself and sort of detect uh, when nodes are not acting as they should be. So 
in in that sense, uh, Project SAFE and the SAFE network is kind of um, taking the autonomous route and using uh, parts of the routing protocol to to build in the security of nodes kind of watching over each other and watching the data itself. Uh, Mike, what's Tor's, I, I think I have an, I, I think I know the answer to this, but what's Tor's threat model? Uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, basically we know that anonymity benefits from company and the more users and the more types of users use Tor, uh, basically the better the anonymity and privacy properties are for everyone. Um, so that basically means that we have to take into all, a great number of threats that, uh, that our users face, from things as simple as just not wanting to be tracked from website to website on the web while you're, while you're browsing various things, from nation state level censorship that's trying to block access to certain websites or the Tor network itself, and in some cases also trying to exploit uh, users of the Tor network to figure out it, it, what they're up to and what they're talking about. Um, you, we also have adversaries that may try to become part of the te Tor network or monitor portions of it, and and defending against that is a is another set of problems. So um, it's, there's quite a w wide scope of things. I guess if we had to sum up uh, basically our approach to security in a single phrase, it would be eliminating single points of failure. Uh, yeah. um, Brian. Yeah, my project is Tahoe LFS. It's a distributed storage thing, store files and directories, kind of like Google Drive. Um, it's very similar to MadeSafe in a lot of different ways. And it was designed to let you store those files on other people's computers. And so you don't want to have to trust those computers. So I guess our threat model says that we assume that your endpoint, your computer, is safe and you've managed to protect it against um, malware, viruses. But you have minimal trust, minimal reliance upon the servers that you are putting your data onto. You know, we, we encrypt everything before it leaves your box. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do a certain amount of er erasure coding, redundancy, so that not all of those different servers still have to be present when you want to get your files back again. So we're trying to allow the user to use those servers uh, but not have to depend upon them completely. So our threat model you know, is, is everything outside of our own box. We need some service from them, but not perfect security from them. Um, but we're aiming at a much lower bar than something like Tor, right? As we're not trying to provide against, uh, protect against privacy leaks, not trying to hide who it is you're talking to, but simply protect your data against the actions of the people outside your computer. Okay. And Ben? Uh, well, name data networking is about universal access to information. Uh, sort of pushing the web model down to an infrastructure layer. Uh, you can attack both nouns and that. You can attack the access and you can attack the information. Uh, on the information side, we make producers of information sign it. We don't care about the meaning of keys, but you have to sign it. The signature lets the network check that the data hasn't been corrupted, so you can't forward corrupted information. The higher level parts of the signature, what namespace it came from, uh, its trust chain, let the receiver decide whether or not they want to trust it and accept it. Because we started, we wanted to turn around the incentive structure where right now senders have a lot of power and receivers have basically nothing. They have to eat what they're fed. We wanted to s set it up so receivers get the entire choice. The, it, it sort of enables the safety properties of the network. And the incentive of the sender is if you wanted to accomplish something, if you want this message to be read, you'd better provide enough credentials that the receiver is going to read it. And it's the burden of proof is sitting on the sender side and that lets it evolve over time. So if it's not good enough, if it can be attacked, then you have to make it better. And it's going to be the sender's responsibility. Otherwise, they're wasting their bits. Uh, the other side, attacking the access is, say, you can use any and all connections that you've got to the internet uh, to ask your questions. And that includes storage. So it's perfectly acceptable to put the answer to a question on a USB stick and carry it over to a device. Uh, and we put no linkage between 
users and endpoint identifiers and the questions they ask. You can view it as you broadcast your question from a broadcast address. If you're more than one hop away, you can't tell who asked. Yeah. You can see the question if it's in the clear. You can see the answer if it's in the clear and it can be encrypted. But you can't tell who it's going to. Uh, there are no node addresses at all. So uh, you kind of get reader privacy by default. Interesting. Interesting. So yeah, and I think you touched on something I think is actually really interesting, and that is that oftentimes we think about security as the integrity of the data itself, and then that we want to keep that safe and secure from others. But uh, another, another aspect of security that it behooves us to think about, and one in which I think actually decentralized systems have a benefit over centralized, is in denial of access. Um, or, 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 or a DOS attack, a denial of service attack, in which uh, a, C a decentralized service may have better resiliency against that kind of attack. So that's a really interesting point. Um, I want to take a second to ask you guys to do what we call sort of red teaming uh, in security. And, th and that's basically, you know, if you, if you can take off your hat as, as sort of the developer of the project and put on the hat of, of someone who's an attacker, how would you go about... Um, attacking the system that you're building right now, it's often a really good way to think about how you can improve it. And, and Mike, I wonder if I can start with you, because as the developer of the Tor Browser Bundle, you've probably done this once or twice. And, and I, I wonder if you can sort of kick us off and talk about what you've learned in, in prior, prior Red Team. So I guess I can talk about a lot of my experiences uh, as the technical lead of the Tor Browser. Uh, I did a lot of this thinking um, in terms of where are, again, the single points of failure in our development process and, and how the network works and how we distribute the software. Um, one of the things that became most concerning to me was that the developers of the Tor Browser were actually very vulnerable to them being compromised themselves as, and being used as a vector to attack our users. So that's what led me to, to develop the reproducible build system for the Tor browser to make sure that basically anybody could take our source code and compile it and get exactly the same binaries bit for bit as the developers do, uh, which protects both the users and the developers um, from either coercion or compromise uh, for demands for backdoors or, or what have you. Um, so that was one of my va major concerns as wearing the, the Tor browser hat. Um, well, I've also done stuff on the network and, and have tried to do various forms of network scanning and uh, protections against certain types of statistical attacks to bias uh, routes through Tor. Um, I might have to think a minute to rank my <laughs> fears of what is currently <laughs> most threatening the Tor network, though. So. Yeah, and might not want to mention it on camera. I yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> this is fair. how I think you should do it right, right now. Right, exactly. This is what I would do next if I was attacking Tor. Uh, Brian, did you have like... Yeah, we've, uh, we've gone through exercises like that uh, over time, and we've had a, a long-running uh, hack, uh, hack Tahoe contest mm -hmm. where we'll make up a T-shirt with the details of your attack if you can successfully find a flaw in it. And in the first couple of years, that uncovered a lot of assumptions that we'd made. A lot of them have to do with the data integrity properties that we thought would be in there. Um, one person found an attack where you could upload a carefully crafted file you get back the file handle that's supposed to give back exactly those same bits. And if you were sneaky about it, then there could be two different versions of the file. And depending upon which servers you had access to, at the time you downloaded it, you might get version A, you might get version B. That can be used, um, you know, you could say, I'm going to sign this contract that says I'm going to give you a dollar, and then actually I reveal a contract that says I'm going to give you a million dollars. So we've learned a lot about the assumptions that we had going into it. Um, and shortcuts that we took early on in the development process that turned out to be a bad idea. Um, As they so often do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've definitely learned a lot from it. Um, for our system, you know, a lot of the attacks, we, we think we have most of the external attacks taken care of because we've had that contest running for such a long time and we haven't had to make up a new t-shirt in several years now. Um, so I'm mostly worried these days about attacks against developer, attack against the deployment process. When you install Tahoe, how do you know you're getting the right bits? Um, that, that vector is something that, because our process is in Python, we don't have this compilation step. Uh, we can't use some of those reproducible build tools that the other projects have been putting together. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Van, I wonder, I, I know that having worked at Google prior to the, um, and, and worked with the security team, I know that red teaming is something that's 
that's very popular there. I wonder if you've, you've gone through similar, uh, I mean, I know that NDN is sort of a, a protocol as well as a software stack, so it may be unique and interesting. I wonder if you can talk about any red teaming you've done. Uh, it, so we've got, uh, the protocol's fairly mature. The project's been going uh, for at least six years actively. Uh, we've got a global scale test bed that's running. Uh, we've invited student red teams to attack the test bed, all the codes on GitHub, so uh, it's fairly easy for them to look for vulnerabilities. All of the cracks so far have been uh, in the Linux system that's hosting NDN and not in NDN, which has made us happy. We tried to raise the bar on that a bit by uh, we have, we're currently uh, providing the network infrastructure for the UCLA campus building management systems. Uh, we thought we would expose at least the monitoring part of uh, one of the buildings where we could get permission to uh, student red teams and tie it to a grade. So if you crack the protocols, it's an automatic A. Uh, we thought that would be enough incentive for them to work on cracking the protocols, and there hasn't been a success on that yet. The, it's sort of harder to do in NDN because you can't answer a question that wasn't asked. The, hmm. the receiver enables the communication. They, they say, I'm interested in data that matches this prefix. Uh, so you can't generate unsolicited data. You can't port scan. You, you can't do uh, can't look for buffer overflows via arbitrary responses. So a lot of the attacks that we know how to mount in the IP protocol suite, you can't mount in NDN. That hopefully is by design, but it's also partly newness, which is why we'd like to have more attackers. So that story actually brings me on to sort of what I, I think our next, uh, what I wanted to be our next topic, and that is, you know, things that we can learn from a centralized uh, security model and, and, and export, and in particular that this idea of sort of um, competitions to hack or and or bug bounties. Um, and, and Brian, I think you mentioned in passing sort of this uh, this the bug uh, bug bounty program that you guys run. Can you talk a little bit more about how Tahoe does it? Uh, yeah. So um, it's. Uh, like a bug bounty program, but because we don't have, uh, because it's a volunteer project, because we don't really have any money to spend on this stuff, um, what we can give you is recognition and fame and a t-shirt. Um, it has been pretty successful for us. Uh, one thing that, that your question made me think of was a difference between a decentralized system and a more centralized one. There are advantages that the centralized systems have that we can't really take advantage of. So we don't have a lot of information about what our users are doing or how they're using it. You know, it, 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 and Tor has this problem in spades, right? Mm -hmm. How do you simultaneously not monitor people and also discover that they're having problems? So we don't know if people are running out-of-date versions of Tahoe. We don't know if people are seeing uh, cryptographic failures or integrity checking failures that would indicate that somebody is trying to attack them and be getting caught, but that might give them information they could react to. You know, maybe they should be looking at their systems more carefully if there are a lot of near misses. And because we don't have the instrumentation, we don't really want to be, see, to be looking at our users' activities that closely, we don't have that work. Mm -hmm. Whereas a centralized system, there's a graph somewhere that says, you know, Chrome reports back when it sees a certificate failure. Mm -hmm. And that gives them immediate feedback that somebody out there has misissued a certificate. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I wish that we had that kind of, of information. We could help. Yeah. Um, Paige, I, you know, I think uh, one of the really interesting things that Made Safe uh, Project sort of recently decided to do was to uh, rewrite uh, a lot of its code. Uh, and you chose an interesting language to me, and I think it's uh, something that, uh, that's coming out of um, sort of the old world is this idea of safer languages as a, as a starting point. So can you talk about the decision to move to, I think it was Rust, if, I'm, if I recall correctly, and, what, and how that's playing out in, in terms of safety? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of the history of the project, it, um, this is uh, over a decade old project of um, mainly starting with research, but the implementation began in C++, um, I'd say five or six years ago, with um, 
you know, the intention of building out this, um, this really secure network. However, over time, um, a lot of new features and ideas got added and it kind of became this big uh, sort of monolithic code base, which, so, which came to realization that it needed to be refactored anyway. So it was a good point for us to rethink about the actual language we were gonna rewrite it in. And at that point, um, Rust, this was actually um, a little over a year ago when Rust was hitting 1.0. And um, the founder of MadeSafe, David Irvine, he decided that this would be the best switchover um, in terms of the, the safety of the language um, and the ability for uh, developers to write safe code. So C++ is uh, you know, a, a brilliant language if you know how to use it properly. However, if uh, if we're gonna be reaching out to kind of newer developers which are looking for more modern languages, um, this is definitely the, the best route to take and especially for the long term. And uh, one last question in this, uh, in this sort of thread. I wanted to ask, I think, Mike. Um, there's a, there's a, a problem that uh, and the reason I want to ask you is because the Tor browser problem, uh, bundle had this problem of automatic updates. Uh, and we saw in an old version of the Firefox that you guys use, it was not automatically updating, which led to a problem when we found a, a real error in Firefox that, that sort of would, could ha have the potential to expose Tor users. And I, can I, I wanted, if you can go back to talk about why that wasn't on and then what, what you've sort of seen solved now that it is on. Um, so basically, the reason why it wasn't on was uh, engineering resources on our side. It was basically just myself and Aaron Clark um, limping along trying to keep up with Mozilla uh, and not really having a whole lot of development time to devote to um, an actual automatic updater. It was after we started to get additional funding to hire on more developers, uh, uh, thanks to OTF, actually, that we were able to devote the engineering resources to doing that automated updater and, and making sure that we got releases sa the same day as Mozilla Firefox. Um, interestingly, that updater was also a, like a, a point of contention and concern with respect to security, like can it be man in the middle? Are we exposing users into more uh, security issues if we're just giving them updates, whereas normally if they're doing it manually, they'd be de verifying the GPG signatures or whatever. Uh, so we needed to make sure that we had at least as good security for that updater, uh, if not better, than what the people man were doing manually. And we believe we achieved that. So. Great. So I want to talk, I want to, you know, it, it seems like there's a lot that, for, as, a, on a, and as, as a decentralized platform, we can learn from and, and pull in from, from what's gone before. I want to talk about some of the unique challenges and solutions that, that being decentralized offers us. Um, and I think one of the most interesting and, and sort of perhaps the most fundamental is that um, being decentralized raises but also gives you the tool to solve a whole category of trust and or identity problems. Um, and and I, I'm going to throw this out for, for any of you. What are the unique, do you feel like, trust problems or identity problems that you're, you're coming in, into contact with and, and, and what, are, what are the solutions that being decentralized offers you? <laughs> if anyone has an answer to that. Ben? I'll jump in. Yeah. In uh, a principle of the internet architecture was uh, its location independence and the fact it didn't know about location, and that was great. It allowed it to extend over the entire world. But uh, we're using NDN on a lot of Internet of Things problems. Um, I put. All, all the lights in my house are smart, uh, not using NDN, unfortunately, using vendor solutions. When we lose the internet, we can no longer turn the lights on or off. And that's, my wife feels that's my fault. And, <laughs> uh, and it's broken. I mean, it's really fundamentally broken. I don't ever intend to export the things in my house to the internet, but it's, uh, very hard to build a wall <laughs> around that system. You have to put a lot of energy into the wall. Uh, 
we made the end to end architecture be very sensitive to locality and uh, you don't if you want data to go globally then you have to have globally meaningful names if you want it to stay local use local names and it's really easy to firewall them because the boundaries say I'm never going to propagate a query in this namespace across my boundary. So you're saying so so you're using essentially physical locality as a proxy for trust in some sense. Uh, we're trying to guarantee the physical locality. We've got the signing uh, gives you a guaranteed locality of the system because our trust routes are within the namespace where you want the trust to happen. So I generate a trust route for the house every authorization certificate, every capability cert in the system derives from that trust route. And so nobody can make a mistake and act on a command from outside the system because they don't have the cert that would let them issue the command. They yeah. can't publish in the namespace. Yeah. But also don't want information leaking in and out so somebody can do signals intelligence on it. I mean, I just would like it to be black. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important property of a distributed system is you can take advantage of locality for context, for location limited channels that is impossible in a centralized system because the centralized system is in one place and it has to reach every place. Yeah. So I want to open it up for questions here. And while people come up to the mic, I'm going to throw one last question uh, at you, Mike. Um, uh, and I just because I wanted to follow up on the single point of failure comment that you made earlier. Can you expand on that a little bit and just talk about what that means for you? Um, yeah, so I guess uh, with respect to Tor, we have taken a whole bunch of measures to avoid there being a single machine, cryptographic key, or infrastructure, um, or person that you can compromise in order to completely destroy the security of the Tor network. Uh, this starts with the Tor directory authorities, of which there are nine, that what they do is all agree on the list of nodes in the Tor network. And, given hour, and then they all sign a, do a document cryptographic cryptographically such that um, in order to forge this document, the adversary would have to steal the majority of their keys and comprom compromise the majority of these machines. Uh, so several machines have to be compromised. Just like with the updater, uh, we sign the individual packages with an offline key, and then additionally, they're, uh, they're protected by HTTPS, which is on a different system. Um, uh, so you have, we have at least two keys there, and we're looking into further strengthening that by adding updates to the uh, consensus, the same Tor consensus document. Um, the Tor path itself, you have to be able to be observing both the entrance and the exit or playing games in order to like redirect your, your path. Um, and additionally, we're obviously looking to always eliminate these further single points of failure, so to be honest, uh, exploits against the browser and the client software still remains a single point of failure where somebody can become de-anonymized if they're able to be targeted, mm -hmm. which is a little bit hard with an anonymity network, but in some cases it can be done, mm -hmm. uh, especially for if you're going after a particular site or username. Um, so for that, we obviously want to have multiple layers of protection, things like uh, sandbox around the browser, uh, making things like tails, uh, and cubes with uh, who next easier to use, um, basically having those that single removing those single points of failure in that context basically means a defense in depth. Um, yeah. Let's go to the questions. to preserve, at some level, reader privacy, um, to be able to make it more difficult to find out who's read what. And BitTorrent has sort of famously goes and advertises all the things that you have on your uh, machine and makes that available quite publicly as part of its, its system. Help! <laughs> uh, is there something that we can learn from uh, Tor Network, for instance, to, to at least make some progress towards this, or are we just so screwed, give up, or 
Uh, what do we do from here to try to provide some level of reader privacy that's smoothly upgradable from the current web for distributed web? Um, Other than run everything over, over Tor. But. I, basically, it is run everything over Tor. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and there are two points to that. One of them is by running everything over Tor, you add to the Tor user base, and, and anonymity loves company. So the more products that can use Tor by default, the better the situation is. And you need to deal with the, the performance problems, the latency problems that you're likely to get there. But for many applications, you know, email type things, that's not such a big deal. Um, the other principle that we found, we, we try to make it possible to layer Tahoe on top of Tor. We have a lot of work going on right now um, to make that easy and to let you just throw a couple of configuration switches to turn that on. Uh, it's very easy in decentralized distributed programs to leak information about who or where you are because that makes it easier to go and find those other peers. So BitTorrent does that at such a low level that it's awfully hard to go and rip that out. You know, you have to go in and modify the code to not reveal your IP address. There's no way of changing the, the BitTorrent DHT to store an onion address instead of an IP address to connect to somebody. So um, as, a, as a protocol developer, and uh, I would advise people who are walking through this to think about that early and make sure you don't hardwire yourself into something that will reveal information that you would like to hide later. I would also like to add that um, there's kind of this essential property that Tor has, which is uh, obfuscating the traffic, and perhaps other projects can implement that, that property as well, but it really it does come down to sort of hopping in between these participants in the network to obfuscate where the original traffic came from, so just keeping that kind of property in mind and being able to shuffle things around and make data look like all other data is is the kind of primary key to what they're doing and what other projects can do if they want to try a similar thing. So hop I'd around. Hop, hop around. around and hop make around. data look the same. <laughs> but at, at, but at, at, at its root, um, obfuscating uh, metadata to protect against transmission analysis is, is difficult. It is a very, very hard problem. Several times attacks against developers rather than code were mentioned. Uh, are there any examples you could share? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I, don't I remember the details too closely, but there was a Linux kernel. Somebody tried to, to drop a patch into the Linux kernel uh, Git repository or like the FTP repository yeah. and managed know. to get it onto the FTP server for a couple of hours before somebody noticed it. Uh, I don't think that was an at attack against a particular developer, but by going after a part of the infrastructure, they could trick a few people into downloading a modified version of the source code for some period of time. Right. Yeah, I don't know of any actual cases of threats against developers leading to code. Because, you know, it seems to me that this would be a really simple thing to do for some people. Yeah, it, it is uh, a little bit easier these days as the defender there because we're all using Git, we're all using distributed version control systems. And so when my machine pushes a patch, all of my colleagues take a look at it when it comes back down. And if they see something fishy, they're going to call me on the phone and say, hey, was that you? What's going on? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's this old adage that many eyes make bugs shallow. Um, I'm not sure how convinced I am that that's actually the case, but... Uh, so remote instrumentation, do you think uh, it's very useful for like a lot of aspects, but of course there's a privacy concept. Do you think that those are overcomable at all? Do you think we can actually have useful and private like remote instrumentation for like crashes or like, you know, any of those problems? Or is it just something you give up and look at other avenues for instead? So uh, at Tor, we, create, we collect uh, limited metrics about uh, our number of daily users in an aggregate sense from the network um, without individual user tracking identifiers. We are in the process of trying to collect more user onboarding failures to figure out like, okay, how many people, we know how many people download the browser, how many people then successfully launch it after that for that platform, how many people then like will click on a like, couple of aspects of the UI for the first time. Basically these first run counts I think are very easy to do without requiring unique identifiers or user tracking. Uh, things like scrubbing cra crash reports is a much deeper challenge. We're hoping to look into that um, in the next year or so to figure out what, like, what we can do with the Firefox crash reporter and like how much of that is actually sensitive. And yeah. So we've got only just one more minute, so if all three of you could ask your question and we'll try to grab as many of as much as we can. 
Um, so given the difficulty in creating secure code, there's this programming methodology where you basically have your security policy running in parallel code, running to, alongside your mainline code, and then you're basically monitoring it for security policy violations. And I just wanted to know if that was a valid, you know, what you thought of that as a programming methodology. Okay. I would love to hear uh, the panelists talk about design and, and mostly uh, the, the, the core interaction design and, and the overall user experience of your product or service uh, as opposed to visual design, mainly because um, I don't know very much about security, but my understanding is that many security failures are not because the, the technology itself sucks, it's because uh, users don't use it correctly or they, um, it's too foreign to them because the, the protocol is, is very different from what they're used to. Um, by the same token, many security protocols that work are not widely adopted because uh, um, users just never, never use them. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I've been asking a question at every conference I've been to, and I even asked Bruce Schneier, who helped inspire this system. And this is the one system, I'm zero for hundreds now, no one has ever heard of this system. And so with regard to reader privacy, there was something in 2006 called Off System, or the Owner Free File System, that unlike a dark net like Freenet that tries to you know, hide stuff through encryption and mixed nets, it actually uses multi-use block encoding so that the more data an adversary, even a state level adversary collects, it actually becomes harder to tell what the user is downloading. So I'm just curious, has anyone in this room ever heard of Off System? Yeah, one right there. This is the first time ever. You guys should get, <laughs> so, go get, you can go get coffee. <laughs> so looking into those principles is, I'd say, something to look at because even against a state level adversary, it's, it's similar to how a one time pad, you know, the, there's just no way, there's too much entropy. So the more data that gets transmitted, yeah. the harder it is to dig your way out. So, so um, the, I, I thought about the UI um, uh, yeah. design question there. One big challenging problem with a lot of these systems is that the special thing they're doing is hidden, and if you're doing it well, then nobody notices that it's going right. You know, it's like the plumbing. If the plumbing is good, nobody notices it. You only know if there's a problem. So it's particularly difficult to figure out what these systems are doing from you, for you just by watching somebody using it. And we don't have a lot of good, uh, or Tahoe does not have a lot of good visualization tools to discover that encryption is taking place, that redundancy is taking place. And I think um, that's, a, that's a design challenge. That is a, what is the user interaction with this and how can they learn from it that we haven't really solved well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was actually gonna talk about perhaps I was, I was gonna actually talk about Tor for a second, but <laughs> um, <laughs> Go for just it. in, and how it would relate to the system that MadeSafe is building. I think perhaps one of the uh, biggest things that, uh, or obstacles Tor has is that it's relating back to the normal internet and um, you know, you're introducing this insecure system into the secure into the secure system. So by building a system that's completely segregated, um, you can sort of avoid a lot of the problems that perhaps um, come with exit nodes and whatnot with Tor. Um, but in terms of design and uh, user interface, uh, there definitely it does need to be like this sense of importance because with decentralized systems, a lot of things. A lot of the security problems do get pushed to the edges, to the nodes themselves. So, if you're the one, if you're one person interacting with the network, then um, you need to understand that, uh, you know, for example, if you are the owner of your private key, that you need to be protecting it with um, with all you have, because if you lose that, then you lose your access or. Um, other people can discover your data. So there definitely is this importance of kind of user um, responsibility that needs to be uh, talked about more within the community. That's one thing I particularly like about Bitcoin, is teaching people to care about endpoint security because now your money is on the line, not just your computer. Well, thanks, and uh, th join me in thanking our panelists for an awesome uh, discussion. Thanks to, thanks so much to Ross Schulman, Brian Warner, Mike Perry, Van Jacobson, and Paige Peterson. Thank you so much. Please give them a round of applause. Okay, we are in a break, but I want to say one thing. You want to come back because we're going to be showing you some demos when we come back. Also, somebody lost some keys, go see the front desk. 
Come back for a video at 425 of all the entrepreneurs on the decentralized web. We'll see you at 425. And if you are in the last panel, come on down. Come on down and talk to me. Thank you. Okay. Can you come my mic? Shiny. Hi. Sit here.
Okay, everyone, you won't want to miss this panel because very little talking, very little, lots and lots of action. We're going to start demoing things, but before we do, before we do, we want to show you a video about enterprise on the decentralized web. We shot this last year at a great, great conference put on by uh, Joaquin Locomp called Get D. It was here in San Francisco at the Red Vic and here at the Internet Archive. Take a look at Enterprise on the Web. I'm Ryan Taylor, and the project that I'm working on is called Alexandria. I'm Christy Dames from San Francisco, and I'm the founder of Experience Medicine. Marcus Sabatello from Vienna, working on the Freedom Box project. I'm Kaspar Schleiser. Um, I'm from Berlin, and I'm here from, for the Riot team. Riot, it's, um, it's an operating system for Internet of Things devices, like, like these things. By putting Riot and developing Riot, um, we hope to push through open standards and, and open communities to give people actually uh, the trust in their devices back. And so you're not tied to, to any company and you just have control over your data and over your sensors at home. The project that I'm building is called Project Alexandria. And it is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer library for all types of media that exists on the internet. And it's, um, it's a client that will run on people's computers, so it runs completely serverless. You have everything in your hand to actually make decentralized systems, so you're not tied to any vendor or any specific silo. This is Freedom Box. It's a basically a small device, a personal server. The idea is you plug it in at home and it gives you privacy and it, it helps you basically own part of the infrastructure. So it's the, it's the opposite idea of the cloud, basically. I'm working on a project that involves parents, and primarily been driven by moms of children who are chronically ill from very early on in their life. What a device like this can do is it can host your own part of that distributed web. We are building a decentralized web protocol that will help parents help their children get well. The technical capabilities of building whatever it is that we as a society want are in our hands today. And it gives people the ability to have a say in how their society looks and is operated. That's Enterprise on the Decentralized Web. Beautiful. I'd like to call up my last panel. Come on up, you guys. I want you to just come and get your mics. And we decided, you know, we had this whole plan, and it was all about um, 
journal literature and how you would use decentralized technologies to unlock science. And I think that's a good topic. It's a fantastic topic. But I think you guys have listened to enough words. So because I get to run this thing, I told my panelists, let's just get rid of that topic. I want you to just show me stuff. Show me what you can do. This is not theoretical, right? Right? A lot of you have been working like crazy on this because Brewster said, hey, could you, could you make like a website that is distributed? Could, could you make like a Dropbox that's distributed? He, he, he said all these crazy challenges. So let's see what you, can, you came up with. All right, so we call this the moonshot challenge, but we're really talking about interoperability. And we wanted to give it some kind of tangible goal so that you wouldn't talk about interoperability, but you would show us what you can do together. So we're still gonna ask you to do that. Let me introduce you to each of my panelists. They're great guys. I've come to know them quite well over the last few months. The first is Juan Benet. Now, Juan Benet is the founder of IPFS, and I think of Juan as being kind of like the Johnny Appleseed of the decentralized web. I mean, he is everywhere. You know, he's dropping seeds here, he's dropping in there, he's talking to Vint, he's talking to Brewster, he's all over the world. I don't know how this man sleeps, uh, but he has done a fantastic job. And when you talk to people, many people are building on top of the protocol IPFS. Juan, tell us in three sentences or less what IPFS F is. What does it stand for, in fact? IPFS stands for the Interplanetary File System. And the goal is to make the web capable of working across planets, which is a tall order when you think about how the web works today. Uh, the point is to think about websites as divorced from location, uh, as being content addressed or addressed by public key, so that we can move around the content <laughs> from one host to another and load it there as if it was local. Uh, we take a lot of constraints like making sure that our stuff works for developing world where people don't have uh, very great, great connectivity, where latency is bad, bandwidth is terrible, and so on. Uh, we care a lot about making sure the web is uh, decentralized uh, in terms of control so that website creators can build their stuff and push it out to the network, but users retain control of their data. Uh, and users retain control of, of the ability to use applications. We see software as a superpower of, of granting other people superpowers. And when you give somebody else a superpower that's locked up to some location, if they can't access that location, then that superpower isn't very good. Uh, so we, we really care about uh, lifting the web from its location. Well, thank you. You have dedicated your life to that. The next panelist is Trent McConaughey. Uh, Trent started as kind of a chip developer. He spent, had a very successful career in that. And then I think he just kind of woke up and said, you know, I want to do something different with my life. And um, the thing I love about Trent is that he grew up in outer, outer Saskatchewan, right, where his only source of information as he was growing up was at his local library where they had four books on computer science, the most recent of which was from 1970. And <laughs> So it was like an incredible boon to Trent when he got to the university and he had all this scientific literature to read. And he became, do you have your PhD? No? Yes. He has his PhD. He's Dr. Trent McConaughey and he's written several books. Um, and when his books sell for $100, Trent gets how much? $1. And Springer, his publisher, gets $99. And yet, He's eager to keep perpetuating this scholarly publishing model because that's the way it works. Next, tell me in three sentences what IPDB stands for and Big Chain DB. Sure. So actually, um, we, it started with we saw our artist friends creating amazing digital art, not getting paid, hardly able to feed their families. And we said, we started with the question, could you own digital art the way you own Bitcoin? Because if collectors can collect digital art somehow and have provenance, then our friends could feed their families. And we pulled on the thread. It worked, it worked, it worked. We built out this project called Describe. I'll show it later. And um, then we ran into a problem. As more and more people were using it and larger sites wanted to use it, 
there was a scale challenge. It was brought up earlier today. Um, I was trying to bug a bunch of friends to, to uh, you, draw on scale to figure out how to scale things up. Many people are working on it. We said, well, there's already these amazing technologies out there that scale incredibly well. Um, let's leverage them, distributed databases that are centralized, and let's figure out how to decentralize them. So we did that. That's, that became BigchainDB. It's a decentralized database at scale. And then we said, now that we have this software, let's make a public version of this that we can roll out to the planet uh, for anyone, anywhere. And that is IPDB, Interplanetary Database. It's meant to sit side by side with IPFS, the file system and the database. They have a shared data format, which is IPLD and amazing. Um, so kudos to, to Juan uh, for, for that effort. And overall, um, that's what we've been rolling out. So IPDB is really this database for the planet with global consistency of your data that anyone can see, anyone can use. Okay, so let me get this straight. You have the interplanetary file system, you have the interplanetary database, and now you have the interplanetary linked data. Yeah, so they have the common data format. And what that means is basically the walls among these different ways of storing data are permeable. So you can have this chunk of data and it can just kind of flow around. It can be living in IPFS, it can be living in IPDB, it can be living in, in, in DAT, anywhere you want, and um, it doesn't matter. It's just there, and that's highly exciting. Now, how many people on this panel are using IPLD? How about in the room? Pretty good, pretty good. Okay. Next, I wanna go to Evan Schwartz. Um, Evan went to Brown University. You know where you can just kind of make up your own major and then they'll let you study anything with no requirements just about? And he made up his own major, political science and education, and he coded. And when he, but what he's really interested in, he told me, is the future of money. So somehow this big um, am amalgamation of political science and fascination with money and coding led him to Interledger. Tell me what Interledger is about. Sure, so Interledger is an internet protocol for money. And so a, a lot of people in this conference have talked about adding incentives to things, adding compensation to things. We've talked a lot about how do we add compensation to the decentralized web? How do we get people to use it? So Interledger is, is a protocol for doing payments across different networks. And the way that we look at it is all different payment networks uh, we think of as ledgers. So Bitcoin is a payment network. Uh, you can pick any of your favorite digital wallet that's a payment network um, or a ledger. Uh, Ethereum is a ledger. All of these are different ledgers. And we, the problem today is that if we want to build payments into something, we basically have to pick one um, or pick many. But ultimately, the sender and the recipient have to be on the same network in order for this to work which is terrible. This is why when you go to pay for something, you see all this my these myriad options. But this problem has already been solved for information. It was the internet. Um, the internet is a protocol for routing packets of data across disparate networks. And so this is what Interledger is doing for money. It's about routing packets of money across different networks, whether they are blockchains or other types of ledgers. And what's exciting about that is that lets you build payments into your other kinds of protocols in a way that is completely agnostic to what ledger it's actually using. Thank you, Evan. Next is Dennis Nazaroff. Dennis started as an, a photographer, an art photographer, and he told me that he was fascinated by the fact that his work could spread virally, and yet knowledge about who made it had limits. And he wanted to address that problem through Media Chain. Dennis, tell me about Media Chain. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, so, Media Chain is an open universal media library, and it enables participants to collaboratively describe creative works in a decentralized system. And the goal of Media Chain is to connect creators directly to audiences through content itself. So, today, an image can easily go viral on the internet, and millions of people will see it, but it's very hard to know who actually made that. Uh, piece of content uh, and to connect to the creator directly. Uh, Media Chain in empowers developers and creators with technology similar to Shazam and uh, Google reverse image search to resolve to metadata about creative works in a decentralized network. So let me get this straight, Dennis. Vint Cerf writes many articles. He's an entity. 
and he's connected through Media Chain to his co-writers and through many to many different articles that he's written. And this is somehow immutable because of what Media Chain does. Yeah, I think uh, a paper is a great example of uh, a, a complex bundle that ref an entity that references many that consists of many other entities. And Media Chain will allow to basically a crypt cryptograph uh, cryptographically link these entities together in this collaborative system where the paper could start with you know referencing vent or or other participants or anything he references you know in this dynamic way but also enabled for people in the future to uh, verify his results uh, annotate it uh, extend it etc great thank you very much dennis and finally carissa mckelvey who I've gotten to know quite well. I'm, I'm so enjoying that relationship. Krissa um, was a PhD candidate in informatics. Yeah, that's right. And uh, then she got the call to go got and the help the DAT project leave academia behind and try and help all scientists by breaking open scientific data. Tell me about the DAT project. Yeah, I got really excited about DAT um, when I met Max. Um, in Oakland over coffee one day. And he was like, you're awesome. Let's just work together right now. Let's figure out how to do it. And um, one of the things that excited me the most was his focus on government data and opening government data, because I got um, my work in political science and computer science, and I was trying to fuse those. And <clears throat> for me, the most important part about that is that we can decentralize data in the way that universities and research labs are already decentralized. They're just not decentralized in the way that they should be in terms of their data storage and bandwidth. And so we can help people by being able to share their data in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion that can also be updated and checkpointed just like Git. So scientists can reference their data in a future-proof way in a content addressable hash. Okay, let's stop there because I think you lost half of our audience. Look, is what you're really saying that when you were your PhD candidate, right, you had data sets, you had code, you yep. had text, yep. and you wanted to share that maybe within your research group, but maybe one of your researchers was at Cal and one of them was at Oxford, and um, somehow using the decentralized web, using a hash that was immutable, you would be able to do that better. Is that what you're saying? Right, so when we're collaborating on data, we're actually reproducing people's research. So whether that person's in my lab or if that person's across the globe 10 years later, I should be able to reproduce my research and reference the data in the exact same way, even if the ser same server goes down, right? So if the right. data moves to a different server with a different HTTP link, I should be able to still reference that data. Right. Does that make sense? Right. That makes perfect sense. OK, so we have a protocol. We have a database. We have money going in every kind of currency. We have metadata, and we have data, data sets. And you're all working in decentralized ways. And if you could all come together, we'd have the whole package in a way, right? Now, this sounds good, but they say that a picture is worth a 1,000 words. So let's stop talking and show me what you got. Juan, go on up and show me what you can do with IPFS, the Interplanetary File System. And I think you have, this is a, a ta-da moment, right? This is an, an unveiling of something that you've been working on round the clock. So you guys are the first people to see this in a public setting. And you, in the live stream, this is really something very new. Cool. Hey, everyone. How's it going? This is a huge honor. First of all, thank you uh, for having all of us here and for organizing this. It is incredible to be here with everyone present from the latest generations of technology and the new and the hopeful projects and so on. So it's a very exciting day. Uh, we wanted to share some stuff with you and actually launch or slash release some stuff we've been working on uh, that we're really excited about. And in a big way, it's a huge thanks to Brewster because he kind of gave us the kick in the pants that we needed to, to get it done. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give you a, a tour very quickly through a few of the things that we're doing with IPFS. And so 
this is the current ipfs website uh, it's hosted on you know standard http and dns and hey but surprise it actually is you can view it through uh, what we're seeing right now is actually being served by ipfs somewhere some server out there in the network that we're running uh, is running ipfs for us and uh, my browser that does not speak IPFS uh, is able to access the IPFS network. Um, so let's say that, that I wanted to you know, install it and, and I download it and um, you know, I go through the install process and now I have some IPFS tool. Uh, the first thing we, we built was a, a toolkit uh, in Go uh, that is, it's, you can think of it like, think of it as a huge uh, package of tools to use IPFS um, for server side, typical stuff that you would do in the server side. Uh, and we had this ability of creating a node uh, that exposed an HTTP server locally so that we could get around the fact that browsers are not going to just adopt some random new protocol that comes up. Uh, you have to gain adoption first, and you have to, people have to use it. So we, we have this idea of saying, hey, that's fine. Um, you can add things to IPFS um, uh, through some command line tool. And this just added all these files to IPFS. And now we can view them locally. Uh, you know, this is my, my file system um, locally. So great, so I just added some files. Um, you know, I have some stuff locally. Uh, you know, I can see like the first web page on the internet uh, from, from Tim. And uh, maybe we can see uh, uh, a picture of a wonderful, beautiful man. Uh, you can see a picture of the world uh, and the planet. Uh, you can see a, uh, you know, some random stuff. You're like, okay, that's, that's not that exciting. I can do that with any kind of web server. But what happens if I now go to ipfs.io slash ipfs and so on? This is another server out there in the network. So when I hit enter now, uh, what's happening, what happened just there was that that uh, server used ipfs to search in the network for the content from my machine and pull it out. So we can still view stuff. Like I can save first and, and so on. Um, I can see that image. Um, I can look at you know some some stuff. Um, you know I can. I guess the browser decided to download this, but you know the, we can right there we're downloading a video, and we can use this to stream video and and so on. Um, but okay, that's fine. Uh, so that means I can I'm putting content into IPFS from my local machine and viewing it in some other server out there. But it's still kind of weird, right? Like the browser is not really running IPFS yet. Like it's still going through this other machine. In the command line, of course, we can use IPFS. Like we can, we can IPFS add stuff and IPFS get stuff, and like it feels very nice because it's, it's we can move things through the IPFS network. Um, but okay, let's let's suppose that I wanted to host a website on IPFS, right? So let's say I go to new site, um, and by the way, this says like MDNS lookup error. It's r IPFS right now is trying to find other IPFS nodes in this network and trying to connect to them. Um, so suppose that we wanted to. Uh, you know, I have here a a, um, a website, and uh, you know we can we can preview it with uh, you know typical type of stuff that we we would do. I'm remembering my Python <laughs> uh, localhost 8000. Uh, some file system. Cool. So this is a new website. Uh, we haven't shipped this website out to the world. It you know kind of talks about uh, IPFS and it's beautiful compared to our you know kind of old. Uh, more clunky thing. It's like kind of ugly. Uh, so this beautiful thing that was created by our friends at and yet, uh, we're shipping it out to the world. We're going to release it out to the world right now. Uh, so all I have to do is IPFS add that website, like that that uh, content. So right now it's added tons of images and so on, and I get back the root of that website, right? So I can view it locally in my own node, right? Slash IPFS slash this, and this should view you know this. New site, great. That's that's cool. That's the site on IPFS locally. What if I wanted to see it in the rest of the world? Uh, let's go to that IPFS.io website, and it's kind of fetching things from me, and now now it, uh, you see it. It's a little bit slower because it's pulling things out from my machine and then serving serving them back to me through the browser. Um, it's kind of doing this like wraparound thing. Uh, and great, like that's the full website. But you know, this is kind of like an ugly URL, right? Like we don't want to give this to to people. Um, so what we want to do is uh, Really ship this out to the to the rest of the world uh, in a way that uh, we can people can can uh, use it with a nice DNS name, right? So that's what we have this this ability to publish things to to um, DNS, and we can do other domains as well. But this is going to ship it to DNS, and now that set a text text record somewhere. So now uh, in about 60 or 120 seconds or so, you'll be able to go to ipfs.io and view the new website. Uh, we won't wait that long. 
because I want to show you something cooler. Oh, uh, I'm afraid your time yeah. is up for this. For, for the, uh, it's almost, uh, is it still, is it still 20 seconds? Or are we got, are five, we got? Oh man, my five minutes are over. Well, the last thing I want to tell you is that we have IPFS working in full JavaScript. So All right, you've got to show it. us that. Uh, All right. We'll done. show you. We'll show you this tomorrow, but uh, uh, there'll be a live stream tomorrow. Okay, I'll well, do it. Okay, you can uh, show us. You, you can show us. Show us. I just want to yeah? warn you guys to use your time right. wisely because five minutes goes fast. Okay? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I like. I'm so excited about the tech that uh, I get carried away. Um, uh, we'll go to this this thing that we call like to call Orbit. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer tech client, and this is right now using my IPFS node locally to fetch just a JavaScript bundle, and that JavaScript bundle has an IPFS node inside of it. Uh, and in it, we're going to go to you know, DWeb. Uh, and here, we're going to go another name. And so these are two different, uh, two different nodes that are going to start talking to each other. So I can say, hey. And I can say, hey. And I can type a lot of stuff. Uh, and if you want to join us, you can go to uh, orbit.libp2p.io. And if you go there right now, you should join this channel, and you may be able to chat with us. So we'll see what happens. Uh, meanwhile, I'll, uh, I'll drag and drop some stuff in here, um, like a video. I can just like drag and drop a video. And uh, right now, it's hashing it. And uh, we can see it there. We can play it here locally, of course, uh, and so on. But what about over here? We can, uh, oh, we, we are getting some people saying they're here. Uh, that's cool. And uh, sometimes it takes a, we're still working out a lot of the tech here, but sometimes it takes a while for this to transfer. Uh, so um, if I understand, you have, through the browser, just transferred a file without going through a server. So this is like a video YouTube with no central YouTube. This is a chat client with no origin server, no centralized thing whatsoever. Like this is a full like JavaScript client that is talking to another JavaScript uh, thing. Um, and talking through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connectivity, right? Like uh, these two tabs are talking to each other. Uh, Very good. Thank you, thank you Juan. Next you. up is Trent. All right, Trent, what are you going to show us? So uh, actually, I'll be showing uh, three things uh, or a sequence. Let's see here. I would show your best thing first because you might run out of time. Five minutes goes so fast. Let's see here. Uh, here we are. Okay. We had it for a second. So uh, I'll be actually showing, um, just like I described, uh, an evolution of three things. I'm going to actually elaborate on a bit with de um, demos and pointers to each. So it started out, um, actually we had the wonderful example earlier today with uh, Scott Draves, um, great, wonderful digital artist. Um, he can't make a full-time living doing that. He's working for a hedge fund in New York City. And, um, and that's actually really sad, right? Someone uh, who, um, with the quality of, of Scott Draves, um, isn't able to, um, to do that. So, here we are. Cool. Awesome. So, uh, what, what, what drove us initially was how do creators get compensated on the internet, right? Um, if I create a, a physical painting and I sell it for $100, $1,000, $10,000, it's pretty obvious, but um, why is it that my creativity is rewarded less if it happens to be in bits? And that's really you know, a big challenge. Um, and what we saw was, uh, the challenge was, it was about provenance. It was about the history of going from the creator to the next owner, to the next owner, to the next owner. It's uh, for art, it's for diamonds, it's for a whole variety of other objects, and even related to money. So we created this service called Ascribe, which, uh, in which creators can securely attribute their work um, time stamp it into um, immutable technology blockchain, and then transfer the ownership. So to start with, what you can do, you can take any work and you can drag and drop it into just a simple thing here. It looks like Dropbox, etc. You can type in some basic metadata, the artist name, title, um, you're created, 
And once you have that, then uh, if you like, you can transfer the ownership, et cetera. And as an example, uh, I bought a piece from an artist named Lorna Mills. She's actually quite well known, New York City based artist. Uh, she transferred the ownership to me and it's an animated GIF that actually I bought through a, a gallery that is using um, the Ascribe technology. This is a piece called Hand Jobs. So it's an animated GIF and I actually own it and my, my ownership is actually verified on the blockchain. You can see all the details here. It tells the exact address uh, on which it's owned, the hash of the artwork and the title, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I actually have a cryptographically secured uh, certificate of, authentic of authenticity. It's digitally signed, et cetera. Showing all this, I can print it out, et cetera. And if I want, I can actually take this, click a button, and transfer. And right now, the pointer to identity is simply email, because people understand that. There was the talk early today, the discussion about the usability of, of cryptographic tools, et cetera. Um, what if it was as simple as using Facebook? and you know, entering an email um, and typing in a password, all of that, right? It, the, the cool thing is uh, there are ways to do that. In this case, most of our users, the thousands of users of this, don't need to know crypto at all. Uh, I'll move on. So we started with that. Like I mentioned, we had challenges of scale. So um, with that, we created a technology called BigChainDB, which is a distributed database, starting with that, that had scale, that has queryability, so you can do indexing, all of that. Um, and uh, we decentralized it. We, we created it so that no single entity owns or controls it. You can issue assets, et cetera. So it's open source, it's on GitHub, you can download it. Um, or you can just do simply a pip install if you have Python. And then you, it's straightforward with code. So you can just do an import from BigChainDB. Um, in one line, you can just define a digital asset payload. In another line, you create a transaction. Um, you sign it in one more line, and then you write it. Boom, 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 it's all done. It takes a second to go through or less. The real limit is actually the speed of light. Once we built the software, and by the way, too, one of the key things is um, when you create these assets, you can transfer them, of course. It looks like JSON because under the hood, it's actually um, a JSON-style document store. So um, it looks, acts, feels like a modern database because it is. And uh, so you can read the, the transactions, um, and you can transfer the assets. And of course, because it's globally syncing all the time, all the time, that means you can have tokens of value, so it can prevent things like double spends. This is something that is global throughout the world, and it, it scales. So it's not you know, 50 gigabytes and c calling it bloated. It stores petabytes. Um, that is BigChainDB. Like I mentioned, from BigChainDB. You have two great, minutes Two left. minutes, awesome. Um, from BigChainDB, we said, OK, well, uh, we've got this great technology, but what we really care about is bringing this to the web. So just last week, we actually announced something called IPDB, which has frozen. Let's try this again. Sorry about that. OK, so IPDB, we really saw it. We targeted it as a, a public database for the planet. Um, and really, um, what's been happening, there's lots of talks today, et cetera. There's been this shared global compute inf infrastructure emerging right, with various characteristics, including decentralized, no single entity owns or controls, shared, uh, resources and control shared among participants, self-sustaining. And it's really a key constraint. This stuff has to be planetary scale. Otherwise, you can't change the planet, right? If it can only be usable by 1,000 people, then um, just because of scalability issues, um, you know, you've got more work to do. Um, there's been this infrastructure emerging, and what we saw in this infrastructure was, you know, there's file systems, the stuff of IPFS, et cetera. There's processing with things like Ethereum, et cetera. But what about the database? The database where you have this global truth registry of who owns what, as well as the queries on top. That can be very fast, uh, low latency, et cetera. That is IPDB, the interplanetary database, running the BigChainDB software. Um, it's two things. It's the network itself running this decentralized database. And of course, you actually need governance, too. And we thought long and hard about this. It's actually been one year in the making. There was the panel on governance early today. And actually, from some of the panelists and many people, many of you in the room, we actually um, came up with a nonprofit foundation uh, with very specific characteristics. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that um, you overall. Have 30 seconds. Awesome, great. I'll talk faster. <laughs> no, I won't talk faster. Wendy knows me well enough that. Actually, I talk fast anyway. I'll stop. OK, so um, we've got these caretakers uh, with validating nodes. And three things about them. They have to care about the internet. So it's an extrinsic source of motivation. They have to at least be nonprofit, at least half. And fewer than half in any given country. We don't want capture in dollars, in jurisdiction, et cetera. Um, the caretakers are the heart. 
they actually can vote in, in and out each other, and they also are the ones that run the different nodes of BigchainDB. They elect a board, the board hires them um, the day-to-day the -day management. So that's the governance, it's not a DAO yet, give us a few years, we'll get there, and hopefully the foundation itself will, will disappear. Um, and I have to call end. it now because All right. you're over your time, but awesome. we are very proud to be a node of the IPDB here at, at Internet Archive. Thank you, and actually that is the last slide, so thank you very much, and it's, we're really honored for Internet Archive to be part, and in general, we're honored to be a part of this historic day, so thank you very much. Thank you. Evan, why don't you go on, Dennis, why don't you go on up? You know, and all of these really talented engineers and leaders are going to be doing their demos tomorrow, and some of them are doing a number of workshops. So if you're just getting a taste here, you're going to have a deeper dive tomorrow. Now, I want to encourage you to show me a demo, not a deck, OK? <laughs> this is a demo session, and uh, you have five minutes to show me the money. That, that'll be especially easy for you, Evan. Now, I have to um, admit that we were just going to talk until about 10 minutes ago. So I just threw them in there and said, you know what, let's throw out that plan and let's just show me what you got. So if, if um, they are not as planned out as they might seem, it's understandable because I just gave them a left, you know, what do you call that, a curveball. Okay, Dennis, media chain. Thanks so, thank you, Wendy. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity. Uh, let me actually mirror the screen. Or I can just, um, So Media Chain is still early days, right, Dennis? And you don't have exactly a demo, but you do have a few things to show us that might help us understand. Yes, uh, and uh, Arkady is in the audience tomorrow. Uh, we will be uh, doing a lightning talk with a demo and participating in a workshop where you can get some hands-on with the alpha of Media Chain. Um, I do want mirror, but I got the wrong screen when I pressed mirror. Uh, well, while we're Sorry. while we're um, anticipating well, the wonderful there. work of Dennis, Evan, tell me a little bit more about Interledger before you go up. I think I. How do I start over? Let's let's see. Okay, so I'm in the bottom right. I'm going to the top left. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. Good job. Right. Okay. Um, no. okay. If you want a mirror. Well, you can kind of understand why I wasn't going to go with demos. Because <laughs> it's always a hairy thing. Um, Hello? Where is, oh. Uh, I'll fill a little bit of time here. Hey, okay. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so, so at the conference we talked a lot about uh, location addressing and the problems with that where you have a, a link rod and the difficulty of caching and then we talked about content addressing where if you take the hash of a file, you have really great properties where it doesn't matter where who's serving the file for you, you have a verified address for it. But the problem with media is that uh, uh, creative works such as images are changing formats all the time as they travel the internet. So an insight we had was that what if we could address a concept instead of content. So, you know, everyone knows what the Mona Lisa looks like. If you're shown a JPEG or a PNG of it, uh, we, we're talking about the same thing. And technologies like Shazam and Google Image Search uh, offer us solutions to uh, using media to query, and so sort of that was the inspiration for Media Chain. So on the internet, attribution is easily lost, and context and history around media is not preserved at all. So we see things like this, where an image is shared by a, an account that aggregates content, uh, nowhere is attribution for the creator given. If I press like on this Twitter post, that gratitude goes to the account instead of the creator. And MediaChain is a com combination of a decentralized database 
and content ID. So a decentralized database allows anyone to participate. There's no central point of control or failure, and it creates a logical data space. And this is built on top of IPFS, uh, libp2p, which is what the backs IPFS allows us to create this kind of network. Um, okay, so imagine there was one instance of the Mona Lisa that was slightly yellower and one that was slightly bluer. Uh, using image recognition technology, it would allow us to resolve to one identifier. This enables us to collaboratively talk about the same work. So uh, MoMA might have in their collection uh, a Picasso image, and the tape might have a record for the same uh, artwork. And one supplies the title, one supplies the author. We can uh, link these statements with one canonical identifier so we can talk about them together. Content ID also allows us to search with an image. So you, you're all familiar with Google reverse image search. Uh, what if we gave that technology to developers and creators? That would allow that image in your Twitter feed that's currently anonymous to resolve to this rich metadata that was contributed by participants in a decentralized system. Um, so the data structure, uh, participants make statements about works, um, and we allow it to you to derive metadata from existing formats to be interoperable with other data in the system. And everything is cryptographically signed with a key pair. And this forms a chain, and the chain is walked to create a complete picture. So Tate has provided some metadata, MoMA has provided some other metadata, and at read time, we can uh, create a complete view of the world about this artwork. Um, if there is a statement by some uh, third party that is writing garbage, uh, we can discard that at read time and still get a clear view of the world. And we think that this creates a network effect in a decentralized system. And some applications of this are annotation. Uh, it allows you to surface metadata conflicts that different uh, organizations might currently have in their silo databases. Uh, and it gives creators in our organizations automatic attribution and anal analytics for their content. So like MoMA has opened up their data set, their content is all over the internet, no one knows that these images are actually part of their collection. Using MediaChain, we can automate the resolution of this attribution and basically create a channel for gratitude to flow directly through content itself. Um, this will enable us to search across different data sets that are currently siloed. We get these global IDs so we get to collaboratively talk about works. Um, we can collaborate around data in a, in a shared space. In the uh, cultural heritage space, uh, uh, it's important for participants to have a uniform format and system to collaborate, and today there's no uh, kind of united solutions for that. Um, content addressing allows uh, uh, easy redundancy, so you know, there's participants in the uh, uh, cultural heritage seg segment, they could easily provide redundancy for each other's data. You know, Internet Archive could be pinning MoMA's data uh, the DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America, can be uh, providing a uh, hosting space as well, and commercial organizations can do that very easily as well. And again, the most important thing is attribution. Uh, we want to basically create a channel to exchange value between a creator and their fans or their audience. So today, this will allow us to know who made something, so you can tell them, hey, I really like what you made, and we hope in the future the same channel can be used uh, to exchange value directly and you know, monetary value. And th that's where uh, projects like Interledger and IPDB work for, for license, IPDB for licensing, Interledger for payments are, you know, become really important. Um, and we need help. Uh, we would love for any organizations with data about media to contribute data to the media chain network. Um, we love open source contributions and we really see media chain as the, a platform for the next generation of media apps that if there's a universal library where you can access creative works, media, songs, videos, and uh, reuse them on the terms of the creator, we think that will really drive all kinds of new innovation. You know, a developer could build the next Spotify with a more interesting user interface or a, a better curation. Um, today they cannot do that because all those data sets are locked up and inaccessible. Um, we're on, we have an open Slack, we have a website, uh, follow us on Twitter and check us out on GitHub. And Thanks so much. Cool. Five minutes. Go on up to Evan. And while we're waiting for Evan to get set up, Dennis, you just got VC funding from Union Square funding, right? Yep. Is that correct? Yep. So you're venture backed. And Juan, what about you? Uh, we're also venture backed. I started a company called Protocol Labs, and uh, we are backed by uh, 
some uh, investors and other groups as well. So we will be actually doing contracts with uh, some foundations and so on along the way. So you're venture backed and foundation backed? Yeah, because the technology we're making, um, a lot of people are interested in the stuff we build. Um, a lot of it is public infrastructure for the world, uh, and many people are interested in funding that, uh, both here in the US and in Europe and in other places. Uh, so it's actually a combination of both. Uh, it's, it's not unlike how the internet itself was built. Uh, the internet itself was both uh, you know, public companies and a lot of uh, uh, money from the government. And uh, Trent, how about you? Uh, yes, we are venture backed as well. Um, but we you, have you have the for-profit part, which is Big Chain DB, and then you have this new foundation. Is that right? That's correct. So the for-profit part, Big Chain DB, is venture backed. Um, the business model is it's a database, right? So there's actually a well-defined business model. We don't have to make up some magical new business model, which is kind of fortunate. The foundation itself, right now, is funded by Big Chain DB. But um, as time goes on, um, uh, um, you know. Big Chain DB itself will only have one seat at the table um, of the 19 seats at the table. Um, so there it will be seeking uh, funding from foundations, et cetera. Okay, thank you. And Chris, what about DAT? DAT is uh, backed by the Sloan Foundation and the Knight Foundation. We actually just got a Knight Foundation grant that will let us build a uh, centralized registry uh, for these decentralized data sets um, that scientists can publish. Um, and we're nonprofit. So you're a nonprofit collaborative funded by philanthropists. All right, Evan, take us, take it away. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about the Interledger protocol, which is, as you can see here, this is the front page. This is the protocol for connecting different types of ledgers. So before I really get into much explanation, I'll just show you what it is. So this is an example wallet. This is. Actually, the, the contrast is not so good. I hope you can see it okay. Um, but this is basically what most of the wallets or digital wallets in the world look like today. You have some balance, you have some history, and you have some sending part. And you know, it's really easy to just type in like, oh, I can send money. Great. Um, but that's not, that's kind of limited because we have lots of different versions of these. We have Bitcoin wallets, we have other types of digital wallets, etc. So what the experience we really want is, is something more like this, where I can say, I want to send money to someone on that other ledger. So what we have here is, um, these are two example wallets. These are, this is fake money, um, as evidenced by, there's a really handy feature called Get More, where you can click the <laughs> Get More button and I get more of, of it. Those. We've lobbied for different financial institutions to add this. Nobody's taken us up on it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, what we have here are two, two demo ledgers. So this is all fake money, uh, but these are independent systems. And you could imagine this being you know, any, any type of currency or any type of system that, that you want. What I, the experience that I really want from payments is one that's much more like email or the internet, where I'm just like, I want to send money over to the receiver on that other system. It doesn't matter if we're both on Gmail. I can still send it across. And I just want to go, OK, I want to send that much. And oh, look, they'll receive, I'm going to send $10, and they're going to receive €8.93. Or maybe I want them to receive exactly $10, so that means I should send slightly more than 11 So I'll click Send. And it goes through, and of course, when you're showing it off, it doesn't go through right away. But um, so, what I so this is the experience that we want from payments in general, where it just kind of goes across to different systems. Of course, I'm logged into the wrong one on the right side. So, what I want to show off is um, how you can build this into other projects. So, as I was saying before. We've talked a lot at this conference about how in order to get any of these projects off the, off the ground, we need to build incentives into them. We need what, you know, we're talking about a lot of distributed file storage systems. What's people's incentive to actually store the files and, send, and use their bandwidth to send them to us? Well, a very easy answer to that question is if you just pay them. Um, so what we want to do is make that really easy. So this, is, this little demo is built on the really excellent work of Feras and others uh, on the web torrent project. So that's for those who don't know, that's building torrents into the browser. So I have a modified version of the web torrent client, which includes Interledger. Um, and so on the left-hand side, we have this very, very simple um, like torrent client. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to download a file. Um, and 
what's gonna, what you're going to see is just as I'm downloading, I'm going to be paying the seeder of the file little tiny bits of money in exchange for that. So here we go. Um, so as you can see, now we're starting to download the file. Oh, and now we see a little bit of money is going automatically. And the thing that makes this really powerful is that if you can very easily send money to absolutely anybody without really having to think about it, then you can build neut a neutral payment protocol into your, into your various different apps. Um, and you can build it such that the payments happen automatically without the user having to click lots of buttons or, send or fill in lots of forms. Um, and so what Interledger really is, I've showed you kind of how it works and the experience that we're going for. What it actually is, is an internet protocol very much inspired by IP, the original internet protocol, uh, for routing packets of money across different ledgers. And so what that looks like here is, um, if, I wanna send, if I wanna send money to someone on a, distant ledge, uh, on a distant ledger, we have these parties called connectors, which are very much like internet routers or gateways. Um, and you, ha you have this packet format that you attach to the payment and you send it across to them, and basically they route it onto the next hop. And what Interledger does is provide that packet format as well as the security to make sure your money can't just get lost in the middle. And so that's what Interledger is. And if anybody's interested, I can talk about it more or ask afterwards. And yeah, we're looking for people to, who are interested. If you're interested in building incentives or compensation, or you want to get artists paid, you, you want to get paid for the work you do, um, I would encourage you to think about using something that is if you're building all these great decentralized applications, you want a payment protocol that's not dependent on a single currency, on a single ledger. You want one that says, I'll accept Bitcoins, and you can pay with whatever you want, and it'll just go through without us having to think about it. So this is about getting it so that, we can, that anyone can pay anyone. And this is the future we're hoping for in the decentralized web. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. And finally, Carissa McKelvey of the DAP Project. So this is what we were really going to talk about. And I'm going to tell you this example while Carissa gets set up. We wanted to, seriously, we really wanted to read Vince's article. And it was called, Who Will Pay for Public Access to Research Data? Who Will Pay for Public Access to Research Data? He got it published in Science Magazine in August of 2013. So we went, we searched for it. And guess what? It's behind the science paywall. That's crazy. Public access to research behind the paywall. So since I do not belong to a university, if I wanted to read Vince's article, I found that I had one option, really. That was to pay a $30 fee to have a one-day access to science. I'm pretty sure that Vince is not getting 29 of those $30. I'm pretty sure he's getting zero of those $30. Um, but how ironic that Vince's data, his article, about public access is hidden from me. I want to learn about how to make scientific data more accessible, but it sits behind a paywall. And we, we wanted to address that as an issue. How do we unlock data? How do we unlock journal articles? How do we unlock metadata in science so that everyone can start using it? And we put that to the folks at DAT. Show us what you came up with, Carissa. So I've been working for the past year and a half with scientists. Who's here has talked to a scientist before? <laughs> OK, most people. Um, who here has talked to a scientist about publishing their data, or publishing their journal article, or publishing anything? Well, if you know a scientist, you know they're very, very busy. They're very, very busy with trying to get actual research done. And so they often use the most simplest tools they can, which happens to be Dropbox. A lot of them use Dropbox to collaborate on their data analysis. And so we actually were trying to figure out how we can build a tool for scientists to collaborate on their data and publish their data on the open web. And we were like, oh, maybe we should take some cues from what they're already doing. We were talking about this UX problem earlier, right? So if we're going to build a decentralized tool for scientists, we had to do a lot of user experience research. We ended up throwing out our UX three times over the past year and a half. And now I think we've gotten to a point where scientists might actually use it. So I want to show you what we came up with. So 
This is, um, on the left side, you'll see, this is dat.land, and you'll see there's this um, hash. This is a forward proof hash, like a content addressable hash, but it's a public key. And so this writer here on this browser can put data into the public key. So here I'm going to copy over a folder. And this browser over here on the right immediately synced that data. So we see that both browsers have this data and there's no centralized server. The browser JavaScript is talking to each other directly. And if you notice the links, this is hosted on the archivelab.org and this is hosted on our website. So in that folder there was text. Uh, what else was in that folder? So right here we have uh, a PDF, for example. But this is like a real actual paper that I worked on when I was in um, grad school. We also have tech, law tech files. And uh, we have uh, conflicted copies. Because <laughs> we were using Dropbox, so we have conflicted copies. Um, we also have our upload data, so we have a CSV. And one of the things about Git that is really unfortunate is you can't view the whole CSV if it's really big. So in science, a lot of people are starting to use GitHub as a way to manage their data and collaborate with data. But when they try to give that link to someone else to actually publish their data, it's problematic because Git has to download the entire data set before it can view it. We're using more of a style like WebTorrent, where you can actually just view a piece of the data. So we're not actually using WebTorrent, we're using DAT, but it's on similar concepts. So you can actually load the first 10 rows here and then click to load 10 more, which is not really possible with Git. And this is all being done in the browser. So we thought this would be really great just by itself, but there's also this great feature where we can actually update the data as it goes and create checkpoints. So say I can drag more stuff in here and it gets synced up. At a certain point in time, I might want to reference this hash and I can create a static hash or static link or a URL that I can reference in my paper at a later date and it'll be, fu it'll, it'll be future proof like the decentralized web can, can offer us. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's like versioning for data in yes, a way. Yeah over the decentralized web. And this, these cool people, Code for Science, um, it's, a, it's, not, it's purposefully not owned by any organization. It's just a group of scientists and coders and open source folks who want to make science work better. And they've built a really awesome application called Science Fair. And this is like a decentralized application for searching for and viewing um, articles from the decentralized web. So what happened here is I actually have a local database from the Europe PMC, which is an open source or open journal. So that all of these are open access. And I can actually search for like a cancer paper, for example. And I can see that all of these papers are, have something to do with cancer. They actually have cancer in the title or part of the author or part of the abstract. So it's searching the metadata locally on my machine. And then when I see, okay, I wanna get this, this one, characteristics of Epstein-Barr, I can actually open this article and it, what it's doing is it actually went to the decentralized web to grab the actual article content and then show it to me here. So I didn't have to download all of the articles in the world, I just had to download the metadata to them. So let me understand why this would be important because we have Dropbox and scientists are using Dropbox, mm -hmm. but let's just say we wanted to create um, a big open common of all data so that cancer could be addressed more effectively. And let's just say that um, the Internet Archive wanted to, to store that, but even we, with our 26 petabytes of data, could not store all of the data for something like cancer or you know, astrophysics. So what could your technology do to unleash that? Right, so usually the problem is not storage necessarily. Like you said, 26 petabytes. If you look at CERN or you look at other universities, a lot of universities have a lot of storage. It's bandwidth that is usually the problem. If people want to download lots of big data sets, who, who pays for that? So one of the things that a decentralized web can offer or decentralized data can offer is that when a very popular data sets can be downloaded from peers or from people who have already downloaded it, and so you can create a situation where you have a very low cost, very low, very low cost, which is great for universities, great for libraries, because we're all nonprofits and you might not have that much money. So. Um, this is decentralized web is a great, great application for this use case. So what you're saying is that the reason you would have adoption is because 
Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, Internet Archive, we could share data and then we would save money through bandwidth and so since we're saving money, we would be incentivized to be nodes in this DAT system. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good way to put it. And also, I mean, just using it and being able to have future proof um, content URLs in the papers is something that a lot of scientists really need and really want. Um, like that, uh, Max said earlier about what's a more endangered species? Is it uh, scientific papers or the lizard in Africa? I don't know. <laughs> and so journal articles can be problematic because Vint's article was rightly copywritten by science, but data, does, does anyone care if you share data? Sorry, could you, they don't care? So if articles share? have issues of copyright, but yeah. what about the data? Yeah, so we leave copyright to people who are smarter than us about that because <laughs> we're developers and designers. Um, we're, more, we're really concerned about open access and open data and how we can make sure that stuff that is funded by the people is actually accessible by the people and isn't uh, like locked away. So we're not talking about necessarily locked away for copyright reasons, but locked away for maybe technical reasons, or locked away because uh, they ran out of money, or locked away because it's siloed and it's hard, or locked away because someone had to maintain it and they messed up one day. These types of things shouldn't be problems. We should be able to reference data no matter where it is, just by what it is. So this is the really great thing that I'm, we're really excited about. Science Fair in particular, you can find it on GitHub. Um, and you can look us up and try out the DAT demo, um, dat-data.com. And we're always in IRC, willing to chat. Well, thank you. Great demo. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions, but they will be available for questions tomorrow during their workshops. Awesome work, guys. Thank you very much. It's been a great conference. I, I do have one last question, one sentence each. If you're successful, how will your technology, working together with all of these, how will it impact the world? Carissa, tell me. Um open knowledge for everyone in the world or different planets. <laughs> Good. Uh, for creators to be able to connect to their fans directly with no parties in the middle. Solve incentive problems on the decentralized web and make it easy for everybody here to get paid. Shared global data that's always in sync for the whole planet. Data as oxygen. Making the decentralized web possible through a shared stack of protocols, formats, and applications that are all our superpowers. Great, let's go do it. Thank you very much. You have been a great audience, so engaged, asking lots of questions. And that brings us to the end of our day. And I'm going to give the final very short word to the man who said we should do this in the first place, the founder and the head librarian, the digital librarian of the Internet Archive, Brewster Kale. This is great. Uh, I, I, I'd say we, we've really actually gotten someplace today. It's not just a call, but we've really made some forward progress. We've got offers to change, uh, to rethink and move forward the web protocols to be able to make a decentralized, re-decentralized web work. Uh, the idea of implementing it in browsers is open so that we can make it so that it is immediately distributed to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, we've even gotten some use cases, whether it's sort of WordPress but decentralized, actually starting to, to come about just because as a community, we're interested in having this happen and the community is responding. So we've seen uh, uh, ZeroNet, we've seen JavaScript versions of IPFS, uh, DAT, 
and uh, the web torrent uh, protocols. So we're actually seeing that come about, which is pretty interesting. Um, the, uh, the, the use case that was listed in the New York Times this morning of trying to help somebody make money by publishing on the internet without a third party involved. Can we make a rock band actually make some money by selling directly to their fans? Wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, I think this would be a really great use case for uh, a decentralized web. And the other uh, last use case that we're starting to see some progress on is how do you do scientific publishing in such a way that it's not completely gummed up in a system that doesn't work very well even for the scientists. So that as a use cases, I think we kind of know what we might want to do next. Then the question is, is what do we do? So I'd like the conversations over, over dinner um, to be around what do we do now? Okay, we've seen some momentum in this direction. We've seen some pieces. We see, probably we've argued that it is doable to be able to pull this off. But what do we do now? Do we need VC funding? There, there, um, there are fundings uh, available in this sort of area, as, as we've seen. There are uh, foundations that can help us maybe get over uh, some of the hump. Uh, is that what's needed, or is money actually going to hinder us more than help? Do we need a sequence of conferences with milestones? What if we mar married in a sequence of conferences some awards? So that if they're sort of like, okay, I'll put up an award for the best couple of, of implementations that get us forward in these steps. Should we lock some of it open, in Cory Doctorow's words, to go and have some principles of what does it mean to participate? Does it mean that there's certain licensing requirements on the uh, distributed code that's being put apart? What do we do now? I, what I'm amazed by is the people that came together, and thank you very much. It is a stunning group that's in this uh, room over this last day. Um, but what do we do now? Tomorrow there's going to be these sessions to dive in deeper, but how do we keep the momentum? Thank you very much for coming together, and let's build a decentralized web. Ahoo! said let's lock this web open I just want to say thanks to our to our sponsors the Internet Archive EFF Google Ford Foundation Mozilla all these companies but I just want to especially thank the Ford Foundation because they gave us money to make sure that this would be a more diverse audience so that we anyone who asked us could come for free we reached out to a very diverse audience and offered them to be in this room on this historic day. When you could meet the father of the internet and the father of the web. When we have this meeting in 30 years, let's make sure there's not just fathers at the table. Let's make sure that it's a diverse and beautiful group of builders. On that note, I want to thank you. We are going to take a photo in front, and then we are going to have tacos and drinks. So come and stay and party with us. Thank you so much. It'll be fine. I just wanted to invite Van Jacobson to come down because Tim Berners-Lee would like to meet him and see him. Van Jacobson, come down to the front of the building, the front of the great room. Tim Berners-Lee would like to see you. Thank you.
If Kenneth Goldberg is in the great room or nearby, could he come to the uh, stage at the front? Uh, you've got some documents that uh, fell out your car registration. Kenneth Goldberg, please come to the front of the great room. <laughs> 